Good morning and welcome to the 167th meeting of the Vaccines and Related Biological Products Advisory Committee. I'm Mike Kaczynski. I will be moderating today's meeting. This is a live virtual meeting, so we do have participants from around the country and around the world. And because it is a virtual meeting, um, as many of you have experienced in your own uh, throughout the last few years, every once in a while we may run into a technical glitch where we may uh, cause us to have an unexpected pause just in order to uh, make sure that we uh, have our members and all that back in the meeting. So if that happens, uh, don't fret, we'll take care of it. But with that being said, I will have to jump in every once in a while uh, just in case that does happen. So that being said, let's get this meeting started. And I'd like to hand uh, the meeting off to our chair, Dr. Arnold. Monto, the acting chair. Arnold, are you there? Now, let's, Arnold, let's make sure we get you unmuted real quick. I gotcha. All right, Arnold. We'll get it, we'll get it right after a while. Uh, all right, nice <laughs> take it away. For all your technical help and backup in this uh, challenging time in terms of organizing meetings. Uh, let me add my welcome to the 167th meeting of the Vaccines and Related Biologics Products Advisory Committee of the Center for Biologics Evaluation and Research. Uh, we have uh, an important meeting uh, to, talk about, uh, to talk about a specific topic, and uh, we are in open session to discuss Pfizer BioNTech's supplemental biologics application for administration of a third dose or booster dose of the COVID-19 vaccine in individuals 16 months of age and older. Uh, welcome again to all the members, the uh, ad hoc members and to the public. Uh, Let's get some of the housekeeping uh, details out of the way first and also introduce our distinguished committee. I'd like to turn over to uh, our designated federal officer, Prabha Atreya, who will do this uh, activity. Thank you, Prabha. Good morning. Thank you, Dr. Mancho. Good morning, everyone. This is Dr. Prabha Atreya, and it is my great honor to serve as the designated federal officer, that is DFO, for today's 167th Vaccines and Related Biological Products Advisory Committee meeting. On behalf of the FDA, the Center for Biologics, Evaluation and Research, and the Vaccines Advisory Committee, I would like to welcome everyone for today's virtual meeting. The topic uh, for today's meeting is to discuss in open session Pfizer-BioNTech's some supplemental biologics license application for administration of a third dose or booster dose of the COVID-19 vaccine, Comirnaty, in individuals 16 years of age and older. Today's meeting and the topic were announced in the Federal Register notice that was published on September 7, 2021. I would like to introduce and acknowledge the excellent contributions of the staff in my division and the great team I have in preparing for this meeting. Ms. Kathleen Hayes is my co-DFO, providing excellent support in all aspects of preparing for and conducting this meeting. Other staff who have contributed significantly are Ms. Monique Hill, Dr. Janet Devine, and Ms. Christina Wett, who provided excellent administrative support. I would also like to express our sincere appreciation to Mike Kazinski in facilitating the meeting today. Also, our kudos to many FTA staff working hard behind the scenes uh, every day, trying to ensure that today's virtual meeting will also be a successful one, like all the previous uh, WEPAC meetings on COVID topics. Please direct any press or media questions for today's meeting to FDA's Office of the Media Affairs at FDA OMA, one word, at fda.hhs.gov. Today's transcriptionist for to meeting is Ms. Linda Giles. We will begin today's meeting by taking a formal roll call for the committee members and then temporary voting members. When it is your turn, please turn on your video camera, unmute your phone, and then state your first and last name. And then when finished, you can turn off your camera so we can proceed to the next person. 
please see the committee roster slides in which we will begin with the chair. Mike, can we have the first uh, roster slide, please? Next slide, please. Committee roster. Good okay. morning again. Dr. Arnold Mantro. <laughs> I'm the chair. And, uh, okay, this is Arnold Monto. I am professor of epidemiology and public health at the University of Michigan School of Public Health. Bravo. Thank you. Next, Dr. Amanda Cohen. Good morning, Dr. Amanda Cohen, um, pediatrician at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Chatterjee. Good morning, everyone. My name is Archana Chatterjee. I am the Dean of Chicago Medical School and Vice President for Medical Affairs at Drosden and Franklin University of Medicine and Science in Chicago. Uh, I am a pediatric infectious diseases specialist and happy to be here this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Meissner, Cody Meissner. Thank you, Prabhu. My name is uh, Dr. Cody Meissner, I'm a professor of pediatrics uh, at Tufts uh, uh, Children's Hospital in Boston. Thank you, Dr. Meissner. Next, Dr. Gantz, Kelly Gaines. Good morning, Dr. Haley Gans, pediatric infectious disease at Stanford University. Thank you. Thank you. Next, Dr. Michael Kurilla. Thank you. Thank you, Prabhu. Good morning. Um, Mike Carilla. I'm the Director of the Division of Clinical Innovation at the National Center for Advancing Translational Science within NIH, um, background in infectious disease product development and uh, pathologist by training. Thank you. Dr. Paul Ovid. Yes, good morning. Um, I'm off and I'm a professor of pediatrics at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia and the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine. Thank you. Dr. Paula Annunziato. Good morning. I'm Paula Annunziato. I head Vaccines Global Clinical Development at Merck, and today I am the industry representative, the non-voting industry representative for this meeting. Thank you. Next to Dr. Steve Pargam. Hello, everybody. I'm Steve Pergam. I'm an associate professor in adult infection disease at Fred Hutchinson Campus University of Washington. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Ovita Fuller. Good morning. I'm uh, Dr. Vita Fuller. I'm an associate professor of microbiology and immunology at the University of Michigan Medical Center and a member of the STEM Initiative of the African Studies Center. Thank you. Next, Dr. Rubin. Hi, Eric Rubin. I'm at uh, the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health, the Brigham and Women's Hospital, and the New England Journal of Medicine. Thank you. Next, Dr. James Hildreth. Good morning. I'm Dr. James Hildreth. I'm the President and CEO of Meharry Medical College and Professor of Internal Medicine. Thank you. Thank you. Next, Dr. Jay Portnoy. I'm Dr. Jay Portnoy. I'm a professor of pediatrics at the University of Missouri, Kansas City School of Medicine, and I am an allergist immunologist at Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri. Thank you. Next, Dr. Janet Lee. Good morning, my name is Jeanette Lee. I'm a professor of biostatistics and a member of the Winthrop P. Rockefeller Cancer Institute at the University of Arkansas for Medical Sciences. Thank you. Thank you. Next, Dr. Mark Sawyer. Dr. Sawyer. Good morning, this is Dr. Mark Sawyer. I'm a pediatric professor of pediatric infectious disease at the University of California, San Diego, and Rady Children's Hospital in San Diego. Thank you. Uh, next, uh, I would like to uh, say that Dr. Peter Mark, Center Director, 
will say a few welcome remarks a uh, little later after we start the session. And I uh, would also like to acknowledge the presence of Dr. Celia Witten, Deputy Director of Fever, and Dr. Gruber, Director of Office of Vaccines, and Dr. Philip Kraus, Deputy Director of the Office of Vaccines at this meeting. Now I will proceed with uh, reading the conflict uh, of interest statement Prabha, for the public Dr. record. Dr. Prabha, we forgot somebody. Yes. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Dr. Wharton. Oh, I'm sorry. Do Dr. Melinda Watson, I'm very sorry. Can, can you introduce yourself? Good morning. I'm Melinda Warden. I'm an adult infectious disease uh, specialist, and I'm at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Thank you. Now we will uh, read the uh, concept of interest statement for the public record. Prabha, we still have some more uh, uh, temporary voting members. Okay, thank you. Dr. Ofer Levy, could you introduce yourself? We can't hear you. Offer, don't, don't forget to unmute. Good there we go. Good morning. My name is Ofer Levy, and I'm director of the Precision Vaccines Program at Boston Children's Hospital and professor of pediatrics at Harvard Medical School. Thank you. Next, Dr. Pamela McInnes. Good morning, Pamela McInnes, past Deputy Director of National Center for Advancing Translational Sciences at the National Institutes of Health. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you, Dr. Stanley Perlman. I'm Dr. Stanley Perlman, the Department of Microbiology and Immunology at the University of Iowa and a pediatric infectious diseases physician. Thank you. Okay, so let me... For the public record, this is the conflict of interest statement. Uh, the Food and Drug Administration is convening virtually today on September 17, 2021, the 167th meeting of the Vaccines and Related Biological Products Advisory Committee under the authority of the Federal Advisory Committee Act of 1972. Dr. Arnold Manto is serving as the acting voting chair for today's meeting. Today on September 17, 2021, the committee will meet in open session to discuss Pfizer-BioNTech Supplemental Biologics License Application for administration of a third dose or booster dose of the COVID-19 vaccine, Comirnaty, in individuals 16 years of age and older. This topic is determined to be a particular matter involving specific parties. With the exception of the industry representative member, all standing and temporary voting members of the WERPAS are appointed special government employees, SGEs, or regular government employees from other agencies and are subjected to federal conflicts of interest laws and regulations. The following information on the status of the committee's compliance with the of federal ethics and conflicts of interest laws, including but not limited to 18 United States Code Section 208 is being provided to participants in today's meeting and to the public. Related to the discussions at this meeting, all members, RGE and SGE consultants of this committee have been screened for potential financial conflicts of their own, as well as those imputed to them including those of their spouse or minor children, and for the purpose of 18 U.S. Code 208, their employers. These interests may include investment, consulting, expert witness testimony, contracts and grants, cooperative research and development agreements or credits, teaching, speaking, writing, patents and royalties, and primary employment. These may include interests that are current or under negotiation. FDA has determined that all members of this advisory committee, both regular and temporary members, are in compliance with the federal ethics and conflicts of interest laws. Under, the 18, under 18 U.S. Code Section 208, Congress has authorized FDA to grant waivers 
to special government employees and the regular government employees who have financial conflicts of interest. When it is determined that the agency's need for a special government employee services outweighs the potential for a conflict of interest created by financial interest involved, or when the interest of the regular government employee is not so substantial as to be deemed likely to affect the integrity of the services which the government may expect from the employee. Based on today's agenda and all financial interests reported by committee members and consultants, there have been one conflict of interest waiver issued under 18 U.S. Code 208 in connection with this meeting. We have the following consultants serving as temporary working members, as you have seen before. Dr. Ovita Fuller, Dr. James Hildreth, Dr. Janet Lee, Dr. Offer Levy, Dr. Pam McGinnis, Dr. Arnold Manto, Dr. Stanley Perlman, Dr. Eric Rubin, Dr. Mark Fire, and Dr. Melinda Wharton. Among these consultants, Dr. James Hildreth, a special government employee, has been issued a waiver for his participation in today's meeting. The, the waiver was posted on the FTA website for public disclosure. Dr. Paula Ananziat of Merck will serve as the industry representative for today's meeting. Industry representatives are not appointed as special government employees and serve as non-voting members of the committee. Industry representatives act on behalf of all regulated industry and bring general industry perspective to the committee. Industry representative on this committee is not screened, does not participate in any closed sessions if held, and do not have the voting privileges. Dr. Jay Kortnoy is serving as the temporary consumer representative for this committee. Consumer representatives are appointed special government employees and are screened and cleared prior, prior to their participation in the meeting. They are voting members of the committee. Today's meeting has one external speaker from the Centers for, Dis uh, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, CDC, which is Dr. Dr. Sarah Oliver. The guest speakers of this meeting are Dr. Sharon Elroy Price, who is the Director of the Public Health Services, Ministry of Health in Israel, and also Dr. Uh, uh, Ron Milo, a Professor on Plant and Environmental Sciences Department, the Charles and Louis Gartner and Professional Chair of Wiseman Institute of Science in Israel, and Dr. Jonathan Stern, a Professor of Medical Statistics and Epidemiology within Bristol Medical School at University of Bristol, UK. Disclosure of financial conflicts of interest for speakers and guest speakers follows applicable federal laws, regulations, and FDA guidance. FDA encourages all meeting participants, including open public hearing speakers, to advise the committee of any financial relationships that they may have with any affected firm, its products, are and if known, its direct competitors. We would like to remind the standing and temporary members that if the discussions involve any other products or firms not already on the agenda, for which a participant has a personal imputed uh, financial interest, the participant need to inform the DFO and exclude themselves from such involvement and their disclosure. Then their exclusion will be noted for the record. This concludes the reading of my conflict of interest statement for the public record. At this time, I would like to hand over the meeting to our chair, Dr. Arnal Manto. Dr. Manto, take it away. Thank you. Dr. Manto, I think we have you muted right now. All right, hold on a second. And Dr. Monto, when we get when we get a chance, we're going to have you redo your camera. <laughs> I think we have a little issue with the camera, but not to worry. Uh, go ahead. Okay. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Peter Marks, uh, the director of the Center for uh, Biologics uh, Evaluation and Research, uh, who will give us uh, his opening remarks. Thanks, Dr. Monto. Uh, good morning and welcome to the committee members, FDA staff, the sponsor, and the public viewing this meeting today. This committee advises the agency in discharging its responsibilities as they relate to helping ensure safe and effective vaccines. Over the past year, the committee has participated in some of the most 
important decisions made by the FDA in recent memory contributing markedly to public health. Thank you so much for your continued service. Also, tremendous thanks go to all the FDA staff who have worked tirelessly through this pandemic to facilitate the availability of potentially life-saving medical products. Today, the committee will consider the application from Pfizer for the administration of a third dose of their COVID-19 mRNA vaccine approximately six months following a primary vaccination series. In preparation for the discussion, there will be introductory presentations relevant to the potential need for additional vaccine doses. We know that there may be differing opinions as to the interpretation of the data regarding the potential need for additional doses, and we strongly encourage all the different viewpoints to be voiced and discussed regarding the data, which is complex and evolving. And it also requires near real-time analyses. We're committed to focusing on the science and will drive our decision-making and will carefully consider those data in the context of the clear and obvious public health need to continue slowing the spread of COVID-19 which at this time is leading to the deaths of close to 2,000 Americans each day. That said, as we proceed, I would ask that we do our best to focus our deliberations on the science related to the application under consideration today and not on operational issues related to a booster campaign or on issues related to global vaccine equity. If we stray into those latter topics, the chair and I will gently bring us back into the scope of this advisory committee meeting. I'll be present all day to assist as necessary and look forward to a very productive meeting. Thank you so much again today. We look forward to a very robust discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Marks. I would like uh, to introduce Dr. Marion Gruber, Director, Office of Vaccines Research and Review, who will introduce the topic. Dr. Gruber. Well, thank you very much and good morning and welcome. My name is Marion Gruber and I'm the Director of the Office of Vaccines Research and Review. This is likely my last WAPAC meeting that I attend in my position as Director of the Office of Vaccines. I'm retiring from federal government service on October 31st after a very fulfilling and rewarding career as a public health servant at FDA, and for that I'm grateful. I would like to take a few minutes to thank the members of the WAPAC, both past and present, for lending their scientific expertise over the many years that helped us to address many challenging and complex scientific and clinical issues pertaining to preventive vaccine development and to assure that the vaccines we license are safe and effective for their intended use. I also want to thank the American public. It has been a privilege to serve you. All of my actions and decisions over my 32-year FDA career have been grounded in science with you in mind and in the best interest of your health and safety, and I will continue to hold fast to these principles moving forward. And now to today's topic, which is the application for licensure of a booster dose of community COVID-19 vaccine mRNA. Can I have the next slide, please? On August 23rd of this year, the FDA approved community for active immunization to prevent coronavirus disease 2019 caused by severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus 2 in individuals 16 years of age and older when administered as a two-dose series three weeks apart. On August 25, Pfizer-BioNTech submitted a supplement to their biologics license application for community seeking approval for administration of a booster dose approximately six months after dose two in individuals 16 years of age and older. 
The workload is convened today to determine whether the data submitted are sufficient to support approval of a booster dose of community when administered at least six months after completion of the primary series for use in individuals 16 years of age and older. Next slide, please. The emergence of the highly transmissible Delta variant of SARS-CoV-2 has led to considerations of the potential need for booster doses for fully vaccinated individuals. Data from post-authorization effectiveness studies conducted suggest that the currently U.S. authorized or licensed vaccines remain effective in protecting against severe disease. However, some data suggest that effectiveness may be waning. Concerns have also been raised that declining neutralizing antibody titers or reduced effectiveness against symptomatic disease may herald significant declines in effectiveness against severe disease. And you will be hearing an overview of some of these data in the next session. Next slide, please. For a licensed COVID-19 vaccine, a change in dosing regimen to include a booster dose will require the approval of a supplemented, supplemental BLA. And the supplement must include data that demonstrate that the additional dose is safe and effective. There is an expectation that demonstration of effectiveness of the additional dose is based on adequate and well-controlled clinical trials. However, findings of effectiveness of the additional dose, while necessary, is not sufficient for an FDA approval. A determination that the additional dose is safe for the intended use is also required. Next slide, please. The evaluation whether the additional dose is safe involves weighing whether its benefits outweigh its risk. That means that available data should support the effectiveness of a booster dose, specifically against currently circulating SARS-CoV-2 variants. And the benefit of the booster dose should be considered relative to the benefit already provided by previous vaccinations with the primary series. Considering risk, available data should at a minimum characterize the most common adverse reactions that are associated with the booster dose. And uncertainties regarding benefits and risks are also considered. Next slide, please. Post-authorization data demonstrate an increased risk of myocarditis and pericarditis, particularly within seven days following the second dose of community. The observed risk is higher among males under 40 years of age than among females and older males. The observed risk is highest in males 16 to 17 years of age. It is not known whether there will be an increased risk of myocarditis, pericarditis, or other adverse reactions after a booster dose of community. Thus, risk-benefit considerations to determine whether to approve a booster dose will need to be informed by the known and the potential risks of the vaccine. Next slide. So to summarize, benefit-risk evaluations should take into account whether the booster dose will prevent severe cases of COVID-19, including those caused by currently circulating variants, in addition to those prevented by the primary series. The safety profile of the additional dose will also be considered. FDA's evaluation, supported by Verpac, of the safety and effectiveness data of a booster dose of community in the age groups for which it is currently licensed is thus essential. And this concludes my introductory remarks, and I look forward to a robust and transparent and evidence-based discussion. Thank you. I turn it back to you, Dr. Monto. Thank you so much, Dr. Gruber, and I want as an individual and representing the biomedical community to thank you for your years of service. Uh, they really are appreciated and have been extremely valuable. Uh, next, I'd like to turn over uh, for back further background to Dr. Ramachandra Naik um, from uh, OVP, uh, OVRR. 
Dr. Naik. Thank you. Uh, good morning, uh, everyone. I'm, uh, my name is uh, Ramachandra Nayak from the Division of Vaccines and Related Products Applications in the Office of Vaccines, and uh, I am the Review Committee Chair for this Supplemental DLA. I'm going to provide background for today's Advisory Committee meeting regarding Pfizer-BioNTech Supplemental DLA for the mRNA COVID-19 uh, vaccine community for a booster dose in individuals 16 years of age and older. Uh, this is the outline of this background talk. Uh, this provides brief description of the licensed vaccine, that is community, uh, overview of community supplemental DLA and the clinical package, and overview of today's agenda, and finally, voting question uh, to the committee. Uh, community was uh, licensed on uh, August 23rd, 2021. This is the only approved COVID-19 vaccine in the U.S. The vaccine is indicated for prevention of uh, COVID-19 caused by SARS-CoV-2 in the individual 16 years of age and older. Community is administered intramuscularly as a primary series of two doses three weeks apart. Each uh, 0.3 mil dose of community contains 30 micrograms of a nucleoside-modified messenger RNA encoding the viral spike glycoprotein of SARS-CoV-2. Uh, topic for today's advisory committee meeting, the booster dose supplement to the BLA for uh, community. Um, uh, the supplemental BLA was uh, submitted on August 25, 2021. A single dose, uh, single 0.3 mil dose of community containing 30 micrograms mRNA is supposed to be administered approximately six months after the second dose in individuals 16 years of age and older. The clinical package includes uh, safety and immunogenicity data from approximately 330 participants who were re-enrolled to receive a booster dose of community approximately six months after completing the primary series of two doses. Breakdown of these uh, subjects and details of the data will be provided in later presentations by Pfizer and uh, the FDA. This is the overview of today's agenda. After this uh, introduction and background, uh, CDC's Dr. Sarah Oliver is going to present uh, the epidemiology of uh, pandemic CDC Delta variants and breakthrough infections, followed by Dr. Jonathan Stern's presentation. Uh, he, he's a, a professor at uh, U University of Bristol. He's going to present data on real-world effectiveness of COVID-19 vaccines. Later, uh, Dr. Sharon Elroy Prius. Oh, don't see the slide. Oh, the, Dr. Sharon, I'm sorry. So, Sharon Elroy Prius, Director of uh, Public Health Services, uh, Ministry of Health Israel, and Dr. Ron Milo, Professor uh, at Wiseman Institute of uh, Institute Israel. Uh, they're going to present the data from Israel booster protection against confirmed infections and uh, uh, severe disease, followed by five minutes break. After the break, uh, Ms. Donna Boyce and Dr. Bill Gruber uh, will provide the applicant presentation, followed by FDA presentation by Dr. Juhi Lee, who is going to present the clinical data uh, submitted to FDA uh, by Pfizer. After that, there will be a lunch break. After lunch, there will be open public hearing uh, and followed by a short break, uh, there will be question and answer session regarding the applicant and uh, FDA presentations, followed by committee discussion and voting before adjournment of the meeting. This is the question to the committee. To the safety and effectiveness data from the clinical trial C459-1001, support approval of a community booster dose administered at at least six months after completion of the primary dose for use in individuals 16 years of age and older. Please vote yes or no. Thank you. That, that's the end of the background.
Thank you, Dr. Knight. Uh, next, I'd like to turn over to uh, Dr. Sarah Oliver of the uh, Division of Viral Diseases, CDC, who will update us on the epidemiology uh, of pandemic C uh, CDC uh, Delta variant breakthrough infections. Uh, I assume that CDC uh, identified, not at the CDC. Uh, I'd like to make sure that the uh, speakers from now on will stick to time. We are going to have some real problems if we go over because we have a very important discussion at the end of the day, and that's why I skipped the questions that are on the uh, agenda uh, for Dr. Knight. We'll get to some of those later on. I believe we need very much to keep our focus on the next talks. Dr. Oliver, please. Thank you so much, and good morning. So today I'll look at uh, COVID-19 cases and hospitalizations, COVID vaccines administered, and COVID vaccine effectiveness. We'll look at estimates for VE over time, VE during times of the Delta variant, and VE for older adults. So first for COVID cases and hospitalizations. To date, over 41 million cases have been reported in the U.S. This slide shows the trends in the number of COVID cases reported daily with a seven-day moving average in red. As everyone is aware, we're currently experiencing a surge in cases, second only to the surge seen in the winter. The current seven-day moving average is around 145,000 cases per day. This slide represents the daily trends in the number of COVID-19 deaths per day in the U.S. The seven-day moving average uh, around uh, is 1,300 deaths per day. So then this slide shows the weekly trends in the COVID-19 associated hospitalization rates in the U.S. by age group. Rates have been increasing with this recent surge, but are somewhat less than what was noted this past winter. However, as we consider these rates, it's important to see hospitalization rates among the vaccinated compared to the unvaccinated population. The figure on the left shows hospitalization rates among 18 to 49-year-olds. The middle is 50 to 64-year-olds, and the bottom is 65 and over. Note for each of the graphics, the scale on the x-axis is different. The green line at the bottom of each figure is the hospitalization rate among the fully vaccinated individuals. And the blue line is the hospitalization rate among those unvaccinated. Among adults 65 and over, the incidence was 13 times higher in unvaccinated. And for those less than 65, the hospitalization rates were 22 to 23 times higher in unvaccinated individuals. This slide shows the variance proportions among the sequenced lineages. The blue color on this figure represents the alpha variant, and the orange color represents the delta variant. You can see for recent weeks, Delta represents around 99% of sequenced lineages. As booster doses of COVID vaccines would only apply to those who had already received a primary series, I can highlight COVID vaccines already administered. So to date, there have been over 380 million vaccine doses administered in the U.S. The left shows the number of people fully vaccinated by vaccine series type. And on the right is the percent of fully vaccinated population by age. 63% of those 12 and over, 65% of those 18 and over, 
and over 82% of those 65 and over are fully vaccinated. So this figure shows the daily trends in doses administered over time. We hit a peak of around three to four million doses delivered per day in the spring with a decline into the summer. However, the average number of doses administered has increased since mid-July. This slide shows the proportion of the population receiving at least one dose. Among older adults in purple, those 65 and over at the top, 90% or more have received at least one dose. And among younger adults and adolescents in yellow, around 50 to 60% have received at least one dose. So now to move to COVID VE estimates. First, we'll look at data available over time. I want to highlight some recent publications that we're pulling data from listed here. This slide shows the VE estimates against hospitalization from, some, from studies listed on the previous slide. You can see VE estimates have remained high over time. This slide shows VE estimates against infection over time. We've seen some decreases in VE estimates for the last one to two months. There are a variety of reasons where we could be noting this decline. One aspect could be waning of immunity due to time since primary series. However, there is another factor to consider as well. As we've described previously, since earlier this year, <clears throat> we've noted increases of the Delta variant. In late May, Delta was around 7% of sequenced isolates, and by mid-July, this was up to 94% of sequenced isolates. The impact of the Delta variant leads us to this next aspect. What is VE with the Delta variant? So this slide shows results of studies that compare pre-Delta versus Delta estimates for VE. Infection or symptomatic disease is on the left, and hospitalization or severe disease is on the right. In studies comp comparing pre-Delta and Delta time points, pre-Delta VE estimates are high. VE against infection ranged from 72 to 97%, and against hospitalization from 84 to 97%. Since the introduction of the Delta variant, VE against infection has ranged from 39 to 84%, and VE against hospitalization has remained high from 75 to 95%. This figure shows the VE estimates by outcome for the alpha variant in blue compared to the delta variant in orange. The outcomes range along the top, VE for any infection on the left, symptomatic infection in the middle, and hospitalization or severe disease on the right. You can see that among global studies assessing infections with alpha versus delta, there was a mild decrease in delta VE. This may be due to a variety of factors that can impact these results and variation by country, including differences in study methods, different intervals between doses, and timing with vaccination and the variant increases. This is a summary of VE estimates since the introduction of the Delta variant. The colors correspond to the vaccines assessed in the study. This highlights that regardless of the vaccines evaluated, all vaccines have remained effective in preventing hospitalization and severe disease, but may be less effective in preventing infection or mild illness recently. The reasons for this lower effectiveness likely include both waning over time and the Delta variant. So next to address VE for older adults. This slide shows unpublished COVID-19 data 
with VE against COVID-19 associated hospitalization among fully vaccinated patients 18 years of age and over by age group and month. COVID-Net conducts hospitalization surveillance with 14 states, representing around 10% of the U.S. population. Patients must be a resident of the surveillance area and have a positive SARS-CoV-2 test within 14 days prior to or during the hospitalization. Chart reviews are conducted. Data presented at last month's ACIP meeting showed a lower VE in those 75 years and over. However, we're constantly getting updates to the data with backfill for previous months. With these updates, the COVID net data through July now show that the VE against uh, hospitalization in adults 75 and over remains over 88%. While the VE for this oldest age group has consistently been slightly lower than the, over, the older age group, the other age group, sorry, it has remained quite high and generally stable for the last several months. So then this slide shows data from the Vision platform evaluating VE against hospitalization, as well as urgent care or ED visits. VE against both outcomes was consistent, at least 82% or higher, through at least 16 weeks after the second dose. Note this data is through June of 2021 and may not represent a full picture with VE with the Delta variant. This study highlights VE for symptomatic infection with the Pfizer vaccine for several of the recent variants of concern. Adults 60 years of age and over are in the light blue. VE against symptomatic infection in adults 60 and over is high, but some decreases are noted against variants of concern. However, it's important to note that these differences were not significantly different there were small numbers and very wide confidence intervals for several of these variants. These figures show VE by age and time since vaccination. Infection is on the left and severe disease is on the right. Um, uh, adults 60 and over are in light blue. Effectiveness against infection was over 60% in the first five to nine weeks after vaccination with a gradual decline. Protection against severe disease has remained stable with a decline noted in those 60 and over after 25 weeks. However, also notes the very wide confidence intervals for these later estimates. This slide highlights VE against hospitalization by time since vaccination in adults 65 years of age and over. VE has decreased slightly over time, but remained high. And again, differences by time interval since vaccination were not significantly different. So next we can consider long-term care facility residents. There was some question initially for how these older, potentially medically frail adults may respond to the vaccine at all. However, this shows that initially, VE against infection was 74% or higher by vaccine. However, as we look over time, moving into the recent months where Delta was the primary variant, VE against infection has fallen to just over 50%. So then this is the same summary slide as before, but the other ages are grayed out, and we've added the estimates for adults 60 years of age and over to put these estimates for older adults into the overall context. Lower VE against infection was seen for older adults, particularly the long-term care facility residents. Follow-up is needed to monitor these VE results over time. So in summary, COVID vaccines continue to maintain high protection against severe disease, hospitalization, and death. Protection against infection, which includes asymptomatic or mild infections, are lower in recent months. However, it's difficult to distinguish the effects of increased time since primary series 
versus the impact of the Delta variant. And it's important to monitor trends of effectiveness by severity of disease over time. I want to thank the uh, team of people that have helped pull this together, our ACIP team and the entire vaccine effectiveness team uh, at CDC. I'll highlight that the next two slides contain references that were listed, and I'm happy to take questions. Thanks. Thank you so much, Dr. Oliver, and thank you for keeping us to time. Uh, we do have time for a few questions uh, before we move on to the next presentation. Dr. Gans. Thank you, Dr. Oliver. Um, that was very helpful. Um, I'm wondering if you could elaborate a little bit more because they seem to be lumped by Pfizer, Moderna, and the breakthrough disease. Can you elaborate more in just the five, since we're thinking about Pfizer at the moment application? Can you give us more information about breakthrough disease and how it relates just to the um, Pfizer vaccine? Were the large majority of those Pfizer versus Moderna? So some of that has to yeah, some of that has to do with the steady platform. Several of them don't have the power to split apart individual vaccines and still get stable estimates. So many of them had to lump kind of mRNA vaccines together. Um, there were some, and uh, a few of the slides did look at kind of if you compared if we had estimates for Pfizer and Moderna um, that are that are in there, but many of the, um, the the platforms had to kind of lump the mRNA vaccines prior receipts uh, together. I will say the the Vision platform is one of the larger ones, um, and it uh, it has been able to obtain product specific estimates, and so I can um, share those those platforms uh, the estimates with you. Um, I think compared to um, the Pfizer estimates were slightly lower than the Moderna estimates, um, but we'd have to kind of monitor that over time uh, and, and look at it across various platforms. Dr. Chatterjee. Thank you. Um, Dr. Oliver, thank you for your presentation. Um, my question is with regard to mitigation measures in addition to vaccination. Um, obviously, these have an impact on risk of exposure. And I was curious whether any of these studies address that, uh, address those measures and the impact that they might have. Yeah, it's difficult um, if you kind of overlay a lot on the time. We know that sometime as Delta was taking over, there were also changes um, in uh, uh, how we were doing some of our social distancing and non-pharmaceutical interventions. Uh, I know several of the studies have, have attempted um, to, to look at this. Unfortunately, it's, it's really difficult to look at, uh, to get kind of behavioral interventions um, and, and data on masks and behaviors in this. Um, so we'll continue to, to attempt um, to, to measure, but I know it's, it's been difficult for each of the platforms. Thank you. Dr. Carilla, one more question after Dr. Carilla before moving on. Thank you, Arnold. Uh, uh, Sarah, it, it's, it's convenient to, to divvy up the population into vaccinated and unvaccinated, but, but there actually is a subgroup that is unvaccinated but prior infection, and that has been increasing over time. And Failure to account for that would seem to actually underestimate vaccine efficacy going forward. So I'm wondering, have you, have you attempted to take that into account in terms of actual calculation of vaccine efficacy? I know that you know the the platforms. Many of our broader, um, more robust platforms do a, a test negative design, but they're not able to do you know serology screening on on everybody who would be admitted. Um, so uh, I, I don't know that 
included into, you know, the specific, they're not like uh, screening for serology prior to uh, including unvaccinated individuals. Um, but I know that uh, several of the platforms, uh, Vision, Ivy, uh, attempt to account for this with their uh, statistical, uh, um, their statistical analysis. Okay, but but you, you haven't done any attempts at sort of bounding what that uh, given overall zero prevalence estimates are. You haven't done any bounding of what that may be, how, how that may be impacting calculations of overall vaccine efficacy. I'll tell you, I can get back. I can check with the specific site PIs and get back to you uh, potentially this afternoon around exactly you know how how their analyses have have adjusted for that. Right, Dr. Meisner, final question. You're muted. Cody, Cody. you're a doc Okay. Um, my question is the the charts and tables you showed us. Some were for adults over 75, some of the data were for adults over 65, and some were for adults over 60. You, how, how do you pull that together? I mean, they're fairly uh, discrete groups in terms of the, the interval of time since they received the vaccine, for example. How, do you look, how do you break down those, the risk in those different age groups? Yeah, so, um, you know, essentially what we've reported is what um, has been published and was out there. So several of the studies we had to take, especially the ones not conducted at CDC, we had to take, you know, the, the uh, interval and age as, as they reported them. Um, there is absolutely kind of a different um, by age group. Um, and so in some of the platforms where we have more people uh, and could get stable estimates, so COVIDnet is a larger system, so we tried to break out that 65 to 74 and 75 over. Um, many of the platforms, though, that have um, you know, smaller numbers just aren't able to get that granular. So that's why um, some of the platforms uh, reported 65 and over with an acknowledgement that there likely is, you know, an age kind of gradient and that a, a 64, 60, I mean, a 65-year-old may not be exactly the same as an 85-year-old, but we can't necessarily report uh, stable VE estimates for each individual uh, age group. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Oliver. And as I'm going to mention to all of our speakers, we may well have more general questions later on, and I hope you can stay around with us during the entire day. Uh, next, uh, we go outside the U.S. Our next speaker is Dr. Jonathan uh, Stern, Professor, Dr. Uh, Professor Stern, who is at Bristol Medical School in the UK. Thanks very much, um, and I'm honored to be asked to present uh, this important meeting, and the title of my talk is Real World Effectiveness of COVID-19 Vaccines. Uh, these are my declarations. I don't have any financial interest with any of the firms or entities that are related to the meeting topic. Um, and I'd like to acknowledge the uh, authors lead listed here who have uh, diligently assembled data uh, on uh, estimated effects of COVID-19 vaccines that I will present in the early part of my talk. So, um, the title of the talk is Real World... Sorry. Um, the title of my talk is Real World Effectiveness of Vaccines. Um, I want to emphasize that randomized trials provide the best estimates of effectiveness of any uh, healthcare intervention in the real world. The issue that um, makes life difficult in the context of the sort of question that's being addressed by the uh, committee today is that a 
a host of urgent questions about COVID-19 vaccines have not been addressed in randomised trials. For example, for completely clear reasons, the randomised trials were almost exclusively conducted before the era of the Delta variant. The ongoing emergency, the amazing success of the vaccines means that we have to make far-reaching policy decisions, such as the one being considered today, using observational data. Um, but a better title for my talk might be Estimated Effectiveness of Vaccines in Observational Studies. And given that I'm going to spend my time talking about the uh, potential biases in these studies, an even better title might be Estimated Effectiveness of Vaccines that is biased by an unknown amount and how to think about such biases. Um, now, uh, Colleagues at the WHO and Cochrane are running an amazing systematic screening and data extraction process on published studies on vaccine effectiveness. And they are screening hundreds of studies per week, classifying them, um, the, the published observational studies classified uh, according to whether they're peer reviewed or uh, are, public, are available as a preprint, and according to whether they're prospective or retrospective or cross sectional, and according to the uh, underpinning study design. Um, there have been 178 such studies uh, on vaccine effectiveness against variants of concern, as you can see here, with a number of different study designs, but primarily cohorts and uh, test negative case control designs, and uh, studies on uh, plenty of studies uh, on the Delta variant, 76 of them. And among those 76 studies on the Delta variant that assess immunogenicity and or vaccine effectiveness, the number of studies are increasing weekly. There are 51 cohorts, nine test negative case controls. And if we look at the outcomes, um, the outcome considered are laboratory confirmed COVID, 57 studies, symptomatic confirmed COVID, 34, severe or hospitalized COVID, 37, and death from COVID, 16. So, and, and Dr. Oliver's uh, talk uh, last time beautifully summarized the, uh, the data that's out there, particularly as it relates to the question being considered by the Katie today. Um, so those data were summarized in a paper in The Lancet published by these authors. I was a minor contributor to it. Um, it appeared on Monday. Um, and, and the, the, that paper summarized uh, efficacy overall according to variants, showing, as we've seen, that uh, efficacy against, well, we, firstly, the efficacy against severe disease is, is uniformly higher than efficacy against any infection. And secondly, that efficacy against delta seems high and similar to efficacy against alpha. And uh, in a small number of studies, the efficacy for early versus later follow-up appears similar for efficacy or effectiveness against severe disease, although somewhat lower for effectiveness against any infection. And this slide uh, diligently put together by Dr. Anna Maria Inara Strepo and Professor Sir Richard Pito just yesterday summarizes uh, the current evidence as, as recorded in, in, uh, in, in, the, in this data set of trial of studies and study results, uh, the efficacy of uh, messenger RNA vaccines against severe disease in settings where the Delta variant is circulating up to this week. And as described in the previous talk, in most contexts, if you look at the middle uh, column here, the right two columns uh, show us the confidence interval. Uh, efficacy remains high, and for, for example, the study in Minnesota, where estimated, estimated efficacy was a little lower for both the uh, Pfizer and the Moderna vaccines, um, the confidence interval was rather wide in that study. Uh, I won't spend time talking about this slide. Uh, the evidence was beautifully summarized in the previous talk. So I'm going to spend most of my time talking about methodological issues in estimating vaccine efficacy during the rollout. And I'm going to give uh, some examples from analyses that, uh, that a, a large team of us have been doing in the UK based on the Open Safely analytics platform. Uh, and uh, we've been fortunate or other, to, to establish uh, in, in the UK near population coverage of, uh, of detailed linked electronic health record data. 
um, and open safely provides a trusted research environment within which those data can be securely accessed and analyzed with appropriate disclosure controls. Now, I want to emphasize that my, exam my examples are from, uh, from analyses of these data, but they're not there to tell you about the results. They're there to try to illustrate general issues in trying to estimate vaccine effectiveness from observational studies. So um, here are the issues that I'm going to cover, and the first and, uh, and obviously important one is the problem of confounding. Uh, I'll call it baseline confounding for reasons that I hope will become clear. That presence of characteristics of individuals that predict both vaccination and the outcome that we're interested in. So confounding occurs when there's a common cause of both vaccination and the outcome event, which might be symptomatic infection or hospitalization with COVID, uh, and in that circumstance, uh, the association that we uh, estimate in our observational study may not equal the causal effect, the effectiveness of the vaccine. Um, the reason that we randomize fundamentally is that randomization should remove confounding in a high-quality randomized trial by ensuring, by removing the link between prognostic factors, factors that influence the outcome, and vaccination, because only the play of chance determines whether someone's vaccinated. Now, here's a graph of the rollout uh, of uh, vaccination in England uh, from Open Safely in the uh, over 80s in the, uh, in the upper panel. That started on the 8th of December 2020, and, in, and rather later in the 70s and 79-year-olds. Um, which started in January. And here, uh, vaccination with Oxford AstraZeneca is in green. Vaccination with Pfizer-BioNTech is in purple. And you can see what's characteristic of, 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 of uh, countries that, uh, that achieve rapid rollout with high take-up is that we see rap rapid, uh, rapidly we get to a point where, uh, we, where very high proportions of the population have been vaccinated. The light purple here is the is, is receipt of second dose of Pfizer BioNTech, and that, and that happened for only some people vaccinated with Pfizer, and almost nobody vaccinated with AstraZeneca because the UK changed its vaccination schedule to 12 from three weeks in early in January 2020. So when we look at this, we can ask, well, what predicts the speed of take up, speed of being vaccinated? What factors predict being vaccinated faster rather than slower? And that's what's shown on the next slide here, which shows estimated hazard ratios uh, for people aged 80 years and over in the, in the left two columns of figures and people aged 70 to 79 years in the right two columns of figures, separately for Pfizer, BNT162, B2, or Oxford AstraZeneca, CHADOX1. Uh, and I'll just highlight a few results. This is just to show you that patient characteristics that predict uh, occurrence of COVID outcomes also predict whether you get vaccinated even in a situation of rapid rollout in publicly funded healthcare such as uh, in the UK. So even within these age groups, uh, age influenced whether you got vaccinated and not necessarily in the same direction or consistently for the two vaccines because it depended on logistical issues. Um, even in the context of this publicly funded healthcare system, uh, more uh, less deprived people in group five were vaccinated faster than more, vac more deprived people in group one, and that was true for both vaccines and both age groups. Um, it's well documented that uh, vaccine hesitancy is related to ethnicity in the UK and in other countries, and sure enough, white people got vac vaccinated faster than people of other ethnicities. Uh, people with learning disabilities got vaccinated slower, and, um, and previous vaccination, which may be related to underlying, uh, underlying uh, uh, health care behaviours or vaccine hesitancy. So previous people who'd received flu vaccine in the previous five years that may also be related to comorbidities were more likely to be vaccinated with the COVID-19 vaccine. So there is every reason to think that uh, estimates of vaccine efficacy will be subject to bias due to confound. One way to address that is to adopt a test negative design in which we don't look at the whole population. We compare individuals with symptoms who test positive, the cases, with individuals with symptoms who test negative, the, the controls. 
Now, that may reduce confounding, but as has been well documented, and here's a pair of papers in the American Journal of Epidemiology published in 2016, you know, discussing the test negative design in the context of flu vaccination, and um, there, there, is, there is no reason to think that just by doing a test negative design, you will remove confounding. And there are various consequences of test negative designs that are discussed in detail in those papers. So I think that in the context of COVID-19 vaccination, careful evaluation of the potential for bias in estimates of vaccine effectiveness from test negative designs seems warranted and indeed urgent. So back to my graph of the cumulative incidence over time, because it, it tells us the next problem we have when we try to estimate vaccine, vaccine effectiveness, which is that if I take somebody who's unvaccinated on, on a particular date, for example, the 15th of January 2020, then that person, although they're unvaccinated and they may serve as a comparator at that moment in time, is also likely rapidly to become vaccinated. And that gives us a problem uh, in choosing a comparison group for our estimates of vaccine effectiveness. Because of the very rapidly, rapid rollout of vaccination, unvaccinated people rapidly become vaccinated. And there's a solution to that, which seems pretty obvious, which is to split the follow-up time for each individual in our population into time unvaccinated and time post-vaccination among the large majority of people who ultimately are vaccinated. The difficulty is that that gives us a new problem that hasn't been extensively dealt with in studies of vaccine effectiveness, which is the problem of time varying confounding. So I've discussed already how patient characteristics at the start of follow-up may be confounders because they predict both vaccination and COVID-19 outcomes. But as we move through follow-up and people get vaccinated, there may also be, by be confounding after baseline by time-varying factors, and we call those time-varying confounders. And here, some, and uh, a difficulty here is that special methods, uh, such as, although not exclusively, marginal structural models, are likely to be needed when there are time-varying confounders. So here is here are a further analyses from the same data set that I showed you earlier, looking at time-varying characteristics predicting vaccination in those two age groups in England, and you can see that. People who had recently tested positive for SARS-CoV-2 were hugely, at least 90%, less likely to be vaccinated. Um, and in fact, there were almost nobody was vaccinated within a week of testing positive for SARS-CoV-2. So that, and, and clearly that's a confounder for uh, being hospitalized with, with, with COVID. So there's every reason to think that time varying confounding is also a problem here. Why is it such a difficult problem analytically? Well, because it's a confounder, because being be, having a positive test predicts whether you get vaccinated and also predicts whether you're hospitalized with COVID. But it's also on the causal pathway from being vaccinated to being hospitalized. And that means that using standard modeling strategies may not work. So we tried to do analyses uh, in, uh, using marginal structural models to um, uh, overcome this problem. And these are the results, and I'll quickly take you through them. So uh, the colors here relate to the degree of adjustment. In green, we have basically just region adjusted, but no further adjustment. In orange, we have adjustment for baseline confounders. And in blue, we have adju additional adjustment for the time varying confounders. Uh, the left hand graph is any vaccine and the right hand graph is Pfizer only. And the upper set of graphs is the outcome positive test. The middle set of graphs is COVID-19 hospitalization, and the bottom set of graphs is all-cause mortality. So um, firstly, you can see that adjusting to the time-varying confounders makes a big difference and attenuates the apparent effects of uh, the vaccines on all-cause mortality. Uh, and it has some effects, although less dramatic, for the other two outcomes. Um, and you can see, and this has been seen in a number of studies, that there is completely implausible protection uh, immediately after vaccination 
even when we adjust for the time varying confounders. And I think that's just unmeasured confounding, and I'll say a bit more about that in the moment. Um, so the difficulty we have is that even with these detailed electronic health records and using probably the best method available and controlling for why for an extensive set of confounders, uh, we get implausible levels of protection. Why implausible? Well, firstly, they weren't seen in the trials, and secondly, most uh, I think it would be broadly agreed that we expect we don't expect huge protection against all-cause mortality or hospitalisation within a week of vaccination and with a first dose only. So what we'd like to do is we'd like to hope that that bias, which I think it's plausibly plausible bias that we see very soon after vaccination uh, goes away and that what we see later are good estimates of vaccine effectiveness. The worry we have is that, well, if it's biased early, we don't know when that bias goes away. But I think we should be particularly concerned about short follow-up after vaccination for the reasons I've explained. We get similar results for the 70 to 79-year-olds. So I think there may be a problem with unmeasured confounding, particularly soon after vaccination. One plausible explanation is that if you show up for vaccination in the UK, there's a big sign saying, please go away if you have symptoms of COVID. So people are likely to delay their vaccination if they have symptoms, and that's not recorded anywhere in the healthcare record unless they subsequently test positive or show up for healthcare. And of course, that makes symptoms a time varying confounder, but it's not measured. So bias is because recent symptoms predict postponement of vaccination may wane with time, but it seems particularly hard to estimate short-term effects of vaccination. Another couple of important issues. Firstly, it's vital to account for the fact the incidence of the outcome varies so dramatically over time. Here's the uh, incidence of hospitalization in the last six months in the United States, readily available on the web. And you can see that uh, you don't want to be comparing somebody on the 31st of uh, August with somebody, on the 30, with, with somebody else on the 31st of July, because things change so rapidly. So we have to deal with time since vaccination as one aspect of our analysis. But it's vital that we also deal with calendar time in our analysis. And people do that in a variety of different ways. And the way that diversity makes the studies hard to appraise. But it will usually be important to carefully allow for both calendar time and time for vaccination in analysis. And finally, a word about persistently unvaccinated individuals. This is the other end, because we're most interested in people who've been vaccinated for some time and in whether uh, vaccination uh, effectiveness is waning. And in many highly vaccinated populations, perhaps less so in the US, that means we're dealing with a highly selected set of individuals whose characteristics we need to understand. Um, and we, a particular concern raised in a questionnaire before my talk is what proportion of those remained unvaccinated because of recent infection that conferred protection? So it's hard to estimate vaccine effectiveness, and we need careful and critical evaluations. Here's my final slide, um, and I will skip through because I'm out of time. We need to think carefully about confounding. Uh, we need to think about how the, the, our analyses need to allow for the stages of the rollout. We need to control for a wide range of potential confounders. In studies of long-term vaccination, we are need to ask about the, what proportion of the unvaccinated were protected because of previous infection. We need, we need critical appraisal of test negative designs. We should be very cautious of apparent short-term benefits of vaccination because of the potential for unmeasured confounding, for instance, um, delay of, to vaccination. And we need to deal with rapidly changing incidents of outcome events. And finally, ideally, there should be an analysis plan published before outcome data were available to reassure us that data weren't cherry-picked. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Stern. Uh, as somebody who does test negative designs and knows uh, the strengths and weaknesses uh, of that design, uh, I think you've covered it brilliantly. Uh, my 
first question, because we're going to be confronted with an issue of U.S. data versus outside the U.S. data, how did you handle the fact that with the mRNA vaccine, the Pfizer uh, BioNTech vaccine in the UK, many people did not get the second dose in exactly three weeks, which was the protocol in the US, but the dose was delayed and therefore the immune response might be different. So the short answer is we didn't because the analyses I showed you just looked at first dose and didn't account in any way. There are some incredibly interesting data coming soon, I believe in press from the ONS Community Infection Survey that will speak to exactly that issue and that may indeed suggest the UK made a good call in extending the, uh, the, the time between first and second doses. Right, uh, that's what I'm, exactly what I'm referring to. Dr. Carilla. Thank you. Uh, you, you hi I don't know why my camera's not working. You highlighted the, still the issue. Yeah, okay, good, thank you. Uh, you highlighted the issue of seeing an effect in, in, the, in the immediate post-vaccination period um, that would not be uh, expected due to, the, due, due to the effect of the vaccine. But I'm wondering if, if there is, do you think there could be a potential pro for a antigen independent vaccination enhancement in some degree of immunity and in shorter term, that period of time that, that will wane very quickly, but that may actually be overestimating short-term uh, estimates of vaccine efficacy that would then uh, change over time. So it's possible. I mean, the, the, the difficulty for the committee is that we, 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 you're making incredibly important policy decisions very rapidly in a situation of uncertainty, and there are very good reasons those decisions have to be made. Um, I do think that we can look to the trials for uh, good, unconfounded suggestions of the likely short-term efficacy. Uh, Dr. Gantz. Thank you for um, elaborating, excuse me, elaborating some of the things that we've all been very concerned about in a very, um, well, a very organized way. I'm wondering when you apply all of the founders and all of the um, considerations that you've made, um, what are the studies that filter out at the end that you would highlight um, for the committee that would actually suggest that we have um, good, unbiased, or at the best that we have in terms of how we should be vaccine So I'm going to, I'm not going to identify individual studies, but I would identify, I, I tried to, on my last slide, identify characteristics, and they would include careful control for the, of, the, of the confounders that we know are really important, such as uh, age, age of vaccination, availability of vaccination, you know, as precisely as possible, and then if possible, also uh, other characteristics from detailed healthcare records, and extremely close matching on, um, on, time, on calendar, for calendar time, so that broadly speaking, Somebody who experiences an event should only be compared with somebody who is being followed up on the same day. And it's perfectly possible to do that uh, using, you know, setting up your survival analysis in the right way. But I'm not sure that all studies have done it. But, I mean, I sympathize with you because it's inc I find it incredibly hard to look at the very diverse set of descriptions of what's been done in the individual studies and to know, well, did they do the things that I've just talked about? Thank you so much, uh, Professor Stern. And uh, again, I, we appreciate your keeping to time because we have a very busy day. Now we move uh, to looking at booster protection against confirmed infection and severe disease data from Israel. Uh, 
uh, we're going to hear two speakers who will speak one after the other, and then we will have the question period first, and I'll introduce both right now. Uh, uh, Sharon Alroy Price, who is the Director of Public Health Services at the Ministry of Health in Jerusalem, Israel, and then Professor Ron Milo, uh, who is at the Weizmann Institute in Israel. Uh, Dr. Alroy Price, please. Dear Chairman and Honorable Committee members, um, we were asked, the Israeli Ministry of Health, we were asked by the FDA to present our data on waning and booster effect, and we are delighted to do so. We, it's important for us to start by emphasizing that we do not pretend to tell other authorities what to do in their setting. We're here to present the data from Israel uh, and the decisions that we came up with uh, in our setting, and we hope that this will um, help other countries or enable them, other authorities, to reach uh, their decisions with the most advanced, uh, latest evidence uh, that we have in Israel. Based on the multiple logos that you see on the screen, I would like to highlight that the work presented here was done by several leading academic institutions in Israel in collaboration, knowing that the evaluation of the booster dose would be critical to Israel and the rest of the world. The analysis was done with extreme caution by different analysts uh, from different institutions by different analysis methods, as Ron will describe. And I would like to thank uh, all these institutions coming together to do this work very diligently uh, for several months. So we are both presenting, Ron and myself, and we have no competing financial interest to disclose. I would like to say that Israel Ministry of Health and Pfizer have data sharing agreement on public health surveillance data. Uh, however, since the data that we are showing here was actually done by um, these, these academic institutions, only the final results were shared with Pfizer. So I would like to take you back uh, in time to December 2020 in Israel. Uh, we started to see a third uh, surge in cases, our third wave, and this was actually after having two waves and two lockdowns, and when we were at the exit from the second wave, uh, we had really pandemic fatigue in the country, and so we saw once we started opening the economy, we didn't even were able to open everything up. As we were starting to open uh, places, we saw an increase in cases, both confirmed cases, but also severe and critically ill, uh, and there was a significant burden on the hospitals at that point in time. Um, and we started, we decided on a lockdown, but as I said, um, that decision was not as, com um, the compliance of the public was not uh, as it was in the previous two waves. Um, thankfully, we had uh, the ability to start a vaccination campaign in December, so Israel started vaccinating uh, as soon as there was F FDA approval for the pfizer BioNTech um, vaccine, and there was a quick um, compliance and uptake of the vaccine. We opened it in, state, in steps uh, based, based on ages, um, and we reached a very high level of vaccine and with that, uh, the vaccine uptake, we started to see a decrease in cases, over a hundredfold decrease in cases following the vaccination campaign. And as I said, there was a partially effective lockdown at the time. And the, uh, the, main, the main thing was that when we opened the lockdown, we were able to open everything up, lift all restrictions um, step by step, and the cases did not go up again. Um, we saw, and also the fact that we had reached high level of population-wide immunity early on, uh, which was wonderful, but we also can see that we're basically three months ahead from other countries uh, when we're talking about um, now waning. So the very efficient vaccination campaign made Israel um, the leading country, but when we compare it 
um, to other countries, there is a time gap. So Israel reached about 40% of it, uh, the population covered roughly three months ahead of other countries that have 5 million citizens or more. Um, and that is important when we move ahead to explain why our uh, data may be different than other settings. Before we move uh, ahead, I, it's worth noting several things about Israel. First, all the residents are covered by four HMOs with comprehensive electronic medical record. Uh, the second point is that we have large PCR testing capability in Israel, so we are basing all our data on PCR and not really rapid antigen testing. And two things that are allowing us to really monitor uh, the effects of uh, policy changes is that every COVID-19 test result, positive or negative, is reported online to the Ministry of Health. So we know every day uh, how many people are tested positive and negative. And all vaccines given in Israel are reported online to the Ministry of Health. So our capability of doing uh, really online vaccine effectiveness is, uh, is comprehensive. So our third wave was mainly alpha variant, as you see. And we started seeing, um, or we started sequencing the alpha variant uh, sometime at the end of March, but it was really rare. Uh, it was among people traveling abroad, and it was one at a time. But there was deep increase in Delta isolation, uh, reaching over 98% of the cases seen in June. And at the same time, we started to see our fourth wave. Uh, we are now still in our fourth wave experience, the highest level of infection uh, that we have seen so far in this pandemic. And this is despite widespread over 60% of doubly vaccinated individuals. Um, and in the vulnerable population, over 85% uh, there are doubly vaccinated. And once we saw that, we were trying to figure out what that tells us. We saw daily cases rose by more than tenfold in a month and a half. Uh, so from roughly 12 cases a day to about 1,000 in a month and a half. Um, and we, what was more worrisome is that we saw severe active cases increase by more than tenfold in a month. And among them was 60% vaccinated individuals, fully vaccinated individuals. So at that point, we had to um, stop and ask the question exactly as the CDC officer said, is that a Delta issue or is that a waning immunity issue? We had some clue that it might not be the Delta uh, variant, at least not alone uh, with its effect, because we started vaccinating 12 to 15 years old with FDA approval, and they actually had a fresh vaccine. And amongst them, we saw vaccine effectiveness of around 90%. Uh, so the majority of them were, were protected, but still you can't really say because of the age difference and everything, so the, the other question we needed to figure out was uh, what about the waning and does that play a role? And as Ron will describe now the analysis we did, we think this is a major part of our, our picture in Israel at least. Okay, so good morning everyone. Um, what I'll be showing you are the results of the observational uh, analysis that we did in Israel which is after a relatively short time since uh, the vaccination campaign. In spite of the potential biases that we described in the two papers that, uh, uh, of our, regarding the PB analysis, as well as the relatively short follow-up time, we thought it was our responsibility to analyze the data as thoroughly as we could and share it with the world through peer review. And this is what we'll be presenting today. So this is a bit of a, a heavy slide or complicated slide. It would be great if I also get a cursor uh, at the bottom. But uh, I would say let's try and follow uh, in the following way. Let's start from the x-axis. You can see three cohorts, and we'll be focusing initially on the cohort on the right, ages 60 and above. On the y-axis, you'll see the confirmed infection rate per 1,000. So we'll be talking about rates of of uh, SARS-CoV-2 confirmed infections. This is both symptomatic and asymptomatic based on PCR results. Mm -hmm. And I'll be talking here about people that were confirmed 
in the month of July. So as Sharon was saying, this is vastly dominated by the Delta variant. And the different uh, shades that you see here refer to what happened uh, for people that were vaccinated at different times. Starting from the dark colors would be January, meaning the ones that vaccinated early in the campaign. Uh, okay, great, I got a cursor. Good, so you can see here, this is in the beginning. And then you can see we're proceeding here based on the month of vaccination from six months prior to the uh, study period up to two or three months from the study period. And I think you can see that there is a change in the rate of confirmed infections per 1,000 people. And this is seen both at the age of 60 and above, which is what you see here, some monotonic change. And you can also view what happens with the other age groups. And the other age groups I do want to mention, you see the ones that vaccinated earliest tend to be healthcare workers or people at risk, mostly severely immunodeficient people. And therefore, this should be interpreted with caution. But you can see a signal of waning both at the other of the, both other cohorts uh, that we interpret as the waning effect. You can also see here what happens in terms of waning immunity in the relation to severe disease in the ages 60 and above. The y-axis is again regarding rates for 1,000 individuals in the study period in the month of July. All of those, or 99 or whatever percent, are the Delta variant because this is what by far the most dominant. You can see that the confidence intervals, these are 95% confidence intervals, you can see that they are larger now. This is because the number of cases is smaller. I would mention that we have here over a million people that are being analyzed, so I would say it's not easy to get very small confidence intervals uh, for uh, these studies, even though the study group is very, very large. And you can see the change in rate through time. All of this, by the way, is publicly available. We made it available on the archive, and it's in the final stages of being published. Here we were asked to also present what happens in the younger age groups. This is mostly preliminary data. And you can see the ages 50 to 59, 40 to 49, and the younger age groups. The numbers are much smaller because the rate of uh, severe disease is smaller. And therefore, the statistical confidence is also not as strong. And one could uh, uh, see the general potential trend but it is hard to conclusively interpret it, given the relatively small numbers. We do see what could be indications of a trend, but it depends heavily on how you want to also interpret what happened with the, uh, with the medical healthcare workers that were vaccinated in the month of January. There is an important point here that I want to mention that was an issue in Israel in trying to think about this, we saw in the CDC presentation and the following presentation, they were mentioning the issue of high uh, degree of protection that you get from the vaccine for severe cases. And I want to just take a minute to show something that I found that was, could, that was confusing in some of the discussions for us. There's no doubt that the vaccine gives good protection, meaning much better than not having the vaccine. And this has been shown in many different ways, and we observe it as well. At the same time, you could have high protection of, say, 97%, or you could have high protection of 85%. So 97% is what has been published, what is observed for, uh, again, severe disease. 85% was mentioned in some of the previous slides and also concurs with what we seem to be seeing right now of the Delta for those that were vaccinated relatively early, meaning half a year ago. And while 85% might still seem very high, and this is only a 12 percentage point difference, I just want to point out that this translates the 97% vaccine efficacy is mean 3% relative risk, whereas 85% vaccine efficacy is 15% relative risk, meaning a five-fold increase in relative risk, which is a very large increase 
a small change in the number of severe cases, vaccinated, doubly vaccinated severe cases that have to be taken care of in the Israeli hospital system. And this is in line with the values that Sharon was mentioning of what we saw, the sharp increase, over half of it in vaccinated people. So based on the evidence of waning in Israel and the trajectory exceeding national hospitalization capacity given the rapid rise in severe cases, Israel decided to begin a third vaccination campaign on July 30th, starting with the elderly. And I want to show you what we found regarding the, the effects of those, of those boosts. So here is just the, the uh, outline of the temporal uh, campaign. So as I said, we started at the end of July, beginning of August, and there's been about 1 million doses given for the ages 60 and above. And you can see also the other cohorts starting with the 60 plus two weeks later, and then 40 plus, et cetera. Altogether, we're close to 3 million booster doses that were given to date. You can see it here as a fraction of the eligible uh, population in each cohort. The eligible are the ones that got two vaccines. They were eligible to take the third vaccine, assuming it was over five months in our case. And you can see that the significant fraction of the population took it, and you can see that it started mostly with the elderly, and that uh, made us do the analysis for that uh, age cohort, which is where we have the most follow-up time. You can also see here the fraction of those, uh, of those eligible that were uh, vaccinated with the third dose to date. Overall, we're talking in the age of 60 plus that were included in the study. We're talking about a million people altogether, uh, in which there were about 13,000 confirmed infections in the study period. In August, we are still in the midst of a wave, and, and therefore there's a lot of cases. Okay, just before I, you know, I, I get to the results, let me show you uh, uh, what we might be expecting or the form of the results I'll be showing you. On the x-axis, I'll show you the date for vaccination. And on the y-axis, I'll show you the full reduction in risk compared to two doses. So throughout the study, for many reasons, for example, that were mentioned in the previous uh, presentation, we're sure to compare between those that already took uh, two doses and those that decided to also take the third dose and compare between those two groups and not the unvaccinated, which might contain some potential confounders. In the beginning, also as was mentioned before, there could be also possible trends and biases. In the days just following uh, the third dose, people usually, and we, have a, we see the signal, there's a tendency to go and do less uh, PCR tests uh, for COVID-19. But then we see that uh, decreasing, and then we're looking at the time period of about 12 days onward, which is the uh, time scale in which we're expecting to see the effect because of two reasons. One is because we know that there's time until the neutralizing antibody response uh, increases. That's usually on the order of a few days or a week. And then there's also a time between whenever you're infected or get uh, protection from infection and the time this is uh, observed through a test in PCR. That's on the average in Israel about five days, strongly related to the intubation period for developing symptoms or just in general also when you look at contact tracing, etc. that's roughly seven days plus five days, so 12 days is roughly what you're expecting to see the effect uh, being observed. So here are the results. Again, this is on the x-axis, you can see the time of infection, and on the y-axis, you can see, I'm seeing, yeah, sorry. And on the y-axis, you see the full reduction in the rate, again, compared to the two doses. All of this has also been publicly available, and now as, you know, I, we gave the slide as requested three days ago, but by now it's also published in the New England Journal of Medicine. All the results I'll be showing you are based on profound regression in order to take into account as many of the confounders as we could. It's adjusted for age, for gender, for demographic group, for the time at which the second dose was given, and the calendar date. Just as was mentioned before, that these two temporal effects should be taken into account. And we'll be comparing when we're talking about uh, protection, 
in the main analysis, we're comparing between what happened 12 days onward versus what happened with no booster, meaning only two doses. Here is a summary of the results. We're getting an estimated protection of about 11-fold. You can see that the confidence intervals here are relatively uh, small, somewhere between 10 and 12, as a result of the many risk days that go into the analysis. And the fact that there's over 1,000 infections in this group over those 10 million risk days and about 5,000 5, infections or some 4,000 infections in the two dose only, no booster group. The rate difference is about 86.6 per 100,000 person days. These are the results for the age 60 and above. We also have preliminary results for the ages 50 to 59, and you can see a consistent picture where after about 12 days, we're seeing about a tenfold protection. Similarly, for the ages 40 to 49, we see again something like tenfold decrease, tenfold protection, again doing the same kind of Platform regression adjusted for all of those aspects. We understand the importance of, of, of doing this analysis uh, as thoroughly as possible, and therefore we try to use different approaches. So what I showed you so far is based on the platform uh, regression approach. We also use the matching approach, which is uh, common uh, in many of the studies uh, for doing this. And when we're doing matching between those that got three doses to two doses, we got a very similar result in terms of the reduction in the, in the risk. We also did another kind of analysis, being worried that maybe there are effects that we should account for just in terms of the behavior of those that only decide to take three doses versus two doses. And therefore, we took only those that took three doses. And as you can see here, we compared between those that uh, were 12 days onward Versus now the control group would be people that decided to take the third dose, but we're looking at what happened to them four to six days following the booster dose. And we think that even under this analysis, we think that we're getting about five-fold reduction, meaning significant protection also in this more stringent or conservative type of analysis. Let me move on to show you what we get for the severe results. Here you see what happens for the ages 60 and above in terms of severe COVID-19 for the same uh, study period. And we're seeing, again, a very significant decrease in the rate on the order of tenfold or higher, and an absolute rate difference of 7.5 severe cases per 100,000 person days. Going back to the, uh, to the issue of delta versus alpha and waning, I want to point out that overall what we're seeing, if we had a, in terms of uh, in confirmed infection, if after waning we're seeing something of the order of 50% versus the delta, which is what is also observed in different studies from around the world, with a tenfold increase, which is roughly what we're seeing, you get back to about 95%. Similarly, if you start from about 80% vaccine efficacy against severe disease, with a tenfold increase, you get to about 97% or higher. And these are similar to the report of what happens in terms of protection against, against the alpha variant with the fresh vaccine. So overall, it seems like with the booster dose, we are getting again the, the protection that we originally got against the alpha variant, and I want to point out that it's very hard to decompose what is the net effect that only comes from the waning or only comes from the difference between the alpha and the delta. What I've shown you enables us to do some of that, but overall I would say even if you can't decompose exactly the effect, what we're seeing here is that in totality the combination of both gives you the results that I just presented. I want to finish by just seeing what happens at the national level. This is what was the reproduction number R that we observed in Israel. And as you can see, throughout the month of, uh, of uh, June, and even before that, we were at about 1.3 to 1.4, which translates to a doubling every 10 days. 
which relates to what Sharon was saying about the fact that we had over a hundredfold increase in the prevalence. This is what happened following uh, the, the, in the in the following weeks and months. We tried to reinstate the green passport, but that did not have the, had the marked effect on the on the production number. And then with the booster campaign, with a delay that is roughly in line with what uh, we expect, we started to see a continuous decrease uh, in the reproduction number. You can see that this took a while, and uh, and therefore we had to make a decision also for the other age groups where we still had an increase in the numbers and the R was still uh, above one. This shows you, again, the effect of the, at the national level. What you're seeing here as a function of time is what was the, what would happen to the number of new daily cases in terms of confirmation following the administration of the booster dose. This was for the ages 60 and above. And we see that with a delay of about two weeks, we're seeing a decrease, whereas for the other ages where the booster dose was still not administered, we see a continuous rise. This is in terms of confirmation. Here you can see the picture in terms of what happened in terms of severe disease. So we're talking about daily severe cases. You can see the booster dose being administered, and you're seeing that with a delay, you start to see a sharp decrease for those vaccinated versus those that were unvaccinated in which the rise continued and uh, did not go down significantly. Okay, Sharon. Sharon, you're, you're on mute. Thank you. Uh, you can see. You can see here uh, the projection that we were looking at. The, the uh, pink projection uh, was based on no booster um, at all. And looking at the reproduction number, as, as Ron said, we were doubling every 10 days, and we got to places of thousands of cases, doubling every 10 days. Uh, and it's scary. And uh, the fact that we had roughly 1.5% of those confirmed cases turning into severe and cr critically ill patients. So you see here the, the pink line, which is the model we were looking at, that was based on the reproductive number, uh, the cases, number of cases, confirmed cases that we had each day, uh, and then how many of them would turn into being severe cases, and then accumulating them over time. And you see the uh, purple one looking at a model uh, taking into consideration a booster dose uh, with 80% compliance rate, and the black line is actually the line of our data. Um, so if we only looked at the model at the end of August, if we had not started booster doses at the end of July, we would have come to uh, the capacity of Israel uh, hospitalization capabilities and probably have uh, gone beyond it. So 2,000 active severe cases uh, that are hospitalized in the in in um, hospitals in Israel is way beyond what we experienced in the third wave. Just to give it context, we were uh, at 1,200 cases, and it was stretching. Uh, we had uh, increasing mortality rate. It was it was a stretch. So this uh, we were anticipating at the end of August, uh, 2,000 cases, active severe cases a day um, in the hospitalized. So what happened is with the booster dose we were able to dampen uh, that effect, and our severe uh, cases now that are hospitalized are roughly 700 or less, and that has stayed stable, even though we still have days of 10,000 confirmed cases a day. So the, the other point, uh, except for effectiveness and, the, um, and the, what we think is important uh, in, uh, to, to see uh, with the vaccine, the other really important point is the safety. So I'm going to show you a few slides of the rate of uh, events that are reported to the Israeli Ministry of Health. I want to emphasize from the get-go that we are sure 
uh, to have underreporting, probably the same at every dose, but even if we have less under, uh, more underreporting at the third dose, we still would think that serious adverse event would be reported to us. Um, and I will, I will touch on myocarditis in a moment. But this is generally the, um, the adverse event reporting to us um, from the first dose, sorry, the first dose, the second dose, and now the third dose. And what we can clearly see is that for uh, systemic adverse events, uh, we didn't see any new uh, uh, types of adverse events, and the rate, uh, to be modest, is at least the same, if not lower. And if we look at local adverse events, we would still, still see uh, sort of the same trend. We don't see any new adverse event. We know that there's more lymphadenopathy, uh, but we're not seeing any new adverse events. And the rate is smaller. Again, I say that we, with, uh, with caution that it's probably underreporting when our uh, HMOs are doing direct uh, calling people or, or ask, sending them uh, questionnaires. They get more than that. Uh, but uh, I want to emphasize on the serious adverse event because this is what is really uh, important to us. And we had 19 serious uh, reports following the third dose for more than 2.8 million booster dose administered, and each one of them is being investigated by an independent clinical work group using all the data uh, from the hospitals, from the HMOs, uh, to try to figure out if this is connected uh, to the third dose or not. Um, so what we have been getting is seven reports uh, on, on a serious adverse event following the third dose of, between, of the ages 12 to 64. You see how many vaccines uh, it was, over 2 million. And um, we had two allergic reactions that uh, are noted as uh, connected to the uh, third dose. We had a case of myocarditis in a male in his 30s uh, who was hospitalized for two days and discharged. Um, and we had a case of Guillain Barre and Bell's palsy uh, that is possibly connected to the dose. And then three cases of DVT, PE, TIA, CVA, and uh, VT in a runner that happened during a routine stress test. All three of them uh, was not deemed connected to the vaccine by the work group. And among 65 and above, you see over 8,000, 800,000 uh, vaccinees. We had 12 cases of serious uh, adverse events. Uh, the first was suspected encephalitis, a guy who came in with fever and confusion. And for him, it was the second time it happened. It happened to him after the first dose. Uh, did not happen after the second dose, but did happen again after the third. And that's a possible connection. A vitreous hemorrhage that is possibly connected. Um, a CVA uh, that is still under investigation, uh, a, a bulk of, of cases, uh, four or five cases uh, that are infection origin, uh, septic shock, thrombocytopenia due to sepsis, uh, three cases of UTI and pneumonia that was deemed unconnected to the vaccine, um, and then three cases of uh, mortality that was not connected uh, people with uh, very um, multiple comorbidities uh, that had reason for uh, their demise uh, that was not connected to the, um, to the vaccine. And so the myocarditis focus, I want to I wanna emphasize first on the, this sentence. Most young vaccinees received booster only in the last two weeks, so we don't have a full follow-up for them for uh, 30 days as we, as we uh, want, we continue to follow them. Uh, another important point is in Israel, because of the myocarditis, that was a signal, we saw it in the second um, dose of the vaccine. We saw increase in cases among uh, young, mainly male, between the ages of 16 to 30. Uh, so you see here increase in cases after the second dose. And that was usually after the fourth or fifth day uh, or during the fourth or fifth day after the second dose. So to some extent, we believe that some cases should have popped up in the two weeks follow-up that we have so far for several of the vaccines. Um, but still, we need to be very cautious. We had only one case, as it said, of the 30-something-year-old 30, um, 30 male. Um, in the myocarditis cases, we're actually doing active surveillance. So it's not just um, 
reporting to us. We are contacting each hospital every week to get all myocarditis cases, not just following vaccination. And so we feel here uh, much more safe that uh, it's not just under reporting effect. And our last slide is uh, really the summary. So the booster dose in Israel was effective and so far had safety profile similar to the other doses. We saw that the booster dose uh, improves the protection by tenfold against confirmed infection and at least for elderly against severe COVID-19. Um, what we saw is basically that the post-booster effic uh, efficacy against Delta was similar to the pre-waning efficacy against Alpha. It's like a fresh uh, vaccine. And the adverse events was not, were not more acute than the first or second, and we didn't see any new severe uh, cases of adverse events. Based on the data that we uh, continuously collect, uh, we are presenting this to our Vaccine Safety and Effectiveness Committee, and they have approved by staff uh, giving the booster dose um, after five months to uh, people starting from 60 and then 50 and then 40. Um, and so we are rolling now uh, in uh, the, the vaccination campaign. And um, administration of the booster dose helped Israel dampen severe cases in the fourth wave. Thank you for your attention. And thank you both so much for these valuable data. Uh, I was about to ask a too bold question, which I usually don't uh, like to allow, uh, but uh, uh, first about myocarditis, but you presented uh, very carefully information, including uh, the fact that younger individuals really have not been heavily vaccinated as yet. So the age is there, uh, the age cutoff is hard to determine. Uh, one point of information, the second dose in Israel of, with the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine was typically given in, after three weeks or delayed? Yes. Yes, so we gave, uh, we started the uh, vaccine campaign after the FDA approval exactly by the protocol approved by the FDA with three weeks apart. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. Pergan. Thank you very much. That was a really um, thoughtful set of slides and we really appreciate you sharing with the committee. I had a question specifically. It seems like you have an opportunity to look at um, demographic differences between individuals who were eligible to get um, vaccinated with the booster but didn't. Um, the group that only received two doses versus received the three. Do you find any demographic um, differences? You have a really robust medical record. And I'd be really curious to know, are there differences that might suggest um, maybe that the group that received the booster were um, either higher risk or did um, differential um, levels of protection in that. Yes, so, so I would say we definitely, we definitely looked into this and there are differences which we account for in uh, both in the Poisson regression as confounders and in the matching approach also as confounders. We see them, for example, in terms of the tendency to take the third dose which is different among different demographic groups in Israeli society, among different age groups. And this is all reported in the, in the paper that was published. Uh, and you can see in the table there are really significant differences, but all of those are supposed to be accounted for inherently in the way we're doing the analysis. Dr. Carilla. Thank you, Ardo. See if my camera is actually working you. this time. Nope. Okay. Uh, there we go. Yes, it is now. Oh, we so, uh, yes. <laughs> Thank you for the presentation. Very, very, very insightful. Uh, one of the one of the things that stands out for me from your data is that um, the waning of immunity, which seems to be more waning of immunity rather than a Delta-specific phenomenon, although there may be a small component. It would seem that one would have to conclude either that the mRNA vaccine in, in general, that, that platform, 
or else the shortened dosing interval does not really, between the two doses does not lead to long-term good durability of the immune response. And those individuals at risk, particularly for severe disease, don't have a good cell-mediated immune response and are relying entirely on their neutralizing titer and other serology, which is dropping off rather quickly. Your boost clearly does that. So my question to you is, 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 is actually twofold. One, although it's very early, do you have any evidence that the six-month boost is actually contributing with a better dosing interval to give you more long-term durability in the immune response? And is there any change in the kinetics of the antibody response, or do you anticipate that just every six months you're going to have to keep boosting these people? So I'll start with the, with the end of your question. I think this is very early. We can't really tell. We know from uh, other viruses that sometimes, like in hepatitis, you get a dose and after a month a dose and after six months a booster, and you have protection for uh, many, many years, uh, whereas for influenza we need to, to be vaccinated every year. And I think it's not really clear where this is going. We definitely don't have any plans at the moment to boost every six months. We'll base it exactly as we did here uh, based on the results. We will continue to monitor and see if there is, again, any waning, uh, any waning effect. Uh, but it may be that we won't see that, that after the booster we'll have a higher protection for a longer period of time. I, I would add that, 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 I, that I think that the effect of the Delta versus Alpha is not very small. I think they're both very significant, both the Alpha versus Delta and the waning. And there's also an, maybe an interaction, a synergistic effect from both of them together. So I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't think about it as a small effect. Thank you. Dr. Dr. Levy. And quick questions and quick answers, please. We're going to have time to come back again later. Hello. Um, I'd like to uh, thank the presenters for a wonderful presentation and impressive progress. Um, one question I had was related to the decision to give boosters to the younger individuals as well. As we know, there is some increased risk of myocarditis, particularly in younger males, and it seemed like there was relatively less data in the younger age group. So what were the considerations from a policy perspective of recommending a booster for that youngest group? If, if Dr. Elroy Priest can say a few words, I'd really appreciate it. Thank you. Sure. So first of all, we know from a research done by Clolit HMO in Israel that the risk of myocarditis from corona itself is higher than the risk for, from uh, the vaccine. And when you have a uh, really roaring pandemic with a surge of thousands of cases and doubling every uh, 10 days, the risk of people, even young people, to be infected with corona and get, um, get the uh, myocarditis is higher than being vaccinated. Uh, and that risk, and I have to say that there is a work being published uh, or in the, um, in the review process, um, from Israel about myocarditis, and in 95% of the cases, the myocarditis was, uh, was uh, not severe. Um, and so we feel that when we weigh um, a pandemic roaring with, uh, um, we saw reproductive number of over 1.3, um, doubling every 10 days, the risk even for the young adults would be higher. And I have to say something about a mix of our population. So if we only vaccinated the 60 and above, um, this is roughly 16% of our population. Most of our population is younger. And when we looked at the, uh, at the cases, confirmed cases, that we had in the fourth wave, 15% of them were 60 and above. So the majority was not the 60 and above, and we believe we wouldn't be able to control the pandemic just by vaccinating those uh, 60 and, and above. Uh, when you have roaring pandemic and we, we know that the numbers are doubling, um, then we really have to make sure that we get to a reproductive number of under one in order to control this. And we wouldn't have been able to do this, uh, we think, just what, by vaccinating the 60 and above. And, and any sense of um, a... a uh... well, we're going to have to move on. 
Okay. We've got a, a list of about eight people <laughs> who want to ask questions. Dr. Thank Gans. You. Go ahead, please. Yes, Gans. <laughs> We're going to have to go on Thank to you. Dr. Rubin until, until sorry, Dr. Dance. Sorry. Okay, um, okay, Dr. Dance, quickly. Thank you. Um, this is wonderful and very provocative given that you were ahead of us and so foreseeing the future. So thank you for sharing your data. I had a question because um, not only, and as you um, suggested in your last answer, in order to um, really control a pandemic, we actually have to control secondary cases, so the ability to spread. And what we are starting to see is in our vaccinated households, we are starting to see spread into our younger populations who are no longer seemingly um, protected by you know, herd immunity around them. Um, were you able to look at the um, secondary cases within households? You have the opportunity to do that. People are getting tested. So what is the, um, the lack of protection for children when you started seeing those um, surges? And then was there any control um, of that protection to those in our societies who haven't been able to be vaccinated? Quick answer to a complicated question, please. <laughs> we'll, we'll do our best. Um, so um, our fourth wave actually started with younger people coming from abroad um, and, their, and their kids. The, the older adults were vaccinated. The kids obviously were not. And we, see, uh, we saw a, a surge in cases among both. Um, and that was the beginning of our fourth wave uh, in kind of two spots and then spread uh, in a community way. Uh, what we saw at the beginning of, of uh, June is that the ability of a vaccinated individual to, um, to spread it to others was uh, lower than in the non-vaccinated. So uh, roughly 80% um, of the people who were vaccinated at the beginning who were vaccinated uh, did not um, infect others outside their household. In their household, it was highly um, uh, contagious. So um, vaccinees that became confirmed cases were um, infecting their household. Um, and that actually led us to, uh, to a policy that said, if, if you have a confirmed case at your household and you need to take care of him, uh, a child, you can't really go in and out taking care of him because you'll be infected and you'll infect others going to work. Um, so we definitely see um, that cases uh, that are vaccin vaccinated, doubly vaccinated, that are no longer fresh, what we call more than six months from the second dose, are uh, infecting other people. It's obviously less than non-vaccinated, uh, but we're seeing that, especially in their household. Dr. Rubin, the final question before we are forced to take a break. Uh, thanks, Arnold. Um, thank you very much for the presentation um, and for generously sharing the data. The, the, the Israeli data are very important for all of us making these decisions. So uh, it's been a great laboratory and you've done a very nice job of it. Um, Dr. Gans just mentioned how one of the goals would be to prevent transmission and, and reduce the size of the epidemic, but of course, Another goal is preventing severe disease. If, if you look at it through that lens, um, can you identify the people who are likely to get severe disease? Do they look like the people at high risk otherwise? Um, in other words, could you focus the administration of a third dose of vaccine on particular groups to give a very high yield for preventing severe disease? So the obvious question is those who are 60 and above and those who have uh, comorbid conditions, especially uh, morbid obesity, we see that as a very um, clear um, chronic disease that is a risk factor for COVID-19. Um, however, as I said before, we having uh, about 60% of the population over 60 um, it's really very, we can't imagine just vaccinating those, that group 
knowing that 85% of the confirmed infections are among the rest of the population, and uh, trying to get to a reproductive number of under, under one so that this pandemic starts to shrink, this wave will start to fall. Um, we have to, in our opinion, in Israel, we had to vaccinate more than just 16% of the population to get there. So we, we definitely see mortality among young people who are not vaccinated, uh, 30, uh, 25, 41, really young people. And we started to see uh, the same trend uh, of severe, critically ill patients among those who are 40 to 60 and have been doubly vaccinated. And we just didn't wanna to, want to wait to see uh, those results. And we knew that we needed to vaccinate larger proportion of the population in order to get the numbers down quickly. And I, and I have to add one more thing. Um, we, all, we always look at the severe and critical uh, disease status or mortality. Uh, I think there is also importance in long COVID among those who are uh, infected. And so we can't really put this aside and say, you know, this is influenza. If, 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 you, if you went through this, it's fine. We see uh, that there is a high percentage of people, including young people, who are left with symptoms for over months. So there are several reasons why we wanted to make sure that we overcome this fourth wave. Okay, thank you so much. A very good and very informative presentation the very vigorous discussion, which actually will be uh, continued in the question and answer session, which comes later. And I hope our speakers from Israel, especially where there's a seven hour time difference, uh, will be able to stay with us and from the UK as well for that discussion later on. So five minutes uh, for a break and then we resume again. Thank you.
Oh, welcome back to the 167th uh, VERPAC meeting. We will get started with, uh, that was a nice little short break, and I will hand it back to uh, Dr. Monto. Take it away. Thank you, Mike. Uh, we're about to move to the sponsor presentations. Uh, we're going to be hearing about the uh, effect of the booster shot, uh, and we're going to be listening to presentations from Donna Boyce, Senior Vice President, Global Regulatory Affairs at Pfizer, and from Dr. Bill Gruber, Senior Vice President at Pfizer. Take it away. Good morning, members of the committee, FDA, and ladies and gentlemen in the audience. It's a pleasure to be here today. I'm Donna Boyce, and I'm the Senior Vice President of Global Regulatory Affairs for Pfizer. I would like to thank the FDA for organizing this VERPAC and the VERPAC chair and members for their time. Pfizer and our partner, BioNTech, are pleased to be here today to discuss a revision to the dosing schedule for our mRNA COVID-19 vaccine. Our presentation today will follow this agenda. After I provide a brief introduction, Dr. William Gruber, Senior Vice President, Vaccine Clinical R&D, will review the Booster Clinical Development Program including the neutralization data from phase one, the phase three immunogenicity and safety results, the pharmacovigilance plans, real world evidence supporting the use of a booster and a benefit risk conclusion. After this, I will come back to provide conclusions for our presentation. The Pfizer BioNTech COVID-19 vaccine, also known as BNT162B2, has been available for the prevention of COVID-19 disease in individuals greater than or equal to 16 years of age since December 2020 under an emergency use authorization and in individuals greater than 12 years of age since May 2021. To date, 1.7 billion doses have been distributed globally. Between February and May 2021, and in accordance with FDA guidance, we conducted a pivotal clinical study to evaluate the safety and effectiveness of a booster dose. FDA granted full VLA approval of BNT162B2, also known as Community, on August 23rd for the prevention of COVID-19 disease in individuals greater than 16 years of age as a two-dose series given three weeks apart. The duration of protection following the two-dose primary series is currently unknown, but available data suggests that efficacy wanes over time. Based on the positive results of the booster dose study, available real-world evidence, and in consultation with FDA, on August 27th, we submitted a supplemental biologics license application to seek approval of a single booster dose after the primary series. There is substantial randomized controlled trial data and real-world evidence to support that vaccine efficacy waned over time. As you heard earlier, recent data from Israel and the United States in the context of the Delta variant of concern suggests that vaccine protection against COVID-19 infection wanes approximately six to eight months following the second dose. A retrospective real-world evidence cohort study conducted at Kaiser Permanente, Southern California, suggests that the observed erosion in vaccine effectiveness is likely primarily due to waning effectiveness rather than due to Delta escaping vaccine protection. Waning effectiveness over time is further supported by a recent FDA-requested post hoc analysis of breakthrough cases in the pivotal phase three efficacy study. To demonstrate the safety and effectiveness of a booster dose against COVID-19, Pfizer and BioNTech conducted a sub-study of the phase three pivotal study that complies with the FDA guidance. The results of this study demonstrate that a booster dose of BNT162B2 has an acceptable safety profile and elicits robust immune responses. Finally, real-world evidence from a recently initiated booster vaccination program in Israel that we just heard uh, in the face of waning immunity and in the period when the Delta is the dominant vaccine shows a booster dose has a reactogenicity profile similar to that seen after receipt of the second primary series dose and restores high levels of protection against COVID-19 outcomes. 
The booster study was conducted in individuals 18 to 55 years of age, as recommended in the FDA guidance. The study was conducted in two phases. Phase one demonstrated that a booster dose administered approximately six months after the second vaccination of our vaccine had an acceptable safety profile and elicited robust immune responses against the wild type as well as the beta and delta variants of concern. Phase three showed that the vaccine was as well tolerated as the second primary dose and elicited immune responses against the wild type variant that were non-inferior to the immune responses observed after the second primary dose, meeting the protocol specified immunobridging success criteria for GMTs and zero response rates. Moreover, and in accordance with FDA guidance, the safety and effectiveness of the booster dose in individuals 18 to 55 years of age can be extrapolated to individuals 16 and 17 years of age and over 55 years of age. These data serve as the basis for the supplemental biologics license application. During the remainder of our presentation, we will share data with you that demonstrate that the overall benefit risk of the booster dose is favorable. Specifically, that the demonstrated safety and effectiveness of a third dose support adding a booster dose to the vaccination schedule. And the global real-world evidence demonstrates that the reduction in vaccine efficacy is likely due to waning effectiveness and supports that a booster dose can restore high levels of protection with an acceptable safety profile. Based on these, we're requesting licensure of a single booster dose of BNT162B2 administered intramuscularly at least six months after the primary series in individuals greater than 16 years of age. I will now turn our presentation over to Dr. William Gruber, who will present clear and compelling data demonstrating the booster safety, immunogenicity, and effectiveness. Bill? Thank you, Donna. It's my pleasure to share with you today the clinical program that supports the safety and effectiveness of a booster dose. I have three goals in my presentation this morning. First, I will speak to the public health need that could be well served by a booster. Second, I will describe the clinical trial and real-world effectiveness data supporting the safety and effectiveness of the booster dose. Third, I will conclude with overall benefit risk of a booster dose. Let's begin. There is clear erosion of vaccine protection over time against COVID-19, and emerging data indicates loss of protection against hospitalization. We need to maintain high vaccine effectiveness against COVID-19 to contain the pandemic. A safe and effective Pfizer-BNT vaccine booster dose for individuals 16 years of age and older would be expected to restore protection and reduce COVID-19 illness and spread. The BNT162B2 vaccine is highly protective against COVID-19, but the duration of protection wanes over time. Let's talk about the lines of evidence supporting this claim. First, data from the pivotal phase three clinical trial showed that two doses of the five Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine administered three weeks apart confers protection against both symptomatic and severe COVID-19. That, of course, was the basis for the emergency use authorization and the recent licensure of the COVID-19 vaccine in individuals 16 years of age and older. The full duration of protection of the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine is currently unknown. An analysis of efficacy up to six months after dose two from the pivotal clinical trial shows that initial vaccine efficacy slightly wanes over time in the pre-Delta period from 96.2% in the first two months after vaccination to 90.1% over four months and is still sustained at 83.7% up to approximately six months. Further waning of immunity and protection over time has been observed across the world, coinciding with penetration of the Delta variant. Originally observed in Israel, as you heard, this is now being observed in the United States and elsewhere. As we all know, 
The Delta variant became widespread globally as of June and July of this year. Reports describing reduced effectiveness of the Pfizer vaccine and other COVID-19 vaccines against SARS coronavirus 2 infections caused by Delta have surfaced from Israel, the United States, and Qatar, as you've also heard earlier this morning. Recently in Israel, reduction in vaccine effectiveness has been observed against hospitalization and severe infection over time after a two-dose Pfizer vaccine primary series. And again, you heard details about this earlier today from the Israeli Ministry of Health. In addition, recent U.S. CDC data hint at reduced COVID-19 vaccine effectiveness over time against severe disease and hospitalization in the U.S. This reduced uh, vaccine effectiveness tracks with longer spans of time between two doses of vaccine and SARS coronavirus 2 exposure. Vaccine effectiveness studies to date have not adequately differentiated the impact of Delta from potential waning immunity on recent reductions of vaccine effectiveness. In collaboration with Kaiser Permanente Southern California, Pfizer evaluated overall and variant-specific real-world effectiveness of the Pfizer vaccine against SARS coronavirus 2 infection and COVID-19 related hospitalizations by time since vaccination. This was done to further inform issues of waning immunity and protection. So let's first take a look at the methods that were used in the Kaiser trial that informed thinking. The setting is the Kaiser Permanente Southern California group, which includes over 3.4 million members greater than 12 years of age who would be potential vaccine recipients. The study period includes December of 2020 through August the 8th, 2021. This encompasses both the period when first the alpha and later the delta variants were present. Whole genome sequencing has been done on all samples obtained during this period as part of this trial. A cohort approach was used using Cox models. And again, this looks for both outcomes of infection as well as COVID-19 related hospitalization as defined in the footnotes shown at the bottom of the slide. The vaccine status was evaluated with those fully vaccinated with two doses of vaccine at least seven days after the second dose. This also looked at attack rates in the unvaccinated as a comparator. Here's the first key observation. Vaccine effectiveness waned over time against infections, but as of this summer, had not yet waned against hospitalization in the Kaiser Permanente study. So let me describe for you the data that supports these observations. If we start on the left-hand side, you see the graph titled SARS coronavirus 2 infection. On the x-axis are represented months after full vaccination and on the y-axis adjusted vaccine effectiveness. Each of the colored lines represents a different age group from 12 to 15 years of age up to adults 65 years of age and older. The black line represents all individuals 12 years of age and older. Vaccine effectiveness against circulating virus at each time point is shown as a corresponding number above the x-axis. Vaccine effectiveness was 88% in individuals one month after two doses of the Pfizer vaccine in this study. As you can see, for all age groups, 16 years of age and above, efficacy wanes over time, dropping to 47% for those individuals out more than five months from completion of the two-dose series. For 12 to 15-year-olds, efficacy may be somewhat better sustained, perhaps consistent with higher virus neutralization levels achieved in this age bracket. However, follow-up is of shorter duration due to the more recent approval of vaccine for this age group. If we look on the right-hand side, we see, in contrast to effectiveness against infection, effectiveness against COVID-19-related hospitalization has been sustained over this period of time in all age groups from 12 to 15 years of age to those over 65 years of age, out to at least five months you can see that the efficacy for those vaccinated at least at less than one month is 87%, and for those vaccinated at greater than five months is still around 88%. Now, please keep in mind what you've heard earlier from the Israeli Ministry of Health. 
effectiveness against severe disease and hospitalization has begun to decline in Israel. The combination of early comprehensive immunization and a high proportion of the population more than six months post-vaccination in Israel may have contributed to this early signal in Israel. These results, along with recent CDC data, portend that effectiveness of, against uh, COVID-19 hospitalization and severe disease are less likely to remain sustained in the future in the U.S. We may, we may see similar increases in hospitalizations and severe disease in weeks to months for those individuals vaccinated early in the U.S. campaign. If so, the time to restore protection with a safe and effective booster dose of BNT162B2 is now. It's important also to look at the relationship between vaccine effectiveness and the variants that are circulating. And a second key observation from the Kaiser study becomes clear. Vaccine effectiveness wanes over time irrespective of the variant of concern. What is the evidence to support this claim? Again, the orientation of this slide is much the same as you saw previously. Months after full vaccination are shown on the x-axis and adjusted vaccine efficacy is shown on the y-axis. Whether we examine other sequence SARS coronavirus 2 variants represented by the black line or the Delta variant shown in the blue line, the vaccine effectiveness over time wanes. Point estimates of vaccine effectiveness are lower for the Delta variant after completion of a two-dose vaccine series, but a number of the confidence intervals overlap. Most prominently, comparative data shown here supports that declining immune response over time is the primary driver of vaccine effectiveness and not variant escape. Restoration or improved immune response by a booster BNT162B2 dose would be expected to restore the comparable high protection against Delta and other variants seen at the left end of the graphs. We also have additional information gleaned from the pivotal clinical trial that informs this thinking. This type of randomized control analysis was noted to be a best practice by Dr. Stern earlier today. It reveals waning protection between five and 10 months after two doses of the Pfizer vaccine. As shown in the top graphic, this evaluation was done in the pivotal phase three efficacy trial in individuals over 16 years of age who completed the two dose series early in the study, the original vaccinees, to participants who were in the placebo group that crossed over to the vaccine after the vaccine received emergency use authorization. This permitted evaluation of the difference in incidence rate and relative protection against COVID-19 for those who received vaccine proximate to the Delta surge, the crossover group, versus those who received vaccine more remotely, the original vaccinees. The text at the bottom, beginning on the left, describes the results. The mean time from dose two to July the 1st is 4.7 months for the crossover group and 9.8 months for the original vaccine group, providing a separation in time that allows one to differentiate a potential effect of this parameter on immune response and protection. 90% of the crossover group received dose two less than six months prior to July the 1st, and almost all in the original vaccinee group received dose two more than eight months prior to July the 1st. Relative vaccine efficacy comparing those immunized later compared to those immunized earlier was 26.3%. If we assume for a moment the protection against COVID-19 falls below 70%, which is reasonable based on trial data as well as the Kaiser data I've shared with you, and that it falls below 70% at five months after vaccination, efficacy by extrapolation would be expected to be below 60% at 10 months compared to those that were unvaccinated. Difference in incidence rates calculate as 18.6 cases per 1,000 person years of follow-up. And the 
The magnitude of this risk highlights the public health importance of time when one extrapolates this to the millions of individuals who may remain at risk in the setting of Delta variant or other variant spread. Over a year's time, 1.86 million more cases might be expected to occur in 100 million individuals similarly exposed over a year who are 10 months out from a two-dose series compared to those five months out from a two-dose series. A safe and effective booster dose of the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine would be expected to narrow this gap. So let me summarize then the public health need that leads us to conclude that a safe and effective booster would be beneficial. Israel and the United States real world evidence suggests that vaccine efficacy against COVID-19 infection wanes approximately six to eight months following the second dose when the Delta variant is predominant. A retrospective Kaiser study suggests that vaccine efficacy reductions are primarily due to waning vaccine-induced immunity rather than due to Delta escaping vaccine protection. Waning vaccine effectiveness is further supported by the recent FDA-requested post hoc analysis of breakthrough cases in the pivotal Phase three clinical study. While waning vaccine efficacy against hospitalization was not observed in the United States, this should be carefully monitored as data from Israel suggests that reduced effectiveness against severe disease could eventually follow reductions in vaccine effectiveness against SARS coronavirus 2 infections. The Israeli experience could portend the U.S. COVID-19 future and soon. So the information I've presented to you speaks to the importance of waning protection and a compelling rationale to restore protection. What information do we have that reassures us about the safety and potential effectiveness of a booster dose to meet that need? I'm going to share that with you now. First, it is important to understand the nature of responses across not only the current variant of variants of concern, but variants that may be of concern in the future as we contemplate the advantages of a booster dose. For this, information that we have after two doses of the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine are reassuring. The vaccine-elicited sera effectively neutralize a broad range of SARS coronavirus 2 spike variants after two doses of the Pfizer-BioNTech mRNA vaccine. And you can see this is true whether we're talking about the wild-type variant, the previously prominent alpha variant, the beta variant, or the more recent delta variants. I would highlight that even in a circumstance associated with the lowest response seen here, a GMT of 194 to the beta variant, efficacy was observed in the South African cohort from our pivotal trial. You will recall that we demonstrated a case split of 0, 9 vaccine versus placebo, eight of whom had a specimen successfully sequenced to reveal that the virus was the beta variant. So this provides the following reassurances. So far, immunologic escape from serum neutralization after two vaccine doses has not been demonstrated. Given that a second Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine dose is associated with robust antibody responses across variants of concern. Increased responses to vaccine virus, what we reference as wild-type virus, after a third dose should also be associated with increased neutralization response to variants of concern. I will share with you evidence that supports this logic. First, I want to remind you about the original pivotal study design, which was used for us to examine a booster dose. This slide may look familiar to you because it's similar to what was presented at the time of emergency use authorization. The vaccination period for the purposes of this trial for the two primary doses were 21 days apart. As you can see represented on the graph, Individuals had active surveillance performed to look for COVID-19 illness in association with nucleic acid amplification test positive evidence of SARS coronavirus 2 infection. As you can see, 
The length of times that were used to follow up for reactogenicity shown in the green, one month for non-serious AEs, six months for serious AEs, and up to two years for deaths occurring in this population, including older adults and those with comorbid conditions. Now I want to share with you where we are today. This graphic represents the experimental design of a third dose of vaccine administered to individuals recruited from the phase one and phase three phase of the pivotal safety and efficacy trial. Again, we took the population who had received their original two doses 21 days apart. For phase one, we went to the sentinel cohorts who were first immunized as part of our trial in May of last year, which represented 23 individuals, and administered a booster dose, obtaining the safety information as well as serum samples to measure immune response over the time period shown. Lighter blue represents days, darker blue months. After we gained sufficient information from phase one that reassured us about the safety and immune response to the vaccine, we then moved to the expanded group that recruited from the phase two, three portion of the pivotal trial. So these individuals were now approximately seven months post dose two. There were 312 of them in the group who were boosted. And again, we tracked reactions, adverse events, and obtained blood specimens as shown to monitor safety and immune response. So let me summarize for you first the data from the phase one part of this trial. I'm going to begin with the immunologic responses. Post-dose three, the NT162B2, indicate a substantial boost and reduced gap between the wild type and beta neutralization with the boost. The beta variant was chosen at the time because of concern about potential for a spread and as a surrogate for other variants. So let me now share with you the evidence that supports this statement. First, let's examine the 18 to 55 year old group on the left hand side of the slide. The X axis represents the time of dosing and measurement of antibody response, and the Y axis represents 50% serum neutralizing titer to SARS coronavirus 2. If we begin with those individuals who receive two doses of vaccine, the primary series, you can see that for both the wild type and the beta variant tested in this trial, that there were robust antibody responses that were most prominent seven days after dose two. These began to decline as soon as one month after dose two and were still lower before dose three. If you then look at the response after administering the booster, there are at least three important observations. Number one, there is a dramatic increase in the antibody response as measured by GMTs for both the wild type virus as well as the beta variant at seven days after dose three, as well as one month after dose three. Number two, the difference between the response to the wild type and the beta variant has narrowed, represented by the geometric mean ratio shown at the top. The ratio one month after dose two is 0.27, one month after dose three, this ratio is 0.73. So we see a narrowing of the geometric mean ratio and therefore narrowing of difference between immune response to the wild type vaccine virus and the beta variant after the third dose. Number three, in contrast to the decrease in antibody response seen seven days after dose two to one month after dose two, we actually see an increase in antibody response between seven days after dose two and one month after dose three. So what does all this mean? Our interpretation is that we're seeing a robust immune response that equals or greatly exceeds the response that we've seen after the second dose. This response continues to mature as evidenced by a continuing increase in antibody response at one month and narrowing of the difference in geometric mean ratio between the response to the wild type and the beta variant. This bodes well for comparable and perhaps improved protection after a third Pfizer BioNTech vaccine dose. Again, on the right hand side of the graphs, these observations are recapitulated and perhaps even more important in the 65 to 85 year olds. Why? Responses after the second dose of vaccine tended to be lower and decayed more rapidly than in younger adults. But look what happens after the third dose. Higher antibody response are seen seven days and one month after dose three compared to those after the second dose. 
and closely rival those seen in younger adults. There is again narrowing of the GMR between wild type and beta variant and an increase in response over time. This suggests a significant immunologic benefit of a booster dose of the vaccine that is likely to confer similar or perhaps better protection than that provided by the second dose. This information was published in the New England Journal of Medicine this week. Now, of course, it's important to know, does this apply to the Delta variant since that's the variant of current concern? I'm pleased to report the post-dose three Pfizer-BioNTech GMTs indicate a substantial boost to the Delta variant similar to that seen with wild type. This information is also included in the New England Journal of Medicine publication. Here we've represented for you the responses one month after dose two compared to one month after dose three with a similar scheme as shown on the prior slide, younger adults on the left, and older adults on the right. We again see a dramatic increase in immune response after the third dose as measured by virus neutralizing GMTs to both wild type virus and the Delta variant and a narrowing of the GMR point estimates as shown at the top of after the third dose. Note that this narrowing of response is most prominent in the older age group. This provides further reassurance that a third dose of vaccine is likely to provide immunologic benefit, restoring and perhaps improving protection against the Delta variant. Given the observations I shared with you earlier about lack of immunologic escape for variants tested to date after two doses, these observations inspire optimism about the potential for a high level of protection against current and future variants after a third vaccine dose. So what about reactions seen in phase one? In the phase one cohorts of younger and older adults, the evidence was reassuring that local reactions by maximum severity within seven days of the third dose, the bottom panel, were similar to those after dose two, the top panel. The local reactogenicity captured by e-diary revealed no redness or swelling and comparable pain. Also, systemic events by maximum severity within seven days after the third dose were similar after dose three compared to dose two. We have found fever and chills to be the most discriminating common reactions. In the phase one cohorts, comparable levels of fever and a comparable level of chills were seen after dose three compared to dose two. Other reactions were also comparable. This safety information, coupled with the preceding immune response data, gave us confidence that we could move forward into the expanded cohort. So let me now summarize for you the phase three portion of this booster study. To begin, I will describe for you how this phase three study was designed by Pfizer and approved by the FDA to support a booster dose indication in individuals 16 years of age and older. This FDA-approved approach is based on meeting predefined safety and immune response criteria in the 18 to 55-year-old age group with extrapolation to the full age range, 16 years of age and above. So what is the basis for extrapolation of phase three third dose data to 16 to 17 and greater than 55-year-olds? The FDA immunogenicity requirement is outlined in the text shown and referenced by the footnote. It reads, studies may be conducted in a single age group, for example, adults 18 to 55 years of age, with extrapolation of results to other age groups for which the prototype vaccine has been authorized. Meeting this requirement was judged by Seaver as sufficient to submit immunologic data for a supplemental licensure of the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine third dose. Regarding extrapolation of safety to the full age range, a few observations are pertinent. For 16 to 17 year olds, similar reactions in this age group to 18 to 55 year olds after two doses predicts that reactions should, would also be similar after the third dose. For adults over 55 years of age, local reactions and systemic events in participants greater than 55 years after dose two were lower than those seen in younger adults. 
This predicts lower reactions after the third dose in individuals greater than 55 years of age based on the favorable or better reactogenicity profile seen after the third dose compared to the second dose in 18 to 55 year olds, data that I'll be sharing with you shortly. Now to interpret these results in the context of what we're seeking today, it's important to understand the FDA immunogenicity criteria for a booster dose. The FDA guidance specifies that the booster dose must be adequately powered to demonstrate that the immune responses induced by the booster dose, serum neutralizing titers against SARS coronavirus 2, as measured by serum response rates and GMTs, are statistically non-inferior compared to those elicited by the vaccine in the primary series. So how do we do that? The success criteria include demonstration of non-inferiority margins of minus 10% for serial response rates and one and a half fold for GMTs. Based on consultations with CBER, these criteria are also considered sufficient to support licensure of a booster following full approval of the primary series. This table shows the demographics of subjects receiving the third dose. These demographics are representative of 18 to 55 year olds in the parent study. Note that we have a balanced representation across gender, races, and ethnicity. Over 50% of individuals had comorbidities as measured by the Charlson Comorbidity Index. The age of vaccination was approximately 41. The time from dose two to the booster was close to seven right. months, with a minimum of approximately five Your microphone months. microphone has been turned on. The All right, Pfizer, you're back two, connected. Okay, thank you. Um, let me maybe start a little bit back to make sure that uh, everybody gets to hear uh, what I had to say. So this table shows the demographics of subjects receiving the third dose. These demographics are representative of 18 to 55 year olds in the parent study. Now that we have a balanced representation across gender, races, note that we have a balanced representation across gender, races, and ethnicity. Over 50% of individuals had comorbidities as measured by the Charlson Comorbidity Index. The age of vaccination was approximately 41. The time from dose two to the booster was close to seven months with a minimum of approximately five months and a maximum of eight months since the two dose series. So let's look at the immune response data. Recall that the study needed to meet two immunologic criteria for non-inferiority based on comparison of geometric mean virus neutralization titers and serial response after the third dose to those responses seen after the second dose. The geometric mean ratio of neutralizing titers non-inferiority criterion post-dose 3 compared to post-dose 2 was met, with titers after the third dose approximately threefold higher than those seen after the second dose. This table shows SARS coronavirus 2 neutralization titers in 210 individuals looking at one month post-dose 2, post 3, compared to the GMTs after dose 2. The GMR is the ratio of these responses. To declare success, the lower bound of the confidence interval for the GMT on the right side of the table needed to be above 0.67 or two-thirds. We see that the lower bound greatly exceeds the success criteria at 2.76 with a GMR point estimate indicating responses were threefold higher after the booster dose compared to responses after dose two. Hence, this meets not only the non-inferiority criteria, but indicates that the virus neutralization responses seen after the third dose are consistent with phase one results and greatly exceed and are statistically greater than those seen after the second dose. This figure demonstrates graphically the SARS coronavirus 2 neutralization GMTs with relationship to dose. GMTs shown are based on the number of subjects with valid results at each time point, while the non-inferiority analysis for the GMT ratio shown on the prior slide are based on subjects who had valid results at both one month post-dose 2 and one month post-booster. Time and doses are shown on the x-axis, 
50% neutralizing GMTs on the y-axis. Results are consistent with those seen in the phase one study. Neutralizing GMTs rise to protective levels after the second dose, followed by a drop prior to the third dose. By seven days after dose three, observed virus neutralization GMTs are nearly double, and by one month are triple those achieved after the second dose. These results indicate that a third dose is likely to begin conferring benefit shortly after administration. Non-inferiority of the booster dose was also demonstrated based on proportion of subjects with a sero response meeting the second immune response Leishenger criterion. Sero response is defined as achieving a greater than or equal to fourfold rise from baseline before dose one. In this population of 198 individuals, the one month post booster response was 99.5% after dose three versus 98% after dose two, when both were compared to baseline. This yielded a one and a half fold greater response after the booster with a lower bound of the confidence interval of minus 0.7%, well above the minus 10% required. Non-inferiority was also confirmed based on an FDA-defined alternative analysis. We were asked by the FDA in a post hoc analysis to compare pre-booster versus post-booster sero response. And you can see that with this analysis in 179 individuals, the sero response rate was 93.9% post-dose 3 versus 97.8% post-dose 2, again meeting the minus 10% non-inferiority criteria with a percentage of the lower confidence interval being minus 8.2%. So, both the pre-specified GMT and sero response results, as well as the post hoc alternative sero response rates, satisfied licensure criteria for a booster dose with neutralization GMTs greatly exceeding those seen after dose two. Now I want to share with you the safety data that supports a booster dose. Follow-up time for the booster dose study is shown here. Total exposure from booster vaccination to the data cutoff Bill, date with a mean you, of two could you, could you please uh, uh, wrap up pretty soon where you're running out of time? All right. Uh, let me get through the safety information. I, I thought we had uh, uh, 45 minutes. Are we running close to that? You are. Okay. We'll, we'll uh, move quickly through this. Okay, follow-up time for the booster dose study is shown here. Total exposure from booster vaccination to the data cutoff date was a mean of 2.7 months and a median of 2.6 months with the ranges shown. And the total exposure from dose two to the cutoff date, so including both exposure post-dose two as well as that post-dose three, was a mean of 9.4 months and a median of 9.5 months. So let's look at the reactions solicited by eDiary after the booster dose compared to reactions after dose two. Local reactions after dose three were comparable to those seen after dose two. Reactions of dose, after dose three are in the bottom panel, dose two in the top panel, and I think you can see these recapitulated results that we saw um, in, phase, uh, in phase one. This provides reassurance of comparable local reactions with a booster dose. Likewise, systemic events by maximum severity within seven days of the third dose are similar to post-dose two. Again, the same scheme, dose three in the bottom, dose two in the top panel. And I again draw your attention particularly to fever and chills, where in this larger data set, you can see that if anything, the fever point estimate is lower than that seen for fever after the second dose in this cohort of 18 to 55 year olds. Reported chills are also lower and other reactions are comparable to those seen after the second dose. This provides reassurance that the e-diary reactogenicity profile after a third dose is similar or perhaps even better than that seen after the second dose. Adverse events by system organ class occurring greater than 1% of participants with one month post-dose third dose were less than those post-dose two in the parent study with the exception of lymphadenopathy. Adverse events after dose three are shown in dark blue bars, adverse events after dose two, light blue bars. At the top of the graphic chart, blood and lymphatic disorders at 5.2% is entirely represented by axillary lymphadenopathy. 
By comparison, after dose two, 0.5% of the 0.6% in this category is also represented by lymphadenopathy. Generally, lymphadenopathy after dose three was mild, self-limited, and resolved. Lymphadenopathy includes one individual whose lymph node enlargement was judged severe by the investigator due to reported prevention of arm movement. It lasted for five days and resolved. For reactions other than blood and lymphatic disorders as shown on this graphic, the incidence of adverse events was typically lower or comparable after dose three. These AE findings are reassuring regarding the safety profile of the vaccine. There were no SAEs or withdrawals due to SAEs in the one month period after the third dose. Only one serious adverse event was observed with the median of 2.6 months of follow-up at the time of data cutoff, which was assessed as unrelated to the vaccine. This was a myocardial infarction reported 62 days after dose three by an individual in their 40s. The event was considered unrelated to study intervention by the investigator. This individual had a medical history pertinent to the etiology of the myocardial infarction, and the cardiac event was considered secondary to stimulant abuse. The myocardial infarction was reported as recovered or resolved without sequelae within one day of onset following treatment. Details of this case are included in the briefing document. You may recall a version of this slide from the emergency use authorization, which has been annotated somewhat to reflect the ongoing work that is done. You can see the nature of the pharmacovigilance that we are conducting. Pharmacovigilance activities are a critical component of activities relating to the detection, assessment, understanding, and prevention of risk. Pfizer has been conducting robust pharmacovigilance activities and collaborating with regulators and international groups. We will continue to look for rare adverse events such as myocarditis, anaphylaxis, as well as other adverse events of special interest. The current approach to pharmacovigilance Vigilance has been valuable in detecting and assessing rare events and risks. You're and we really will continue at the end, of, end of your time, Bill. All right. The up. evidence to date supports a positive risk benefit for the Pfizer BNT vaccine. Let's okay. go to the next slide, please. <laughs> we really can't. Yeah. You're really right. over your time, and FDA has to be able to speak. Right, I understand. So let me just recapitulate. You've already had a chance. Can we go to the next slide, please? Information has been shared with you earlier. Um, as you heard earlier from uh, this morning, a third booster dose restored high level of effectiveness for preventing both infections and severe COVID-19. Right, and this table represents... <laughs> All right. So I think that the point is that we obviously have seen a dramatic fold reduction by 11 fold for infection and 15 and a half fold uh, for a severe infection that we believe a booster dose can restore. And with that, I will turn this over to uh, Donna Boyce to wrap up. Well, I think we, we, we've okay. already had a wrap up. <laughs> so, Thank you That's both fine. very much. We will have a Q&A session later on in which you all will be able to participate. Uh, let's go on now and hear the FDA uh, presentation from Dr. Jo uh, Joheen Lee. Dr. Lee, please. Uh, good, good morning, everyone. Uh, I am Dr. Juhi Lee. Uh, I'm a medical officer at the Office of Vaccines and uh, Research and Review within the Center for Biologics Evaluation and Research at the FDA. So here is an overview of the presentation uh, today. I'd like to just mention that these slides are a collective effort of many members of the Office of Vaccines. So to quickly go through this, uh, on August 23rd, 2021, FDA approved the BNT162B2 uh, vaccine under the proprietary name of Comirnaty for active immunization to prevent coronavirus uh, disease 2019 caused by SARS-CoV-2 in individuals 16 years of age and older. It's currently the only vaccine or medical product that is FDA approved for the prevention of COVID-19. And the BLA supplement uh, being discussed today is intended to support approval for booster administration of community approximately six months 
following the primary series. So I will start with the regulatory background and some key dates. April 2020, starting on the left, uh, the pivotal parent study C4591001 enrolled the first patient. In December 2020, an EOA was issued for the primary series in individuals 16 years of age and above. Uh, and on, in May 2021, this was extended to uh, individuals 12 years of age and above. And on August 13, EOA was issued for a third primary series dose for immunocompromised individuals. Uh, in August, as I previously mentioned, on the 23rd, we uh, licensed the primary series of community and in individuals 16 years of age and above. So let me go through the booster study design. As previously mentioned, mentioned this starts with the parent study, uh, during which over 44,000 individuals uh, were randomized to receive uh, community or uh, saline placebo, given two, uh, two doses given three weeks apart. Now, um, after serial unblinding, a number of individuals received a booster dose. First, in phase one, where 23 adults uh, received their booster dose uh, approximately 8.2 to 8.4 months after dose two. And in 306 individuals from the phase two, three portion, uh, who received it on um, in a median of 6.8 months after dose two. Safety data uh, were collected uniformly as shown in uh, the boxes below with solicited, unsolicited, serious adverse events and deaths and serious adverse events that were deemed related uh, to be collected uh, for uh, up to two years after dose two. Now, I'll point out that the data to be uh, discussed today will be from a subset of the 44,000 um, and so for the first two doses. Go, we'll skip over. So just to give you an overview of the demographic profile for the booster dose participants, the phase one participants were uh, very homogeneous. And uh, as you can see on the bottom bar or uh, section below, none were obese, uh, none had comorbidities or history of SARS-CoV-2 exposure pre-dose one. And uh, the homogeneity is largely a function of the eligibility criteria for the study at phase one in development. And in the last column you see, um, as you've seen before, um, the profile for participants uh, in phase two and three and you see some uh, greater diversity in race, predominantly white at 81%, uh, and some with history of SARS-CoV exposure at 3.6%. Any of the co comorbidities deemed to confer increased risk for severe COVID, excluding obesity, was at 18.3% and approximately 40% with obesity. So we'll move on to the immunogenicity results. So the primary immuno obje immunogenicity objective was to demonstrate non-inferiority of neutralizing antibody geometric mean titers against the reference or the wild type SARS-CoV-2 strain USA Washington one-like. Um, I, Washington one, I'm sorry, which is Wuhan-like. It was measured after the booster dose uh, and compared uh, to after the two-dose primary series in the same individuals. And you can see in the pictorial above uh, the four time points of interest um, that will be discussed in the, in the subsequent slides. Another point to make is that the immunogenicity uh, data were uh, obtained using a validated uh, virus micronutralization assay um, uh, to quantify GMTs. So there are two co-primary co immunogenicity endpoints for which non-inferiority was assessed. The first is the ratio of GMTs um, of SARS-CoV-2 neutralizing titers against the wild-type virus strain. And uh, you can see here the ratio post-booster dose over post-dose two. And here on the right are the criteria for non-inferiority, lower bound, uh, the two-sided 97.5 confidence interval um, exceeding 0.67, uh, 
and the point estimate of the GMT ratio of at least 0.8. Uh, the second immunogenicity endpoint that was analyzed for non-inferiority was the percentage difference of serial response at one month post-booster dose and at one month post-dose two. Serial response is defined as at least a fourfold rise, um, and this depends on a baseline measurement that is under the lower limits of quantification and a post-vaccination measure that is at least four times that to be considered a serial response. And so what was being evaluated here, uh, as pre-specified, was the percentage of individuals with a four-fold rise from pre-dose one to one month post-booster post, uh, dose, minus percentage of those with a four-fold rise from pre-dose one to one month post-dose two. Um, and non-inferiority was declared based on the following criterion with a lower bound uh, for the difference in the percentage of zero responders at these two time points of uh, being greater than negative 10%. So here are the immunogenicity analysis population. Um, let me see here if I can get the, uh, the little arrow. So starting at the top is uh, the 306 individu individuals who comprise the all available immunogenicity population, and those uh, were those who received BNP162B2 at 30 micrograms. And in the process of reaching the evaluable immunogenicity population, 44 were excluded primarily due to important protocol deviation. Uh, and then the number further uh, slightly decreased to 234 uh, because of the additional criteria of having uh, no evidence of infection from dose one to one month after booster dose. And in the rectangle on the bottom is the definition of what was considered without evidence of infection. Okay. So here the, the slide shows the GMPs against the reference strain in the dose three booster evaluable immunogenicity population without evidence of infection. And on the y-axis on a log scale are the GMPs. And along uh, from left to right, you go from pre-dose one, one month post-dose two, right before post-dose, uh, post, uh, right before booster dose, I'm sorry. And then one month uh, post-booster dose. And so you can see the trend that has been previously pointed out um, with, the num uh, with the titers increasing uh, dramatically after post-dose two with some waning within the six months uh, prior to the, the booster dose administration and a rise uh, several, uh, significantly greater than that uh, one month post-booster dose. So here I show uh, the non-inferiority analysis based on the GFT ratios against the reference strain. And boxed in blue is the primary analysis population, which are the 210 individuals who are uh, qualified to be in the valuable immunogenicity population with no evidence of infection. Um, and I'll point you to the rightmost column, which is the GMT uh, ratio uh, that we looked at comparing post-dose three to post-dose two. Uh, the point estimate of 3.29 and the lower bound of 2.76 was clearly above the non-inferiority criterion uh, that was mentioned before, which is uh, the point estimate of being greater than or at least 0.8 and a lower bound of greater than 0.67. And here we, uh, uh, you see the pre-specified non-inferiority analysis based on zero response. And uh, the rightmost column shows the endpoint. It's the difference in zero response between one month after booster and one month after dose two. And the, rate, uh, the difference is at 1.5% with a lower bound of negative 0.7%. So, this met the, the criterion set with respect to the lower bound of being greater than negative 10%. OK, 
And um, as mentioned previously by Dr. Gruber, we did ask for an alternative or complementary analysis uh, for which we asked them to define zero response uh, using pre-booster rather than pre-dose one to define uh, the zero responders or the difference in zero response between one month after booster dose and one month after uh, dose two. And as you can see here, the, the numbers are different, but uh, these findings do not challenge the previous uh, the data from this previous slide, which shows that they've achieved uh, non-inferior immunogenicity for, uh, for the two co-primary endpoints. OK. So here uh, we, I'll go through uh, the exploratory phase one analysis of uh, uh, virus neutralization titers against the Delta variant, um, as well as against the wild type of reference strain. As previously mentioned, the assay that was used to uh, produce these data comes from a 50% plaque reduction neutralization test. Um, and this was done in 23 participants against the reference uh, USA strain and the Delta variant. And these titers were assessed in zero one month after dose two and one month after dose three. And in the box in the middle of the slide are some considerations uh, that this PRNT assay is not the same as the validated micro-neutralization assay uh, for which we have immunogenicity data, uh, which uh, was presented in the preceding slides. It is well accepted and there was standardization, but it's not validated. And it was used for exploratory purposes. And the relatively sensi relative sensitivity for the two strains currently are unknown. So here are the results. On the columns are divided. You see on the uh, left column, Delta variant GMTs wild type uh, GMTs with confidence intervals. I have presented the 11, 18 to 55 year olds on top of the older adults. And you see post dose two here versus post booster dose. So these numbers have been presented um, in the previous presentation. This is just arranged slightly differently, but you can see that neutralizing titers against the Delta variant and the uh, wild type are present, uh, measurable in both populations um, or age groups. And uh, they, you see the difference between post-dose 2 and post-dose 3 uniformly um, across uh, the two strains and across the age groups as well. Now, another post-op analysis that we uh, requested from Pfizer had to do with breakthrough infections, particularly uh, those that were detected during the Delta surge. And so what we asked the Pfizer was to provide numbers of protocol-specified COVID-19 cases that were, uh, were accrued during the early July and end of August in participants 16 years of age and above. And on the left, you see we are looking at uh, participants who completed the two-dose vaccination series early in the study, or the parent study. So these are referred to individuals who are originally randomized to BNT162B2. And among these uh, almost 19,000 individuals, there were, uh, there were 70.3 cases per 1,000 person years. Um, that's the incidence of, uh, calculation that uh, Pfizer provided. Three were severe. This was collected over a period of 9.8 months post-dose two. And on the right, you see uh, we're considering the individuals who, were, uh, who completed the two-dose vaccination series later in the study. In other words, those who were originally randomized to placebo and then crossed over to the active vaccination group. Um, among these almost 18,000 individuals, there was an incidence rate of 61.6 cases per 1,000 years, person years, I'm sorry. Uh, the mean duration was slightly less as expected at 4.7 months post-dose two. 
So the data here suggests that the incidence uh, of breakthrough infections appear to be higher in those who completed the vaccination series early um, versus those who completed it later. So in order to contextualize this uh, delta in incidence, we did the following, uh, we made the following calculation. I'll, uh, bubble number one on the left, uh, you, see a count, you see the ratio that we set at um, the incidence rate among late vaccinees versus early vaccinees, and that came out to 0 0.73. And so the purpose of this calculation is to try to translate the relative breakthrough rate to uh, vaccine efficacy. So we took this ratio of 0 0.73. And for each of the assumed efficacy values shown in the table below, among the placebo crossover group, we calculated the impact of this differential in breakthrough cases um, on the corresponding efficacy in, among those who were vaccinated earlier. So let me take you through one. If we assume that the, the efficacy of the vaccine, let's say for severe disease in placebo crossover recipients, vaccinated later, uh, then um, the differential in the incidence rate that was determined during the Delta surge would translate to approximately a 4% reduction in vaccine efficacy in those vaccinated earlier. Now, continuing on, so this is uh, this is not actually during the Delta surge, but pre-Delta surge, if you look at the numbers, we consider the incidence of COVID-19 among early vaccinees from the evaluable efficacy population before the Delta surge occurred. And the case rate uh, or the incident rate was at 12.6 cases per 1,000 person years. And when you looked at uh, the later vaccinees, the placebo crossovers, in this case, before Delta, the incidence was actually higher in 43.4 cases per 1,000 person years. So the takeaway message is the data are complicated and um, the limitations of the analysis are as follows. Uh, the, the parent study was not designed uh, to assess the relative vaccine efficacy of the crossover group versus the original vaccine. And therefore, this analysis is exploratory in nature, but still uh, we thought was, would be quite uh, informative or important to consider. In addition, the open label nature of the booster dose um, may have introduced uh, confounding factors that include behavioral changes um, that bias the results. And of course, as mentioned previously, there are confounders that we are just not aware of at this time. Um, okay. So going on to the safety results. So as mentioned previously here, I, I, uh, the, the mean length of safety follow-up in the booster recipients in the phase one portion and the phase two, three portion were basically the same at 2.7 months and 2.6 months respectively. Here I am showing you the local reactogenicity data across doses, dose one and dose two data coming from the reactogenicity subset of uh, vaccinees from the blinded portion or blinded uh, phase of the study with an N of 2899 and 2682. And uh, comparing this with the reactogenicity of those who received booster, the phase two, three participants in phase one. And you can see here the, that injection pain, slight pain, continues to be the most common uh, local reaction, and uh, severity tended to be low with only one case, for instance, in the booster recipient. Um, overall, the data suggests that local reactogenicity does not appear to uh, be enhanced following uh, dose, uh, the booster dose relative to dose two.
here. This is a bit of a busy slide, but um, so here are the systemic reactive genicity preferred terms um, that were recorded by e diary seven days after each dose. So along here, I'm, I've ordered uh, the specific adverse reactions in descending order of frequency. So fatigue is the most common, um, and uh, here you see the phase two three dose one recipients. Phase two, three, dose two recipients, and the booster dose in uh, booster dose recipients from uh, the same phase. And fatigue continues to be the most common, and severity does not uh, the severity of fatigue uh, does not appear to vary significantly from that observed after post uh, after dose two. And a similar relationship between all these other uh, commonly reported systemic adverse reactions uh, can be seen between dose two and dose three. Uh, frequency of fever slightly dipped after the third dose. And use of antipyretics and pain medication uh, were comparable after dose two as compared to after the booster dose. Okay, so here we're looking at the systemic reactogenicity profile by age strata. So um, the 289 individuals from, uh, who submitted e-diary data uh, were 18 to 55, and here this table only includes the individuals in the 65 to 85 years uh, year old age strata, and there are 12. And so if you look overall, the order of uh, frequency of systemic reactogenicity uh, is about the same. And it's worth, it, it's worth pointing out that severe uh, reactions of any kind in terms of systemic reactogenicity were not reported among these 12 recipients. Fever was also not reported and the use of antipyretics or pain medication was also less. Now going on to unsolicited adverse events that were monitored one month post uh, booster. So here presented in this table are the most common events that occurred in more than two participants, or two or more participants, I should say. And the one worth pointing out is lymphadenopathy. It occurred in 16 participants with a corresponding frequency of 5.2%. The majority were mild to moderate and they did resolve. Uh, all but one is reported to be as ongoing at this time. One, as mentioned previously, was deemed severe uh, due to impact on activity. Uh, this occurred two days after the booster dose and resolved over five days. Considering the time period of booster dose to data cutoff, which is at least two months uh, of post-dose three follow-up in the 306 participants. Um, there was one additional AE uh, of acute myocardial infarction reported as an unrelated SAE. Uh, this occurred on day 62 post-booster dose and uh, re recovered and resolved. No participants were withdrawn due to adverse events. And among the 306 participants evaluated, there are no cases of anaphylaxis, hypersensitivity, Bell's palsy, appendicitis, or myocarditis, pericarditis. And among the 23 phase one booster recipients, there were no AEs that were reported one month after booster dose. So finally, I come to my last slide, which is a summary of the data that we reviewed uh, that were submitted to this BLA supplement. So in terms of immunogenicity, Success criteria against the reference strain uh, were met for both pre-specified co-primary immunogenicity endpoints, which were the GMT ratio and the difference in seroresponse rates among study participants with no evidence of SARS-CoV-2 infection prior to one month after the booster dose. The immunogenicity data to support effectiveness of the booster dose against the Delta variant are limited to exploratory analyses in a small number of participants using an assay while staff 
standardized and with a, uh, with a reference control is not validated to date. Um, in terms of the safety data, uh, from the 306 phase 2 through booster recipients, there's no evidence that there is increased reactogenicity relative to dose 2. Difficult to reach conclusions about relative reactogenicity by age, um, or, or it is difficult to reach any conclusions about the relative reactogenicity by age, as there are only 12 participants. And in the age strat of 65 to 85, the min minimum and maximum age uh, range was 65 to 75. Lymphadenopathy was observed more frequently following the booster dose than after the primary series doses. That's worth mentioning. There were no deaths, vaccine-related serious adverse events, or events of myocarditis, pericarditis, anaphylaxis, appendicitis, or Bell's palsy among the 325 booster recipients. And so. I am done with my, my portion. Thank you very much. Uh, it's time for our break. We will break until the open public hearing begins at 12.30 Eastern. So uh, we've got a, a long uh, 13 or so minute break until the open public hearing. See you back then.
Hey, this is Peter. I'm here. All right. Well, welcome back uh, to the 167th uh, meeting of the Vaccines Related Biological Products Advisory Committee meeting. Uh, we will now uh, get started, and I will hand it back over to our acting chair, Dr. Monto. Welcome to the open public hearing session. Please note that both the FDA and the public believe in a transparent process for information gathering and decision making. To ensure such transparency during the open public hearing session of the advisory committee meeting, FDA believes that it is important to understand the context of an individual's presentation. For this reason, FDA encourages you, the open public hearing speaker, at the beginning of your or a written or oral statement, to advise the committee of any financial uh, relationship that you may have with a sponsor, its product, and if known, its direct competitors. For example, this financial information may include the sponsor's payment of expenses in connection with your participation in this meeting. Likewise, FDA encourages you at the beginning of your statement to advise the committee if you do have or do not have any such financial relationships. If you choose not to address this issue of financial relationships at the beginning of your statement, it will not preclude you from speaking. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. This is uh uh, Saba Akreya, the designated federal officer for this session, who is going to conduct the open public hearing. And the next speaker, uh, the first speaker for this session is uh, Dr. Rajesh Gupta. Dr. Gupta, could you please uh, start your presentation, please? You have three minutes to go. My name is Rajesh Gupta. Currently, I do consulting for the pharmaceutical industry, including vaccine manufacturers. I have more than 40 years experience in development, manufacture, quality control, and regulation of vaccines, both in the industry and regulatory agencies, including CBER FDA, where I was a deputy division director and lab chief. Today, I'm going to present my views on some aspects about the need for a booster dose of COVID-19 vaccine based on my experience and understanding of science while working with other vaccines. Next slide, please. Major justification for a booster dose have been banning circulating and neutralizing antibodies and incidence of COVID-19 infections in vaccinated individuals a few months after vaccination. Next slide. A few facts about circulating antibodies. First, for most diseases, protective levels of circulating antibodies are not known. When known, for example, tetanus and diphtheria, these are highly variable. Next slide. Secondly, circulating antibodies decline a few months after vaccination. But booster doses are not given for most vaccines except for toxin-mediated diseases. Protection against most diseases is not necessarily through maintaining high level of circulating antibodies. I am at slide 5 now, actually. Uh, next slide. Instead of protection by most vaccines, is through rapid deployment of immune system by activation of immune memory by the invading pathogens, except for toxin-mediated diseases, where protective levels are required to be maintained, which is done through periodic boosters every 10 years. The reason is that tetanus and diphtheria toxins are highly potent. Manu doses of these toxins are lethal, but not enough to activate memory. Further, these toxins bind immediately to nerve cells and not, uh, are not available to immune cells. Next slide. Other justification for a booster has been incidence of COVID-19 infections in vaccinated individuals. However, there is no baseline data for protection against infections for most vaccines because, unfortunately, clinical trials were not designed to evaluate protection against infection. However, vaccines continue to be highly effective against severe disease. Next slide. Additionally, there is a risk of original antigenic sin phenomena after a booster dose. When antibodies to immunodominant epitopes are made, which get boosted after booster doses with immune memory, vaccination with a new stain or infection with a new stain hijacks the immune system towards the immune response to same epitopes for which antibodies were originally made. 
leading to no protection against the new strain after disease or vaccination. Next slide. Finally, booster doses leading to high levels of circulating antibodies may generate escape mutants of SARS-CoV-2 virus. So to finally conclude, based on experience with the protection by existing vaccines, boosted dose is not justified for general use at this time. It may be justified for immunocompromised or elderly who did not get adequate immune response after initial vaccination. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gupta. The next speaker is Mr. Benjamin Newton. Thank you. My name is Ben Newton. The question that we'll, we must ask every day is how we can save the most lives. The answer is to approve boosters and follow the American Academy of Pediatrics recommendation to approve pediatric vaccines in August before school started. Slide two. The FDA guidelines for vaccine approval stated that vaccines are required to have 50% e efficacy against symptomatic disease. Further, they require the use of the totality of the scientific evidence, such that if we only use randomized controlled trial data, we violate the FDA guidelines. Slide three. We saw in April that vaccine efficacy is pred predicted by neutralizing titers. We have always known this would be the case, but now we had a correlative protection. Slide four. Also in April, on the left-hand side, we saw that both variants and time would reduce vaccine efficacy. Boosters would be required. On the right side, we saw the 90-day half-life of antibodies. It was clear that we would need boosting in the fall of 2021 at the latest. Slide five. In June, we saw that the Delta variant and Angola strains had immune escape. The question now became, do we have days or weeks to start boosting? Slide six. In July, we had our answer. We had waited too long to start boosting. Israel published data showing vaccine efficacy had dropped below 50%, the FDA minimum standard for people vaccinated five months prior. Israel started boosting days later. We should have too. Slide seven. Does the FDA have an ethical obligation? Option one is that they don't have an ethical obligation, just an obligation to approve safe and effective medicines. And they should approve both boosters and follow the American Academy of Pediatrics recommendation to approve vaccines for children. Option two is that the FDA has an ethical obligation. Then we must approve pediatric vaccines. We can't randomize pediatric trials 50-50 because that would be unethical, but there are 50 million American children who are not free to be vaccinated today. We should approve lower doses. I and others have explained to the FDA how to optimize dosing to save lives. If you care to watch a long-form explanation, you can check out the YouTube video here. In addition, we should approve boosters. If you don't approve boosters, then the only people then only people with good doctors can be boosted. Slide eight, the FDA, should, FDA had a reputation to protect. The FDA built its reputation by saving lives with thalidomide. With COVID, the FDA has squandered its reputation. The FDA lagged other regulators often by months in approving vaccines and diagnostic tests. Randomized control trials became unethical the instant we knew or importantly should have known that vaccines worked. If you fail to look at data, it does not mean the data doesn't exist. It is important to note that developing a vaccine took two days. We are quickly approaching two years. When will all Americans be free to be vaccinated? Slide nine, this is not the last pandemic or variant. The FDA must determine how to approve vaccines as fast as viruses spread. Boosting with wild type vaccines increases the chance that vaccine efficacy will drop precipitously. I thank you for your time and service. Thank you, Mr. Newton. The next speaker is Dr. Jessica Rose. My name is Dr. Jessica Rose, and I'm a viral immunologist and computational biologist. I've taken it upon myself to become a VAERS analyst to organize the data into comprehensive figures to convey information to the public in both published work and video medium. Safety and efficacy are the cornerstones of the development and administration of biological, biological products meant for human use. Risk is a measure of the probability of an adverse event occurring and the severity of the resultant harm to health of individuals in a divine population. Safety is a judgment of the acceptability of this risk in a specified situation. Efficacy is the probability of benefit to individuals in a defined population from a medical technology. Refer to slide one. This is a bar plot that shows the past 10 years of VAERS data plotted against the total number of adverse event reports for all vaccines for the years 2011 through 2020, and for COVID-associated products only for 2021. The left bar plot represents all adverse event reports, and the right bar plot represents all death adverse event reports. 
There's an over 1,000% increase in the total number of adverse events for 2021, and we are not done with 2021. This is highly anomalous on both fronts. These increased reporting rates are not due to increased rates in injection and not due to simulated reporting. This has been shown using a comparative analysis of influenza data. The onus is on the public health officials, the FDA, the CDC, and policymakers to answer to these anomalies and acknowledge the clear risk signals emerging from their data and to confront the issue of COVID injectable product use risks that, in my opinion, outweigh any potential benefit associated with these products, especially for children. Slide two. This is a time series plot that shows the total cumulative number of cardiovascular, immunological, and neurological adverse events for 2021 associated with COVID products. When the cumulative absolute counts are normalized to the total number of fully injected individuals in the U.S., we can see that one in 660 individuals are succumbing to and reporting immunological adverse events associated with the COVID products. The underreporting factor is not considered here. Slide three. This is a phylogenetic tree showing the emergence of the alpha and delta variants of COVID-19 COVID over time. The emergence of both of these variants and their subsequent clustering arose in very close temporal proximity to the rollout of the COVID products in Israel. Israeli data from the Ministry of Health and Our World in Data reveals that 98.1% Oh my God. Sorry about that. Israel is one of the most injected countries and it appears from this data that this represents a clear failure of these products to provide protective immunity against emergent variants and to prevent transmission, regardless of how many additional shots administered. And this begs the question as to whether these injection rollouts are driving the emergence of the new variants. There's clear and present danger of the emergence of variants of concern if we continue with these alleged booster shots. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rose. Uh, next speaker is Professor Redseth Levy. Dr. Good afternoon, Levy. everybody. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Redseth Levy. I hope you can see my personal title slide labeled as slide A on the bottom right. I'm on the faculty of the MIT Sloan School of Management. I have no conflict of interest to disclose today, and my presentation represents only my individual opinions and does not reflect in any way on the positions of MIT. Next to slide B. Since the Pfizer's request for the approval of the boosters is partially based on the so-called study conducted in Israel, it is important to understand that the booster vaccination campaign in Israel was anything but a carefully designed study. In a matter of less than six weeks, Israel moved from its initial intention to vaccinate the over 60 population to vaccinating anyone above the age of 12, and it is now about to mandate booster vaccination for anyone to maintain green passport status. This does not allow any reliable learning, definitely not in such a short amount of time. And please understand that the adverse event surveillance system in Israel is truly dysfunctional, particularly around the booster deployment. I know from personal experience that the Ministry of Health in Israel does not address appropriately major concerning safety signals. Next to slide C. This leaves us with the question, what drove this massive booster deployment? Next to slide D. Trying to reach vaccine-induced herd immunity by reducing transmission rates will be consistent with the stated goal of the agreement that Israel signed with Pfizer, as you can see on slide D on the left-hand side. The problem is that by now we already know from mounting evidence that reaching herd immunity based on the current vaccines does not seem like a feasible or realistic goal. Not surprisingly, as you can see on the right-hand side of slide D, Israel continues to have among the highest infection rates per capita in the world. Next to slide E. You all listened to a presentation of the Israeli Ministry of Health that praises the efficacy of the boosters. I would like to caution this premature celebration and remind you that similar statements were made just six months ago around February on the two initial doses. Note on slide E on the right-hand side that COVID-19 deaths in Israel, in spite of all of the boosters, are on the rise, whereas in other countries, including many states in the U.S., they seem to be on downward trend at the moment. The data from Israel also highlights 
that the main risk of serious COVID-19 outcomes is focused to a large extent among, among the completely unvaccinated population and almost entirely in the over 61. On the left-hand side of slide E, you can also see data from table one in a research paper by the Ministry of Health in Israel that suggests that the benefits from the boosters compared to a, the prior two doses in preventing serious illness might be much more limited than desired. There is much more to say about the problems of the current booster efficacy study. Next to slide F. But let me conclude by stressing how important it is to transition from emergency strategies to long-term ones. Slide F outlines five important considerations in doing so. They are self-explanatory. I hope you will hold off of approving this booster for broad use, at least until such a strategy is developed. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Levy. Uh, the next speaker is Dr. Joseph Raymond. Hello. Um, please, if you can go to my first slide. Um, hello, my name is Dr. Joseph Raymond. No conflicts to declare. I'm an emergency physician educated at Cornell Medical School. My residency was Charity Hospital in New Orleans, and I've been working in this region since. Where I work, over 65% of the population are not vaccinated. I'm here today to ask for help for those working the front line to help us reduce vaccine hesitancy. For this, we need larger trials that demonstrate the vaccine reduced hospitalization without finding evidence of serious harm. I know many think the vaccine hesitants are dumb or just misinformed. That's not at all what I've seen. In fact, typically, independent of education level, the vaccine hesitants I've met in the ER are more familiar with vaccine studies and more aware of their own COVID risk than the vaccinated. Uh, next slide, please. For example, many of my nurses have refused the vaccine, despite having seen COVID-19 cause more death and devastation than most people have. I asked them why refuse the vaccine. They tell me while they've seen the firsthand dangers of COVID in the elderly, the obese, diabetics, they think their risk is low. They're not wrong. Next slide, please. One nurse showed me this Oxford risk calculator. A 30-year-old female has about a 1 in 7,000 chance of catching COVID and being hospitalized over 90 days. She asked me, can I assure her that the studies found her risk of serious harm from the vaccine is lower than her risk of hospitalization? The truth is I can't. Our trials weren't big enough. They weren't big enough to identify the vaccines caused myocarditis, yet now we know they do. Next slide, please. A recent observational study suggests the risk of vaccine-induced myocarditis in young males is higher than their risk of hospitalization from COVID. Is this true? We don't know. It's based on observational data. To know it's not true, we need a large trial that proves the vaccines reduce hospitalization more than they cause myocarditis in this age group. Next slide, please. The former FDA commissioner said the original premise of the vaccine was to reduce death and hospitalizations, and that was the data that came out of the initial clinical trials. Except, as you all know very well, and fortunately, unfortunately, so did my nurse, the initial clinical trials did not find a reduction in death or hospitalization, likely because they were inadequately powered. Yet the former commissioner is correct that the initial trials should have been powered to find a reduction in hospitalization. Next slide, please. We need your help on the front lines to stop vaccine hesitancy. Demand the booster trials are large enough to find a reduction in hospitalization. Without this data, we, the medical establishment, cannot confidently call out anti-COVID vaccine activists who publicly claim the vaccines harm more than they save, especially in the young and healthy. The fact that we do not have the clinical evidence to say these activists are wrong should terrify us all. Thank you. Next slide. Thank you, Dr. Freeman. The next speaker is Mr. Steve Kirsch. Hi, I'm Steve Kirsch. I'm Executive Director of the COVID-19 Early Treatment Fund. I have no conflicts. Uh, advance to slide number four with the elephant. I'm going to focus my remarks today on the elephant in the room that nobody likes to talk about, that the vaccines kill more people than they save. Today, we focus almost exclusively on COVID death saves and vaccine efficacy because we were led to believe that the vaccines are perfectly safe. But this is simply not true. For example, there were four times as many heart attacks in the treatment group in the Pfizer six-month trial report. That wasn't bad luck. Theirs shows heart attacks happen 71 times more often following these vaccines compared to any other vaccine. 
In all, 20 people died who got the drug, 14 died who got the placebo. Few people notice that. If the net all-cause mortality from the vaccines is negative, vaccines, boosters, and mandates are all nonsensical. This is the case today. Death rates. Um, uh, let's slide number seven, advance uh, to the number seven in lower part. This shows that the all-cause uh, death light rate in, uh, in three cases. Only the VAERS numbers are statistically significant, but the other numbers are troubling. Even if the vaccines had 100% protection, it still means we kill two people to save one life. Four experts did analyses using completely different non-U.S. data sources, and all of them came up with approximately the same number of excess vaccine-related deaths, about 411 deaths per million doses. That translates into 150,000 people have died. Next slide would be slide number 11, uh, the nursing home. Now, the real numbers confirm that we kill more than we save. And I, will, uh, I would love everyone to look at the Israel Ministry of Health data on the 90-plus-year-olds where we went to, we went from a 94.4% uh, vaccinated group to 82.9% vaccinated in the last four months. In the most optimistic scenario, it means that 50% of the vaccinated people died and 0% of unvaccinated people died. Unless you can explain that to the American public, you cannot approve the boosters. Slide number 16, please, myocarditis. Uh, the paper just posted yesterday on MedArchive entitled MRNA COVID-19 Vaccination and Development of CMR Confirmed Myopericarditis shows that the myopericarditis risk was one in a thousand. And that's an overall age range from 16, 18 to 65, mean age of 33. It is not inconsistent with what the bear shows. Next slide would be slide number 18, gaming of the trial. It's pretty clear that the Pfizer trial results were gained. It's statistically impossible for protocol violations to be five times higher in the treatment group. Why hasn't this been investigated? Slide number 19. Uh, Maddie DeGray was, was 12 when she enrolled in the Pfizer phase three trial for kids. Now she's paralyzed for life. It wasn't reported by it in the uh, Pfizer results. I told Janet Woodcock, there was no investigation. Please tell us why this, was not, why this fraud was not investigated. And finally, um, slide number 20, please. Um, early treatments are a much better alternative to boosters. Uh, the proof is that in Israel, Cases are at an all-time high. In India, Uttar Pradesh is now COVID-19 free as of today. Almost nobody there is vaccinated. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next speaker is uh, Mr. David Weisman. Uh, thank you, Dr. Monto. Uh, please see our written comments. Uh, next slide, B. Uh, for our disclosures, and next slide, slide C. Uh, with this Lancet paper by FDA vaccine officials, we find ourselves agreeing with them, but for different reasons. We have an unclear need with unclear motivation, significant safety concerns, poor evidence of sustained booster efficacy, and wrong priorities. So while FDA and Pfizer can't agree about waning efficacy, let's go to next slide D. We saw recently CDC's apparently withholding, apparent withholding of key data from ACIP prior to recommending the Pfizer vaccine and revealing that the primary driver for approving Comanati was to overcome hesitancy through regulatory misdirection. We agree with others that this has become politicized. Next slide, E. Pfizer's booster evidence today is weak. They are, they are small studies in mostly younger subjects. They are short term. There is no randomized control. There are no clinical outcome data, only serology. Inadequ inadequate safety given this is a gene therapy product. Where are the data from the 10,000 patient study? Next slide, F. If FDA cannot assure us of the safety of two doses, how can they assure us of three? We see strong signals for death, myocardial infarction, and coagulopathy that need transparent investigation. Next slide, G. We find three potential pools of vaccine-associated deaths. Note the second pool among vaccinees. Next slide, H. Daily cases in Israel increase upon booster rollout compared with the same period last year. Please note the correct rollout is July the 1st at the 130 uh, number. The, the Israel booster presented today has matching censoring bias seen in related studies, non-comparable populations, possible clustering bias, inadequate accounting for early vaccine effects, 
and a short follow-up in mainly older people. Next slide, I. Others show unexplained Israeli deaths lockstepping with booster roll-up. Roll out. This looks like the second pool deaths we said before in vaccinees rejected by New England Journal of Medicine in February. Next slide, J. Other safety concerns not voiced in the label are revealed in studies funded offline by NIH for menstrual disorders. Next slide, K. And offline by CDC in a disturbing revelation of an urgent need to monitor safety in pregnancy. Put this in the label. Next slide, L. Long-term safety. No cancer studies were performed. Moderna said its vaccine was a gene therapy product. Why is the FDA not requiring 5 to 15-year cancer and other studies per their gene therapy guidance? Next slide, M. We propose the term PCOVs to describe the wide spectrum of events being reported. Next slide, N. We are running out of options. Vaccine hesitancy won't be solved by bullying or coercion. Address safety. Show convincing booster efficacy. Revisit per repurpose, repurpose drugs. Next slide, O. We reverse the findings of flawed landmark studies that have misguided policy. Journals refuse to correct these defects, and Dr. Rubin's seat on this committee is a conflict. Next slide, P. This is what has to be done. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next speaker is uh, Mr. Kermit Kubitz. Hello, uh, my name is Kermit Kubitz. I have reviewed this presentation with other friends from Caltech. I have previously commented to the ACIP in December in support of EUA for the Pfizer vaccine. At that time, I said my only conflicts were elderly relatives who needed the vaccine yesterday. Since then, two of those three relatives have received the vaccine. One with rheumatoid arthritis has received a booster with no adverse effects. Next slide. The table of booster pros and cons. Reasons against boosters are lack of need in view of current efficacy, risks, confidence, and global vaccine equity. However, I believe there are substantial reasons for boosters, including normal vaccination protocol involves a delay of months. Boosters may limit infectious cases in large gatherings, and global vaccine supply will be from a more conventional vaccines, not requiring uh, un un uninterrupted cold chain. Next slide. Balancing booster pros and cons, breakthrough infections, although milder, are occurring. Vaccine hesitancy is generally not rationally based. A phased booster approach would allow greater global vaccine availability, and the United States could boost international vaccine supply by funding new lower-cost vaccines such as Biological E. Next slide. Country approaches to booster vaccination support boosters. Canada, Italy, Greece, Britain, China, and France. Next slide. Conclusions. As my friend Chuck Wolf has commented, it's important to plan for boosters now, even if not everyone will receive a booster. There are three priorities. One, the unvaccinated. Two, children, six to 11. And three, boosters for other people. There are outbreaks in schools that have sh nearly shut down uh, schools in Raleigh, North Carolina. Um, Booster vaccination should be offered beginning with age priorities, either 65 and older or 50 and older. Booster vaccination may offset, quote, social hesitancy of those who fear social interactions with anyone else and are thus isolated. But we should plan for boosters and the commission should promptly approve booster vaccination while dealing with the other priorities, the unvaccinated and school children. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Mr. Kubitz. The next speaker is Dr. Peter Doshi. Hi, I'm Peter Doshi, and thanks for the opportunity to speak. Hopefully you can see my title slide with my financial disclosure. For identification purposes, I'm on the faculty of the University of Maryland and an editor at the BMJ. I have no relevant conflicts of interest. Our next slide, please, which is labeled slide A. I want to start off by asking a question. Just what problem is this third dose aiming to solve? If we have a 
pandemic of the unvaccinated, as our public health officials have repeatedly stated, why would a, quote, fully vaccinated person need a third dose? Next slide B, please. The briefing document suggests the rationale for boosters is waning immunity, but the lowest vaccine efficacy figure mentioned is 87, 83.7%. And last month, FDA approved Pfizer's vaccine, stating that efficacy against symptomatic COVID is 91%. Sure, a third dose might nudge up efficacy numbers, but so too might a fourth dose and a fifth dose. The thing is, the two-dose regimen efficacy numbers are already way higher than the 50% bar that FDA set in June last year for an approvable vaccine. Before contemplating the licensure of dose three, shouldn't FDA first require evidence that the two-dose regimen no longer meets the efficacy bar the agency just weeks ago said it met? If vaccine efficacy is now below 50%, let's see the data. Next slide C, please. Let's discuss safety. When discussions about a third dose began in July, CDC Deputy Director Dr. Jay Butler said it was vital to find out if the third dose increased adverse reactions, particularly severe ones. Unfortunately, we're still in the dark. Pfizer's booster application reports on just 329 people with no control data. Now there is a Pfizer ongoing placebo controlled randomized trial of boosters in 10,000 people not discussed in the briefing document, but this trial is unlikely to satisfactorily characterize booster safety. First, the trial is too small and the enrollment's limited to healthy participants. Second, we really need to know how safe boosters are in people who already had bad reactions to dose one or two. But such people are obviously less likely to volunteer to participate in this trial. So we won't have the data to answer the question. Yet if the booster is approved, such people will surely be mandated to receive a third uh, dose. Final slide D, please. I'll end with a question. Last week, three medical licensing boards said that they could revoke doctors' medical licenses for providing COVID vaccine misinformation. I'm worried about the chilling effect here. There are clearly many remaining unknowns, and science is all about probing unknowns. But in the present supercharged climate, and I'll point out that multiple members of this committee are certified by these boards, I want to ask FDA, what is FDA doing to ensure that those advising it are able to speak freely without fear of reprisal? Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Doshi. The next speaker is Dr. Michael Carom. Hello, I'm Dr. Michael Carom, Director of Public Citizens Health Research Group. I have no financial conflicts of interest. Public Citizen supported the emergency use authorization and subsequent approval of the Pfizer-BioNTech COVID-19 vaccine because clinical trial data demonstrated the vaccine was highly effective and generally safe. However, Pfizer and BioNTech have failed to provide sufficient evidence to assess the risk-benefit profile of a booster or third dose of their COVID-19 vaccine in individuals aged 16 or older in the general population. In particular, there is a lack of data on the effectiveness and its duration of booster vaccination in preventing important COVID-19-related outcomes, that is, serious illness resulting in hospitalization or death, in individuals age 16 and older in the general population, and safety data for booster vaccination is very limited. Importantly, observational studies indicate that the primary series of the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine still affords robust protection against severe COVID-19 disease and death in the U.S. We agree with the following assessment and conclusions offered by Drs. Gruber and Kraus and other experts in their Viewpoint article published in The Lancet this week. Quote, Current evidence does not appear to show a need for boosting in the general population in which efficacy against severe disease remains high. The limited supply of COVID-19 vaccines will save the, the most lives if made available to people who are at appreciable risk of serious disease and have not yet received any vaccine. Even if some gain can ultimately be obtained from boosting, it will not outweigh the benefits of providing initial protection to the unvaccinated. If vaccines are deployed where they would do the most good, they would, have the, they would hasten the end of the pandemic by inhibiting further evolution of variants, end quote. Finally, any move to widespread distribution of COVID-19 vaccine boosters in the U.S. would make it even more ethically imperative that the U.S. government move to ramp up global vaccine manufacturing so that everyone on the planet can be vaccinated. 
The world currently is suffering an artificial scarcity of high quality COVID-19 vaccines because governments are permitting drug corporations to maintain monopolies. While the U.S. has been planning its booster vaccination campaign, the vast majority of people in low and middle income countries have no access to any COVID-19 vaccine, let alone the highly effective mRNA vaccines. If the U.S. is to proceed with COVID-19 vaccine boosters, we take on a special, greater obligation to do everything in our power to get as many vaccine doses as possible, as quickly as possible, to people in low and middle income countries, and especially to invest immediately in expanded, in an expanded manufacturing to create an adequate supply to vaccinate the entire world. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Karam. The next speaker is Kim Witsa. Uh, Kim Witsa. Hi. Oh. My name is Kim Witsa with Woody Matters, a drug safety organization started after the death of my husband. I'm also on the board of directors of USA Patient Network and have no conflicts of interest. It seems we are here today to discuss Pfizer's application to re define the meaning of fully vaccinated from two to three doses. From the beginning of the pandemic, the goalposts keep changing. It makes you wonder if the current vaccination strategy is working. When looking at the submitted data, it's just over 300 people with only 12 of them over age 65, the highest risk group, sufficient enough to warrant approval for boosters. If the FDA approves this, we will take what we've learned on just 300 people and then give it no, more like mandate it to hundreds of millions of people. This is beyond preposterous. While I am no vaccinologist, it would seem logical that dose three would have an increase in immune response over two, four doses over three, five over four, and so on. At what point will enough be enough? At the end, of the end of the day, can we really vaccinate our way out? While boosters may be good for business, let's be real. These vaccine, um, MNRA vaccines were never designed to stop transmission or eradicate the virus. These vaccines are not the same as those being used to eradicate polio or smallpox. I have to wonder um, why we chose to go down the vaccine path first versus focusing on treating those with a COVID diagnosis before it was too late or ended up in the hospital or worse yet, dead. And also, we haven't heard any discussion from our national leadership on the role national, or natural immunity plays. Instead, uh, NIH, CDC, FDA, and the White House have told Americans that vaccines are superior to our innate immune systems and beat out any natural acquired immunity. Let's take a step back and look at the bigger picture. First, our government incentivized more like bribes the public to get these shots. Then we were told about the possible need for boosters while shaming and blaming the unvaccinated. Now the government is forcing them with vaccine uh, mandates. Is there a reason we want everyone to be vaccinated? Is it so adverse events can't be distinguished between vaccine and the virus? Or is it to help masquerade the waning effectiveness of vaccines and blame the new variants when it may just be the mutating virus escaping leaky vaccines? Politics and fear seem to be in the driver's seat. Facts around data and science can no longer be questioned or openly debated without being discredited or labeled as misinformation. Just look at the, what the professional medical societies are collectively doing, threatening doctors um, with losing their medical license if they deviate from the official protocol or narrative established by CDC and public officials like Dr. Fauci. People are not able to talk about their negative experiences without being dismissed, harassed, or being called an anti-vaxxer. Just look at what happened to rapper Nicki Minaj this week. People came out and attacked her for telling her family story and voicing an opinion. We are walking a slippery slope when regular people, celebrities, doctors, and scientists are silent, or worse yet, censored. Finally, I would be remiss if I failed to mention the hundreds of thousands of people who paid the high price by doing the right thing for the greater good. Their lives have been forever changed. I don't have enough time to begin to touch on the currently reported safety issues impacting tens of thousands, including children and young adults, and all the future safety issues not yet realized. Ladies and gentlemen, we are part of the largest pharmaceutical experiment ever conducted on humankind. Thank you so much, and I appreciate your deliberation. Thank you, Ms. Witsuk. Uh, the next speaker, Paul Alexander, we could not connect him, so we'll try him later. 
Uh, he, he, so we'll go, move on to the next speaker, Ms. Linda B. Hi, yes, my name is Linda B. I have no conflicts. I have been a community rep on many CEDAR antiviral advisory committee hearings. Emphasis on the unvaccinated and international vaccine donations from the U.S. Um, issues are misplaced. FDA does not have the power to increase international vaccine donations or create policy to promote increased vaccinations at home or abroad. We are here because there are differing opinions on whether there is sufficient data to support licensure of a third dose of BNT162B2 for people 16 and older. The sponsor is relying on data from a number of sources that show activity wanes between six and eight months after the second dose. Data also suggests that breakthrough cases were caused by waning effectiveness, not the Delta variant. Sponsors also conducted a sub-study within their registrational study that eventually established safety in 306 participants, 18 to 55. I think the Israeli safety data was helpful even if it is, was in mostly older people. The third 16-2B2 dose was found to be as well tolerated as the second dose and elicited responses to wild-type virus not inferior to the second dose response. The sponsor believes the FDA um, development guidance permits these data to be extrapolated to include individuals 16 and 17 as well as people over 55. Has the sponsor provided sufficient data from adequate clinical trials to justify their request for licensure? Reasonable people strongly dis disagree, as is evidenced by the different positions taken in recent New York, New York, New England Journal uh, and Lancet articles. I've been an AIDS activist for some 35 years. I understand only too well the need for access, but I have learned uh, the importance of evidence-based medicine the hard way. We all rely on the FDA to ensure that interventions are safe and effective. If you do not believe that data are sufficient to justify full approval, please consider the innovative practical solution of accelerated, accelerated approval, which we've used in the HIV arena for many years, um, which uh, also permits uh, yeah, and is also permitted in some circumstances for vaccines according to the general principles for the development of vaccines to protect against global infectious diseases guidance, even though this guidance addresses international issues. Accelerated approval will permit access and requires the sponsor to conduct or complete at least one adequate, well-controlled confirmational trial before full approval is granted. This option should be considered as it prov provides the best solution for both the access and additional data dilemma questions presented here. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Dean. The next speaker is Dr. Meg, Meg Seymour. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today on behalf of the National Center for Health Research. I am Dr. Meg Seymour, a senior fellow at the center. We analyze scientific data to provide objective health information to patients, health professionals, and policymakers. We do not accept funding from drug or medical device companies, so I have no conflicts of interest. Today, you're asked to discuss whether the data presented support the safety and effectiveness of a booster dose of the COVID-19 vaccine, and if so, for whom? I will focus on the safety sample, safety sample data discussed in the FDA's briefing document. The total safety sample is very small, only 329 patients. Even more important, the sample is not representative of the people who will want the booster. There are safety data on only 12 patients ages 65 and over, even though people over 65 are considered a priority group for a booster due to weaker immunity. 12 people over 65 is much too small to draw conclusions about safety and is obviously not large enough to have any confidence in the claim that adverse events from booster doses are less common in those 65 and over. In addition, there are zero patients ages 16 and 17, and safety for this population is being extrapolated based on safety for those 18 and over. Data should be collected for any population that the boosters would be approved for rather than extrapolating pediatric safety from adult safety data. Unfortunately, the size of the sample is not the only problem with the safety data. A median of 2.6 months is not enough time for assessing the safety of the booster. In addition, we agree with the FDA that it is unknown whether there will be an increased risk of myocarditis, pericarditis, or other adverse reactions after a booster dose. 
We all know that COVID can be deadly, but the efficacy of a booster compared to no booster is not well established since the placebo control group is missing in addition to uncontrolled variables that could influence the diagnosis of COVID for those with boosters and those vaccinated without boosters. Assurance that the benefits outweigh the risk should be gathered before approving booster vaccines. Otherwise, potential risks may become obvious only after large numbers of the general population have received boosters, and the benefits of boosters may be much less than expected. FDA decisions should be based on proof of the safety and effectiveness of a medical product before the product is widely distributed. To approve a booster without adequate safety or efficacy data undermines the integrity of the FDA. It is unfortunate that the White House announced the need for and availability of boosters prior to FDA's assessment of the data. We know numerous people who have already received booster doses by merely asking their doctors or local pharmacies for a third dose. We all want to get the COVID-19 pandemic under control and protect as many people as possible, which is exactly why it is so important to carefully and scientifically assess the safety and effectiveness of COVID-19 booster vaccines. The data provided for this meeting do not allow us to draw confident conclusions, and a premature decision will make it impossible to do the research necessary to draw scientific conclusions. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Simo. The next speaker is uh, Ms. Kathleen Cameron. Good afternoon. My name is Kathleen Cameron. I'm a pharmacist, public health care professional, and senior director of the Center for Healthy Aging at the National Council on Aging, or NCOA. I have no conflicts to declare. I appreciate the opportunity to provide comments today on behalf of NCOA, older adults, their family members and caregivers, and organizations that serve them. NCOA is a respected national leader and trusted partner to help people age 60 plus live with health and financial security. We believe every per person deserves to age well. Vaccines are a vital part of aging well, and NCOA is committed to ensuring older adults have accurate and timely information about them to avoid confusion when making decisions. We also advocate for access to approved vaccines using public benefits for which older adults are entitled. Older adults have been disproportionately impacted by the coronavirus pandemic. Those 65 and over represent 13% of COVID-19 cases, yet account for nearly 80% of the deaths. COVID-19 also is having a disproportional impact on communities of color who have always had to face health disparities, such as higher rates of chronic conditions, income inequality, and inadequate access to quality health care. The older adults in these communities have historically fared even worse. Further, we now know that older vaccinated people are most vulnerable to illness and hospitalization after a breakthrough infection. As the CDC recently reported, this may be due in part to waning immunity that is most significant in people age 65 and up who are at greatest risk for hospitalization and death from COVID-19. And COA commends for PACS, diligent and rigorous work as our country continues to face the evolving COVID-19 pandemic. Every day brings new knowledge about the virus, the effectiveness of COVID-19 vaccines, and the potential need for vaccine boosters as discussed during this meeting today. The impact of COVID-19 pandemic on older adults has been tremendous, and we want to do all we can to protect older adults, as well as health care and long-term care workers, as we continue to learn more about the long-term effectiveness of COVID-19 vaccines. We are counting on the FDA to conduct gold standard reviews and to develop appropriate recommendations if you, as you have done so well for many years. We ask that you carefully examine all available data on safety and effectiveness of COVID-19 vaccines over time among various population groups, especially older adults who are most vulnerable, and make your decision about booster shots as expeditiously as possible. Thank you again for the opportunity to provide comments, and we welcome further discussion and involvement as decisions are being made. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, the next speaker is uh, Ms. Beth Bataglino. Hi, thank you all for allowing me time today to present on behalf of Healthy Women. I'm Beth Badalino, President and CEO of Healthy Women. We were founded in 1988, and Healthy Women is the leading nonprofit women's health information source with a mission of educating women ages 35 to 64 years of age to make informed health choices. Throughout the years, we have informed consumers and healthcare providers about the advances in women's health. 
from the latest information on diseases and conditions to various milestones pertaining to access to care. We ensure that women have accurate, balanced, evidence-based information so that they can make informed decisions in partnerships with their healthcare providers. We also educate our audience regarding innovations in research and science, as well as changes in policy that affects women's access to treatment and care, so that women are prepared to self-advocate for better health outcomes. We know the importance of the process, and as we continue to educate our audience that the COVID-19 vaccine, like other drugs, are only approved following an established gold standard review process, COVID-19 vaccine development follows the FDA review process that includes research, multi-stage clinical trials, robust regulatory review and approvals, and ongoing safety monitoring. We also know that data on booster shots for all three vaccines continues to be studied, and we anticipate more information from the FDA and the CDC very soon. And healthy women will be ready to share out medically vetted, science-based research information on the booster shot with our audience of over 1.5 million women. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bertolino. The next speaker is Brian Hulvick. Sorry if I didn't say your name right. Thank you for the opportunity for health advocates to provide direct feedback. I have no financial conflicts to disclose. I'm Brian Huttage, Executive Director of Health HIV, a national nonprofit organization based in Washington, D.C. We advocate for communities impacted and affected by HIV. Today I'm speaking to you as a health services advocate in an effort to get us all one step ahead of breakthrough infections among fully vaccinated people. While data clearly show that COVID-19 vaccines are highly effective against current strains, preliminary data also indicate that protection against infection overall appears to be waning, and that concerns us because it puts the populations we serve at even further risk for infection based on the point-in-time immunity of the general population. COVID-19 is a serious and potentially fatal and life-threatening virus, not just for those most at risk, like the immunocompromised and immunosuppressed, but for everyday Americans, especially front-facing service sector minority communities and marginalized populations and geographies with the highest viral load concentration, often a result of vaccine hesitancy or opposition. Not surprisingly, breakthrough infections appear to be more common among those with weakened immune systems. And according to data presented at a CDC Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, immunocompromised patients represent 44% of hospitalized COVID-19 breakthrough cases, even though they only make up about 2.7% of the total population. As part of this data look back, the FDA evaluated the science on the use of a third dose of the Pfizer or Moderna vaccines in people with compromised immune systems, and they rightly determined that a third vaccine dose may protect them and others around them. In fact, they interpreted the findings to state that targeted policies like the booster shot being proposed today need to evolve as both science and risk evolve. It confirms that people with underlying conditions like advanced HIV, cancer, organ transplant, hemodialysis, and those on immunosuppressive therapies are seen as a significant risk for poorer outcomes from COVID-19. In essence, it highlights the need for our populations to stay as healthy as possible, but it also depends on the health of those around us. Fortunately, the vast majority of breakthrough infections are typically mild, but we are discussing the rationale for a booster shot in efforts to prevent the clock from winding backwards. We encourage the advisory committee to recommend booster shots for people age 16 and above, just as you did to protect people living with HIV. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. The next speaker is uh, Dr. Paul Alexander. Hi, thank you very much. Um, I got cut off earlier, but um, thanks for patching me back on. That's good work by you guys. Look, I wanted to get into this by saying uh, my background is in evidence-based medicine, clinical epidemiologist. And um, I'm very interested in the uh, safety and efficacy of these vaccines. I'm following some very good presentations so far. 
Look, we want these vaccines to work <clears throat> as Americans and as global population. So I think the message has to be that we, we're not coming at the FDA, we're not coming at the CDC trying to raise issues and, 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 and just... Can you hear me? Yes. yes, we can hear you. Yes, it's not that we want to raise issues and concerns, but here's the issue. We want it to work. But when we look at the surveillance, when we look at the surveillance coming out of the VAERS right now, CDC, it captures 1% of 1% to 10% by our study of the published literature of the adverse events. And that is very suboptimal because it doesn't give a proper capture of the burden. So we really do not know what the adverse events and the deaths are. So we want proper safety monitoring boards. We want proper ethics committees following up on these vaccines. We are calling for critical event committees, but we do not seem to know whether they exist. So we want the FDA to get on top of these vaccine developers and the CDC and put this in place for the safety of, of Americans. And it's a simple issue. You are giving us vaccines, and this is what we have been clamoring for. If you have <clears throat> an investigation of a vaccine with 1,000 samples, you put 500 in each arm, and you follow that for one year, versus you have another study of 100,000 people, and you follow that for two months. And the safety events that we are looking for, the safety signals happens at about five to six months. How could that larger sample detect them? And that's the issue. We are calling for longer term studies, larger sample size, but longer term. We need the medium and long term studies to best assess the safety and efficacy, particularly safety, particularly when you're talking about putting these vaccines in our children's arms. We currently do not have the safety data. We actually do not. And for any one of the CDC, any one of the NIH and any one of the FDA to claim so, that is being disingenuous to the public. Now, I wanted to end by saying this. When we look, I looked at a study this morning by Chen on testicular infection post-COV. SARS-CoV-2 virus. That means that there is an issue, and we are extrapolating. We are extrapolating based on the Japanese data that looked at the lipid nanoparticles and the mRNA that were accumulating in the tissue in the rat model. Yes, it's a rat model, but we have to extrapolate to humans. That showed that the lipid nanoparticle, the constituency of the vaccine, is accumulating in the ovaries, in the testes, in the spleen, in the adrenals, etc. So when somebody like Nicki Minaj, I have to invoke this, makes that statement, that's not a joke. People want to make this a joke and parody it, etc. But this is a very, very serious consideration because we even have animal data that shows us that there's a drop in fertility in the animal model. So we need this properly investigated. The public needs this answer properly. And I want to end by saying this. Under no condition, none, zero, based on the evidence today, must children be indicated for these vaccines. There is no risk to children, no statistical zero in terms of spreading and in terms of getting serious illness or dying from this. Dr. Martin Macari at Johns Hopkins, they looked at time. all of the deaths. Hello? Yeah, uh, we're, we're out of time, sir. Okay, thank you. You can wrap it up. Yes, we looked at, the, we looked at the, the children in America that have died, and we found that save one, most these children had at least one severe illness. So the reality is COVID is not a life-ending, life-threatening situation for children. Right now, the CDC and the NIH have not prosecuted the case as to why these children should be vaccinated, period. I say do not do this, and I beg your consideration. Thank you. Thank you. At this time, we will conclude the open public hearing, and then I will hand over the meeting to Dr. Manto, the chair. Dr. Manto, take it away. I think we are getting to a break now. Could you announce the return time, please? I, I think we now have a 10-minute break, so we're our busy workers who've been handling the open public hearing have a little break for themselves, and we will reconvene in 10 minutes, 10 minutes from now.
Everyone else, stay muted, please, or make sure you're muted. All right, welcome back to our 167th meeting of the Vaccines and Related Biological Products Advisory Committee meeting. Dr. Monto, let's take it away for our afternoon portion. Thank you very much, Mike. Uh, this is going to be an open Q&A session involving all the speakers we had present already. Uh, when you raise your hand and ask a question, please specify who you would like to ask the question of. So we don't have uh, a total free-for-all. Uh, Dr. Uh, Gruber has indicated that she does have a question she wants to raise, so I'll start with her. Yeah, hi, this is Marion Gruber. I turn it over to Dr. Phil Kraus for the question. Um, yes, hi. Uh, uh, this is uh, actually a question for Pfizer. And, and of course, one of the uh, issues in uh, this is that much of the data that's been presented and is being discussed today is not peer reviewed and has not been reviewed by FDA. And, and this includes the uh, uh, study of, from Kaiser that was presented by Dr. Bill Gruber. And so what I'm uh, hoping is to ask a question about that study so that we can better understand uh, uh, some of the conclusions that come from it. And uh, so what I've done here is I've taken as the slide which is being presented, uh, Appendix 5 or Appendix Table 5. And this, uh, uh, this is the, the appendix from that study, from the preprint of that study which shows the, the main data in the study. And what you can see here is in 5A, to the left you have unvaccinated people, and to the right you have fully vaccinated people. And just to make this easy, I'm focusing on people greater than or equal to 65 years of age. And you can see among the unvaccinated, there were 17,278 cases in 168,143 person years which then, if you do the math, you can see down here, it's about one-tenth of a case per person year, or 0.103 cases per person year. If you look to the right here, the far right, if you look at the fully vaccinated people, you have 594 cases among 86,806 person years. And here, that's a rate of 0 0.0068 cases per person year. If you take these numbers and put them together, you get an efficacy of 93.3% in the study overall um, in uh, 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 people who are greater than or equal to 65 years of age. But of course, when these studies are done, they involve fairly complicated models. In this case, uh, it's a, a Cox model, which incorporates a lot of inputs. And one of the questions always, uh, as explained by Dr. Stern, is that you have to make sure that the model is actually giving you the correct results, because these models are complex. My question for Dr. Gruber and Pfizer is, is that in a situation where the total cases tell us that the vaccine had 93.3% efficacy, according to the data in this table, why is it this model is telling us that the efficacy is either 58% or 61%? Uh, okay, Dr. Bill Gruber. We've got two Grubers there. Can't hear. Make sure, you're, make sure you're unmuted, sir. I'll unmute you. Here we go. There you go. There we go. Yeah, so thank you. I actually joined by uh, uh, Donna Boyce in the same room because we had a little technical issue here. I think this is a question to be back to first to Louis Jogar and his associates as they've been in close communication with Kaiser on their study. So, Louis? Hold on a second. Dr. Gruber, Dr. Gruber, hold on one second. I see you have you have multiple feeds going on over there, so I want to make sure we have clear audio for you. So let's just clean up your audio, please. And I don't think it's Dr. Bill Gruber who's going to answer right now. Right. right. That's correct. I was just saying, can you hear me now, or should I hold, or tell me when I should speak? We can hear you, but it's it's a lot of background noise, but go ahead. 
As I was going to say, I think this is a question for Dr. Luis Chodar and his associates as they've been uh, closely in uh, communication with Kaiser Permanente about their data. So, uh, Dr. Jodar. So, uh, thanks for the question um, and, and the detailed analysis of, uh, of the supplemental paper. Um, as was pointed out in Dr. Stern's presentation, for the critical analysis is to take into account calendar time and included in the Cox models. So, this was something that after you, after you adjust for calendar time in the Cox models, uh, you you get a different result than you would if you didn't address for that, but it's critical to include that because clearly there's a there's a relationship between disease traits as time progresses in the pandemic and vaccine uptake. Uh, so those results that you're looking at, uh, while they're based on crude data, don't un under account for underlying uh, calendar time, which is the, uh, a critical element to include in the analysis and was included in the results that you saw. Uh, in the paper. Total of, but, but of course, if you have this huge difference in the raw numbers and this accounting for calendar time, how can you be sure that you've accounted properly for calendar time? But let's look here, for instance, under second dose partially vaccinated, less than sec seven days after the second dose, also in people over 65 years of age where you're reporting, according to the model, 64% efficacy. And this is before the second dose really could have had any effect. But then after the second dose, you're reporting 58 to 61% efficacy. So according to your model, it looks like people actually got worse after the second dose, or that the second dose really didn't do anything. Is that really what, uh, uh, what, 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 you're, what you're saying? And so part of this, of course, is is the difficulty of looking at this kind of data without having the chance for FDA to review it or allowing for peer, this kind of data to go through the peer review process. And what you heard, of course, is how much in Dr. Gruber's presentation, uh, Dr. Bill Gruber's presentation, how much Pfizer is actually relying on the data from the study, which, as I understand it, they also co-sponsored in reaching some of the conclusions in their study. And so, um, uh, I, I guess maybe there are some answers to these questions, uh, but I still do not understand how it's possible that you can have a study in which the total efficacy is 93.3% and you're somehow then accounting for time in coming up with an efficacy of between 58 and 61%. Uh, because there's nothing about this that says we're accounting for time. This is just the total efficacy over this period of time from December 14th to August 8th. Uh, so again, this just points up the complexity of these models and the importance of these data being carefully reviewed. And I will stop there. Okay. Oh. Dr. McLaughlin, could you respond to that? Yeah, absolutely. So I think it's critical to include calendar time in these models, and this is a very standard way to do a Cox model and just for vaccine effectiveness. Um, so we appreciate the complexity. These models. The other thing that's important to note is that uh, hold on a second. Hold on a second, uh, Doctor. Okay, so here's what we have to do. So first off, and I want to make sure everybody can hear this, and because we have using studios and stuff like that. So number one, I need to make sure if you are not speaking, you need to be muted, um, and to make sure if you are not, if you are listening in, do not have any audio through your own personal computers. It is all through your phone. Uh, so that's number one. Also at the studio over at Pfizer, please make sure all other mics are muted when you have another mic open. That'll help out a lot. All right, take it away, Pfizer. Let's hope that fixes that. Okay, just, just a quick response. Um, and I'll say it's, it's critical to be special for calendar time. This is a very standard way of doing Cox models and doing Cox effectiveness models where you're evaluating VE in real time during a vaccine rollout. So it's a very okay. complex. The, the Pfizer, I apologize. Pfizer, you have, um, again, I, you have multiple, you're in our room multiple times, but you have three mics that are picking up audio at the same time. So we're seeing it on our end. So I just want to make sure people can hear you. So let's just take a quick second here. Um, we're going to take a quick unexpected break. 
Uh, go ahead and kill our feed for a moment. Thank you for that unexpected quick little technical. We just wanted to make sure everybody could hear and and as well as our members and voting members as well. So, uh, Dr. Monto, are you there? I am here. All right. I'm going to hand it back to you. Okay. Uh, I think we can summarize that there were differences in the models, and we'll let the statisticians uh, work this out. There are often these kinds of issues when you're working with complex models. I apologize to the voting members for cutting into their time with this uh, discussion. I'll next call on Dr. Carilla. Thank you. Thank you, Arnold. Uh, this is a question for the, for the, for the Pfizer team. Um, I think it's pretty clear that based on the dosing interval between your two the, between your two primary doses, that while you get a nice boost in terms of uh, antibody response, you really take a big hit in terms of durability. That's very clear from the available literature on uh, various prime boost strategies that have been done both in animals and in and in humans. So I think the the waning of immunity should have been anticipated. Uh, what I'm concerned concerned with is that while it's pretty obvious that in the high-risk groups for severe COVID tend to be individuals such as the immunocompromised, the elderly, obese, uh, diabetics, all of those tend to have diminished uh, or impaired cellular immune responses, which is the exact basis of good cellular immune responses is what gives you the durability. So. It's a little disappointing that there's been very little reporting of the cellular immune responses and an entire focus on the, um, the, the, the neutralizing anisera, which clearly for that population at high risk is absolutely essential. But for the broad population in terms of their protection, which seems to be holding up well over time, should be because of adequate cellular immune responses, but we have no indication of that. So it's unclear that everyone needs to be boosted other than a, uh, a subset of the population that clearly would be at high risk for, for serious disease. So uh, I'm, I'm curious as to what evidence you have in terms of cellular immune responses and how does that look in terms of durability for the average person who's been vaccinated? Thank you for the question. I will ask Dr. Gruber to comment on the cellular immunity, and then I'll also, also ask Dr. Phil Dormanser to comment. So first offer to Bill. Yeah, so thanks, Dr. Carilla, for the question. I think um, we have to sort of deal with two aspects. One is the practical aspect about why we're here today, and that is, of course, that we're looking to try to improve on protection that is waning over time. And obviously the marker that we've used to look at that is uh, neutralization response, which has been a good marker, albeit there are other things that accompany that type of immune response that are likely important. And so I think, uh, again, our goal here is to prove that the vaccine was safe and effective, which I believe we've done, 
and we've obviously met the non-inferiority criteria. And I think there's every reason to believe, given the protection seen after the first dose with the neutralizing antibody and whatever came along with it, that there should be an expectation after the third dose that we continue to augment those responses, or at least they're no worse than they were after the, the second dose. And I, uh, you, you're beginning to see, of course, evidence of that from the Israeli study. So uh, I, I agree that it's important to understand uh, cell-mediated immune response, but I think the, the key message is we know protection wanes, we know a vaccine uh, dose uh, seems to, based on the Israeli experience, seem to restore that protection. We know from our own data that we're getting uh, threefold higher uh, GMTs that likely are associated with uh, a, a good protection. But let me turn this to Phil, just to comment on the nature of CMI. Sure, well, we have data on the cell response um, after the initial doses, uh, where we see strong both C4 positive and CD8 positive T cell responses that are as high or even a bit higher in some cases than are seen after natural infection. And uh, there may be a slide that may put up that demonstrates that. Uh, we have samples for a uh, uh, later time point. We do not yet have those data. And I will reinforce uh, what Dr. Gruber said that ultimately, regardless of the quality of protection, the degree of the antibody cell responses, it is in the end protection that matters. So ultimately, the questions of mechanism are interesting, but it is, of course, the actual uh, efficacy or effectiveness uh, that we observe that is the key outcome. Thank you. I think Dr. Jansen may have wanted to add a comment. I don't know, Dr. Jansen, if um, you're connected, but uh, you're free. Can you hear yeah. me? Yes, I can. I like Thank you. Yeah, thanks. I'd like to make two comments. Number one, uh, to answer the, the question a little bit more directly that was just asked, we have also very good evidence of memory B and T cell responses, which one would assume that if one gives a booster will again uh, not uh, be diminished, but if anything sustained or go up. That's number one. And uh, secondly, I think T cell responses are really not important when we look at infection. It is clear that neutralizing antibodies are responsible to prevent the infection. And what we have seen repeatedly that we see an increase in infection over time. We also see an increase in disease over time. Infection usually is a uh, an earlier indicator before we actually see the disease. What's important to prevent disease is both, I would think, the um, neutralizing antibodies as well as T cells. But as I mentioned earlier, we have very, very strong, and as is published, B and T cell uh, res memory responses after immunization with uh, BNT 162B2. Thank you. Okay, let's move on, please. Uh, Dr. Meisner. You're muted. Still muted. Try now, Cody. Dr. Meisner. Dr. Meisner, you have your own personal phone muted. Go ahead and look at your personal phone. Hello? There you go. Can you hear me? <laughs> there you yep. Go. Yes, we can. Okay. My apologies. Um, uh, and thank you, Dr. Monto, and uh, thanks, Mike, for helping me out here. I, I'd like to echo the comments that uh, Dr. Monto uh, gave this morning, acknowledging Dr. Marion Gruber's um, remarkable leadership and contributions to CBER, and that also applies to Dr. Phil Krauss. Um, the, the question that I have is, is what we've learned from influenza, where this variation in the neuraminidase and hemagglutinin antigens on an annual basis, we change the vaccine. And, and so for a, for a booster strain, um, shouldn't we try and, and match the circulating variant uh, as much as we can? That is uh, right now predominantly the, the, the Delta strain. So why did you decide, why did Pfizer decide to, to select um, 
BNT 162B2. And this is a question for uh, Dr. Bill Gruber. And um, because a new variant, when and if it emerges, will almost certainly be a progeny of the Delta variant. And don't we want to match um, the new strains that are most likely to circulate as closely as possible? Thank you. Yeah, so thanks, uh, uh, Dr. Meisner, for your question. Um, I think, as you realize, within the flu field, flu is very different, right? We actually have major antigenic changes, which we can show immunologically escape response. Um, if someone can bring up um, the uh, slide that I showed during the presentation that uh, shows the immune responses across the various variants, we see something very different here, both in terms of the immune response as well as what we um, have experienced in terms of protection against variant. Um, and, uh, okay, there we go. I can, I, if we can bring up um, slide uh, one, please, uh, on the screen. So again, I remember that. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, but I, yeah. So this is. If yeah. it's going to. Yeah. So this. Sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. So I'm going to say that the shows that across the variants that have been studied, and we also are, you know, we that it's looking promising for you as well. We've not yet seen a variant that escapes a neutral position, and in particular circumstances of the beta. Uh, spike variant, you can see at least have point S of a neutralizing tire 194. So the lowest of the group we had a zero non lit in South Africa in terms of protection against that particular band. So that doesn't mean perhaps sometime in the future there may be a variant that escapes. Right now there is not one. We obviously working by see as a variant ex, uh, you know, expresses its mind that yes, there seems to be a potential for a seat, then obviously you're very interested in pivoting very quickly to bring that variant on board. But it's point that does not seem to be necessary. And I think it's encouraging you know, what we've seen in Israel, in the thing of Delta, which everybody has been concerned uh, appropriately about is rapid spread. But, uh, Efficacy you've restored when you received a booster is so 95%. Um, you know, we have looked, as I mentioned in the study, at beta as a, as a surrogate so that we would be able to pivot potentially in the future without having to do additional clinical trials so we could rapidly react. But for now, there is no evidence of escape for the variants we've looked at. The efficacy data from South Africa suggests even when it's a little bit lower, we're protective, and the information from uh, Israel uh, shows 95% restoration of protection after a booster. So um, I think the flu story is different. Yes, um, but there, I, I think there are certain similarities, Bill, in um, the, the sense in your trial, I know that six patients Six subjects of the 312 received a prototypic um, uh, beta uh, 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 vaccine, and but my point still arises: the new variants that are are very likely to emerge will most likely come from the Delta strain, and they will have either increased capacity for transmission and hopefully not increased capacity for disease, but it's hard to predict at this stage, and don't you want to uh, introduce a new vaccine that's going to be most similar to the ones that are likely uh, to emerge in the future? Uh, Cody, I'm yeah. going to park the answer to that question. We all know what the what the what the answer would we would like to see, but we've got a question in front of us right now. Uh, so. Please, let's move on. I just want to remind the committee that the uh, people and uh, our colleagues in Israel are staying up late to answer our questions. And if there are questions for them, I would like to give that priority. So uh, I can't see uh, because there's a share my screen in front of the Okay, now I can see Dr. Hildreth. 
You did. Pardon? Okay, we're here. Oh, thank, thank you, Dr. Monto. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. My question is from the team from Visor or from Israel for that matter. It was not unexpected that the antibody levels would wane after the vaccinations, but has anyone uh, attempted to correlate a certain titer with protection? Because if we knew the minimum titer needed for protection, that would be a great way for us to monitor whether or not we really needed booster shots. So is that something someone on the team can speak to, please? Anybody from Israel want to talk about the data from, uh, from Sheba Medical Center? I can't hear her, Dr. Monto. I can't either. Uh, yeah. I have to unmute first. Um, <laughs> so, go. yes, we're, do we're doing a research with Shiva Medical Center that involves families uh, of confirmed cases. So we have taken uh, confirmed cases and uh, registered their family members who were vaccinated into um, this research that follows them for 10 days and then try to uh, establish whether they were confirmed on the first PCR being enrolled into the study and then on day 10. Um, and at the same time, upon enrollment, we're taking antibodies, neutralizing antibodies and cell-mediated immunity levels to try to find out the correlation of protection. Hopefully, we'll have that result in uh, a month. Okay. Well, that would be very The bottom uh, line is we, we do not have a correlate right now, which is uh, no. part, of, part of the issue. Okay. Thank you. Dr. Mo Dr. Dr. Monto? Yeah, yes. I'm sorry to interrupt. Uh, it, it would, it, is it permitted uh, for Dr. Jansen? She'd like to just comment on that last point. If, okay, yes. Okay. Quick, quickly, please. And without a, and, and I hope we can hear her. <laughs> it's a chronic problem from you. She's in a, yeah, she's in Berlin and seems to have a better connection all the way from there than we do. So hopefully so. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. German technology. I'm kidding. Uh, I just wanted to say that we actually looked in our breakthrough cases in our uh, placebo-controlled phase three study and have compared the antibody titers where we had the opportunity in, in individuals that uh, got a disease versus the ones that didn't. And we were also unable to really come up with a uh, with a antibody threshold. So I think it's probably a much more complex story and not easily just uh, addressed with neutralizing antibodies. Thank you. Thank you. That sounds reasonable. Uh, Dr. Chatterjee. Yes, uh, thank you, Dr. Manto. Uh, my question actually is for Dr. Oliver, if she's still here, or anyone um, on, the immuno uh, on the epidemiology side. So it, it appears that what's happening with regard to breakthrough infections among the vaccinated is different in the, in the U.S. compared to what's happening in Israel. The Delta variant has been, um, I think, prominent during the same period of time in both countries, and yet the outcomes seem to be quite different. So uh, could you shed some light on that, Dr. Oliver? Yes, hi, thanks. So I don't know that I will have kind of the, the definitive answer. Um, I can uh, give a couple of thoughts. Uh, first of all, I would note that the definition of severe disease that Israel has used is quite different than what we've used in the U.S. Um, so they have said that an elevated respiratory rate or an oxygen level less than 94 percent is severe disease, whereas CDC in the studies has primarily been, you know, clinical hospitalization, ICU, or death. So um, that, is, that is one aspect when we try to um, compare point estimates. Um, I think another thing that is likely relative or important is just the size of the country um, and the heterogeneity of the pandemic across the U.S. Um, when we look and combine data, you know, across 50 states, these broad platforms, um, that it's likely 
just very heterogeneous compared to um, to a, a smaller uh, country, um, as well as the way the vaccine has rolled out, um, that they achieved high vaccine coverage very quickly, whereas, um, you know, in the U.S., we've had a little bit more of a, a rolling kind of gradual um, uptick. So, um, you know, I, I think there's a variety of, of factors that could play into it, um, but those are... Um, the, the first three that come to mind. And we, I will also say, they kind of exclusively have used Pfizer. We have a variety. We've used Pfizer, Moderna, and J&J, &J, and so it could be that the um, heterogeneity of vaccines used as well um, could could be a, a, a somewhat of a role in what the U.S. is seeing. Um, thank you. I think it's important to note that uh, the difference is, is quite uh, striking because um, as from CDC data that we're all looking at, it appears that uh, only 2% of the hospitalizations, if you're just looking at hospitalization data, uh, are among uh, vaccinated individuals in the U.S. has been true for many weeks now, uh, whereas that is not true uh, according to the data that was shared with us from Israel, which seemed to be only 40% uh, of their hospitalizations were among those who are unvaccinated. So I'd just like to point that out to the committee. Thank you. So I think there's a, a, a difference in the percent in the country that are vaccinated, which is uh, which may may be a, uh, a, a factor there. Uh, Doctor Perlman, there we go. Good, yeah. may, okay, Doctor Milo. Yeah, if I may just yeah. add, if I may just add one sentence, I th I think the proportion. In Israel, as uh, uh, Sharon presented, most of the elderly population in Israel has been vaccinated very early, almost all of it around the months of January and February. And I think that is also a difference that most of the population now are about six or seven months post the vaccination. Thank you. Dr. Perlman. Yes, so I want to ask a question that's a continuation, actually, of these questions. So in Israel, there's both the question of the high vaccination rate that was just pointed out, and also the fact that in the months, in the last one or two months, there's been huge gatherings within Israel, whether over the high holidays or other uh, venues. And when you do your analyses and try to compare the uh, effects of vaccination uh, on boosting, certainly the data show that boosting is very effective. But when you put these other factors in, uh, how strong are the data, if you subtract these other issues, how strong are the data supporting uh, really a booster immunization? Okay, so maybe I'll begin and maybe uh, Dr. Pais would continue. So the analysis that we did was uh, either in the month of July or in the month of August, the, those gatherings you referred to and the high holidays, we really are in that season now during September. So all of those, uh, all of those studies that I've shown you are actually still in the months prior to the gatherings and the high holidays. Dr. Monto, uh, uh, this is Bill Gruber again. Uh, could I ask your indulgence um, to have uh, Louis Jodar comment on this, obviously in part because we didn't get a chance uh, due to my running over time to speak to our interpretation. So, Dr. Jodar. So, uh, Ben, uh, thank you. Very we didn't have to hear you twice. Uh, we have feedback again. Really? So, you cannot hear me? Do you hear me with an echo? An echo. With an echo. Uh, we, we apologize we for the any, technical. We don't have any microphone. Why don't we move on, and then when we get a chance, we'll go back to you, because it's a real it's a real problem. Amanda Cohen, Dr. Cohen. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. Great. Um, I have a question um, specifically for our colleagues in Israel. 
um, and it's two part. One is uh, whether or not in the breakthrough cases that you have seen, in particular in young adults, if you've seen uh, reports of myocarditis, long COVID, or MISC in those young adults who had two doses but had breakthrough disease, or were most of those cases um, asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic with no long-term sequelae. Um, and then second, uh, can you explain um, I think we got to part of this answer um, in the last question, but why is it that if your R0 went below 1, um, in recent weeks you've started to actually, you're at your highest rates right now and your test positivity rate is increasing, at least from the data that you have online from the last couple of weeks? I'll start with, uh, with the, the second question, uh, and that goes to the high holidays and this very weird period. Uh, and in addition, uh, the 1st of September, when we opened schools despite of the increase uh, of the fourth wave. So I think the combination of these things in September are making our numbers uh, a bit funny and not really reliable. Uh, but we do know and we are aware of the fact that we're in the fourth wave. We are not at all at the end of it. We are still with high numbers with 6 to 7 percent uh, positivity in test results. And I think once uh, the, the holidays settle down, we'll see the true effect of where we are. But until the high holidays, we saw, as Ron showed, uh, a, a continuous drop in the reproductive number and uh, and, and stabilization in the active, severe, and critically ill patients. Uh, so we, we definitely feel the booster effect, uh, but we're not over the fourth wave yet. And you need to remind me the first question, sorry. Sorry, thanks. It was just related to, uh, in, in young adults who had two doses, have you had any report? of in breakthrough cases of myocarditis or long COVID or uh, MISC? So we had cases of myocarditis among uh, young adults, as I've shown you before. It was mainly because, uh, with males, 30, um, and that was the, the, the signal, the very clear signal was after the four, uh, in the four or fifth day after the second dose. So there was a, like an epidemic curve after the second dose. 95% uh, of them were not severe, were discharged after a few days in the hospital. Um, and we, we have seen in this fourth wave um, hospitalizations of people who are younger than 60 years old, uh, some of them with mortality who were doubly vaccinated and did not uh, receive yet the third dose. So among the mortality, one of the speakers in the public hearing actually referred to us having a high rate of mortality in Israel, about 1,000 people dying uh, in this fourth wave. And that is true. Uh, but 40% of them are unvaccinated, and 54% of them received two doses and uh, did not have the chance to receive the third dose yet. And the minority are those who were in between uh, vaccinations or in the process of being vaccinated. Um, and uh, a really minority uh, received the a third dose uh, and died. Uh, from corona. So it is clear that in our fourth wave, the vaccinated, doubly vaccinated individuals play a major role, not just in confirmed cases, but, but also in hospitalized, in severely ill, in critical ill, and in death. I hope that answered the question. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Gans. Hi, um, thank you so much. Um, I did have a follow-up to um, our Israeli colleagues um, because um, I had brought up the idea of secondary cases, but the real part of that question that I thought was of interest us today is, and maybe you can't say this because September has been odd, um, an odd behavioral month. Um, I'm wondering if actually the third dose has brought those secondary cases down in people who are immunized a lot of spread. Again, I was saying to um, younger individuals, that would be a real reason. 
stop the spread. Wondering if you could see that dynamic secondary that we are experiencing here in this country. So I have to say that for the first time I was able to unmute my phone and then talk all the previous times I talked first and then unmuted. Um, so um, yes, we have, uh, we have seen a decrease in the number of people who are getting infected from people who ha are uh, now with a booster dose. It's not, it's, we haven't done yet the full analysis of that. We're in the midst of that. But I think that the fact that the reproductive number is coming down, this is what it means. Every one person who is now confirmed actually uh, infect less people. So that, that is clearly part of the, um, of the equation now. The people who are dub, uh, thirdly vaccinated, doubly vaccinated with a booster, are, uh, are getting less infected and are less infected others when they're, once they're confirmed. But this is really preliminary results. Thank you. And the only safety um, question I had um, that probably pertains to our U.S. data um, and hopefully um, those who are ongoing studying this um, and the other um, safety nets that continue. There's already been about one million third doses that have um, happened in the U.S. Um, and I'm wondering if somebody from the CDC talk about the safety. Hi. Um, yes, I would say um, uh, stay tuned. I think there's an upcoming um, analysis on this that uh, could um, come out within the next week or so. So I don't have the data right in front of me, but I know that that is um, actively being investigated uh, and will be reported uh, very soon. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Sawyer. much. Uh, my question is for Dr. Lee or colleagues at FDA, and it sort of extends Dr. Gann's line of thinking just now, and it's about the safety profile. As I understand, the uh, clearly the mRNA vaccines are among the most reactogenic of any vaccine we've given in recent years. As I understand the question posed for the committee today, we are not to consider the data from Israel. We're supposed to look at the sponsors data from their clinical trial, and I came into today thinking that was a very small safety database of 300 people. So I'm interested in comparisons to other vaccines that we have decided to give a booster dose for in recent years, like meningococcal conjugate vaccine, meninge B vaccine, Tdap. What is the size of the database in those studies? I, I took from Dr. Lee's presentation that FDA is comfortable with this sample size of 300, but it strikes me as a little bit small. Hi, uh, this is Dornstein. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thanks. Uh, so the, the size of the safety database that FDA has relied upon to support licensure of booster doses uh, for preventive vaccines has, has varied somewhat and depends uh, in large part on the understanding of the safety profile from the primary series, uh, both in terms of, of clinical trial data from pre-licensure studies as well as post-licensure uh, safety experience. Uh, so, for example, in, in the case of the Japanese encephalitis vaccine, uh, Ixiaro, we had a booster dose clinical trial safety database uh, of about 300 uh, adults, uh, mainly younger adults, uh, but uh, also uh, some uh, post-licensure uh, safety experience, although not huge. Uh, uh, in the case of several uh, meningococcal conjugate vaccines, the pre-licensure uh, safety database for booster doses uh, has been uh, somewhat larger than that, uh, nearing 1,000, uh, and with uh, perhaps more uh, uh, post-marketing, uh, post-licensure safety experience there as well. Uh, and then with uh, uh, tetanus, diphtheria, and acellular pertussis vaccines that have been approved for 
uh, a, a second uh, dose uh, in adults. Uh, again, we have a clinical trial uh, safety database preceding licensure of the booster dose uh, of about 1,000 or so and extensive uh, experience with uh, that vaccine being used off-label uh, as a booster dose. In the case of these COVID vaccines, yes, uh, the pre-licensure clinical trial uh, uh, database is, uh, is around 300, which is on the, the lower end of the range that I just uh, uh, mentioned. Uh, but we also have a very extensive uh, post-authorization uh, safety database for the, the primary series that we can uh, consider as well. Does that answer your question? You. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you. Dr. Portnoy, and one more question after that before we move on. All right, thank you. Um, so I guess my question is for the Israeli group because um, our job is really to determine the risk versus the benefit of the COVID vaccine, a third dose versus just going with two doses. The emphasis in Israel was on reducing the rate of infection using the third dose because infection rates were starting to go up. Um, we know that people who get the COVID infection uh, also have these side effects. They get myocarditis, they have adverse events, and so on, and we're trying to compare the rate of those with the rate of getting the same adverse events from the vaccine. I was just wondering, in the Israeli experience, when the uh, number of people who had the two vaccines but not the third one, um, did they be, if they saw a decrease in the frequency of getting the vaccine, or getting the infection after the third dose, was the decrease enough to also reduce the rate of getting these adverse events from the actual infection as opposed to getting the uh, same effects from the vaccine. Did you compare the two? I'll, I'll, I'll try to answer. Um, so I think the, the third dose uh, reduces your risk to get an infection. So it reduces significantly your risk of getting adverse uh, ev events or reaction or complications from the disease itself uh, because you, you are more protected now and you're getting back uh, basically to what we saw uh, after the second dose uh, uh, pre-waning effect. Um, I, I have to say that I was pretty surprised with Retta Flevy, uh comment that Israel doesn't uh, follow adverse events. It's our data. I'm in charge of it. So I know exactly what is being reported to us, and I set our reservation. But we actually have two very large studies from our biggest HMOs that covers 75% of the population, and they looked into adverse events in Maccabi and Klalit. They looked at adverse events uh, one week following the third dose in those who are 60 plus, and they saw the same thing we saw, that there was uh, the same, there, there was some local and systemic uh, adverse events, but not serious adverse events. Most people said that they felt um, like they felt after the second dose, between uh, 80 to 90 percent said they felt like the, after the second dose, and about 10 percent said they felt worse. But there was no adverse event, and about 1 percent went to seek medical help because they didn't feel well. So it's really not significantly different than what we saw in the second dose. Uh, so the adverse event from the third uh, booster dose, um, based on our 3 million vaccinees, and I have to say again, part of them have not, we haven't followed for 30 days because we just rolled for the younger adults uh, recently. Uh, but for the older uh, people, uh, we have passed 30 um, days and this is the profile that we're seeing, pretty safe. Um, and we saw an increase, a dramatic increase in their protection against disease. So the risk of them having disease with complication reduces significantly. So, so the Thank adverse you. events I've seen might have been less than the risk of getting those same events if they were not vaccinated and they just got the disease. So what we saw prior to uh, our booster campaign was that the 60% uh, of the people in severe and critical conditions 
were um, were immunized, doubly immunized, fully vaccinated, uh, and as I said, 45% of the people who died in this uh, fourth wave were doubly vaccinated. So uh, there was a huge, uh, a huge importance uh, of this booster effect, not to just reduce confirmed cases, but actually to save lives for those who are uh, getting the disease and getting into severe and critical conditions. Thank you. Thank you. We're moving to Dr. Levy. Hear me. Dr. Yes, Levy? we can hear you, Dr. Levy. We can Great. hear you. Great. Uh, well, I wanted to uh, thank Dr. Alex so late, particularly on the Sabbath. Shabbat Shalom. I know you uh, in your prior answer, but I specifically wanted to drill down to males, where the, that, that group appears to suffer the, the highest risk of vaccine-associated myocarditis and specifically around the booster doses. Do you have data, do you have numbers to say whether the risk of, I'm particularly thinking 16, 17, 18 years of age, whether that number is similar to that after the second dose? How does that compare with the third dose, specifically in that group? Uh, thank you and Shabbat Shalom. Thank you for the question. So you can pull up uh, the, the slide, I think one before the last. Uh, from my presentation, uh, but basically what we did in the first and second uh, doses uh, back then when we had a signal of myocarditis and we actually heard it from, uh, you know, from people in the hospital that they're seeing uh, epidemiological analysis of that by three different groups uh, trying to figure out if this is a true signal. Uh, and the article uh, is about to be published on that topic. And we did see um, a signal after the second dose, as I said, after uh, with a rate of about, the highest rate was about one to 6,000 uh, vaccinees among uh, 16 years and up uh, to 10,000 in the older group, uh, uh, age group uh, between 20 and 29 and over, over that uh, when you go up by the age. Um, we have vaccinated more than 6,000 people uh, at the age uh, we're talking about, and we haven't seen the same um, the same adverse event. And I want to emphasize again that for myocarditis, we're actually doing active surveillance. We're calling the hospital every week to find out about new cases, regardless of vaccination. They're supposed to uh, to report to us all cases of myocarditis. Um, and so we're really on top of the myocarditis issue on the only report that we had so far uh, was of one case, 30 years of age, that I, that I showed. But I want to be very, very clear that we have not followed them yet for 30 days. So um, we'll continue, obviously, to follow. But the, um, the results that we have so far from the active surveillance are reassuring to, to say that, at least for now, we have a lower rate of myocarditis than we saw on the second dose. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, I think we can excuse our speakers now because we're in transition to our next session, which will be led off by Dr. Peter Marks. Sorry, um, Dr. Monto, would it be possible to have one more comment from Pfizer? I think we finally have a phone line that works. Oh, OK. Let's have Pfizer give us <laughs> Sorry. The last comment, which I cut off. Um, sorry, Dr. Monto. This is Luis Joder. I'm the Chief Medical Officer for Pfizer. Um, I just wanted to um, give perhaps a little bit a, a different interpretation, or I do not necessarily think that the epidemiological patterns that you are seeing in Israel are significantly different to what you are seeing in uh, uh, in the United States or elsewhere. I mean, I actually think that Israel saw it first because as Dr. Uh, uh, Sharon Al Roy Prey said, they were just three months ahead. And if you look at the epidemiological patterns, and, and I'm not discussing about the Kaiser Permanente, I'm discussing about the CDC, I'm discussing about the Public Health England, discussing about Qatar, you'll see that epidemiological pattern of reduction um, in, in all the other countries starting with infection, and it's not only infection, I would just say it's infection and symptomatic disease, uh, going down to 60, 50 percent in all, in all these countries. And, and again, if you look at the MMWR um, reported today um, here in the United States, you start to see even hospitalization going down 77 percent. 
So the conclusion is that the epidemiological patterns around the world are remarkably similar to what you've seen in Israel so far. It's just that Israel, as uh, again, has said before, they've just vaccinated many more people much earlier. So I just want to make that precision. Thanks. Thank you. And now to Dr. Marks. You're muted. Thanks. Sorry, double muted there. Sorry, my, my apologies. <laughs> Thanks very much, Dr. Monto. Um, I, I want to take this opportunity to, again, thank the committee members uh, and chair and, and our invited speakers uh, and the FDA staff from the Office of Vaccines, uh, along with the advisory committee meeting staff who've made this meeting possible. I also want to take this opportunity to deeply thank Drs. Gruber and Krauss for their incredible work over the past decades in the service of public health, and particularly during the century's worst pandemic. As I noted this morning, um, the decision that FDA needs to make is based on complex data that's evolving in front of our eyes. Um, there are different views of the data, uh, and the discussion of differing opinions uh, is critical to assist us in making our regulatory determination. Uh, it's no secret here uh, that uh, there is still debate over the need for an additional COVID-19 vaccine um, uh, at this phase of the pandemic. Uh, but the emerging evidence, such as that from our Israeli colleagues, is very helpful. We also know uh, that a breakthrough infections, uh, including some that are severe, are occurring in the United States, and FDA is tasked with reviewing an application that shows data highlighting the need and potential benefit of a third dose for the prevention of COVID-19 due to SARS coronavirus 2. And in this regard, I want to bring two points to the attention of the public and to the committee. And if I could have the slide. Okay, let's see if we can get the slide that I asked for up. While they're doing that, I'll just go ahead. Um, uh, first, um, uh, the need for an additional uh, vaccine dose uh, at six months uh, should not be surprising based on our knowledge of the immune system and our experience with other vaccines. Um, I think this was already referred to by Dr. Kerala. Um, as shown here on the CDC's ACIP adult immunization schedule for 2021, nearly half of the non-influenza, non-live virus vaccines require a second or third dose, including a dose at six months. Um, uh, therefore, the need for an additional dose at six months uh, to provide longer-term protection should not come as a surprise, as it's likely necessary for the generation of a mature immune response. And acknowledging the continuing generation of evidence that we have for the COVID-19 vaccines, this may end up being the case here as well. Uh, second, uh, the vaccines for other diseases noted here that are given to adults are not only indicated for the prevention of severe disease or hospitalization. Realizing the benefits of reducing disease occurrence or transmission, these other vaccines are indicated for various severities of disease prevention in the attended populations. Similarly, the question of safety and effectiveness for the third dose of Comirnaty before us today may not just be related to preventing severe disease requiring hospitalization, but also to preventing cases of COVID-19 that are associated with significant morbidity, including debilitating symptoms such as long COVID. There's also the issue of preventing the continued spread of COVID-19 to vulnerable populations, uh, particularly children uh, who are of an age where they cannot yet be vaccinated. So to conclude, as you enter your deliberations, I greatly appreciate the work of the committee members helping to sort through the data and make a recommendation, which is a critical step as the agency moves to act on the application and does its best to ensure that the rationale for its decision is clear, not only to healthcare providers, but also to the American public. We look forward to your deliberations and thank you so much all once again for taking the time. We uh, introduced the voting question and uh, and have some clarification about what we are to consider uh, in, uh, in responding to the vote.
I will turn this over to my FDA colleagues who will bring up the, uh, uh, the voting question. So that question is here now. Uh, do the safety and effectiveness data from, uh, go ahead, Marion, thank you. Yeah, I'm, uh, thank you. So, and thank you, Mike, for putting up this question. So the, we have one voting question and that we do the safety and effectiveness data from clinical trials C459-1001 support the approval of a community booster dose administered at least six months after completion of the primary series for use in individuals 16 years of age and older. The point of information I would like to ask is whether we are permitted to use any data from outside that uh, extended clinical trial in our consideration in the vote. Well, we do make a regulatory decision, of course, based on the safety and effectiveness data that are derived from the clinical trials with that very product. However, as I mentioned in my introductory remarks this morning, we also look at the benefit and risk of this additional booster dose when making a decision as to you know, whether this dose is safe. And the benefit risk consideration, of course, will look at the benefits. And in this regard, of course, the data and the presentations that you've heard um, today will also be uh, considered in, in, in making this decision. So in other words, if you're doing your vote, you know, please look at the data derived from the clinical trial, but if you look at benefit risk, of course, that supportive information will certainly factor in over. Yeah, this is Peter. I just want to just summarize here very, very clearly. You are allowed to look at the totality of the evidence in order to make your recommendations for us. That is the totality of the evidence before you, just like we will. We are, t t we, are, we are a science-based regulatory agency, and that means the person that ignores data is the one that's surprised. We're not going to ignore data just as you don't have to. You're not, this is not a, a legal proceeding. This is a scientific proceeding, so you can take all the data into account. Thank you. Thank you for that clarification. Okay, we have uh, hands being raised now. Dr. Hildreth? Is that uh, a new hand being raised, or is that the old, old one? Well, since it's raised, I will take this opportunity. Is that all right? That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just I have three, three uh, considerations that are important to me. One is I was hoping to hear from either Pfizer or the folks from Israel that there was a a neutralizing titer that correlated with protection because that would allow us to determine whether or not antibody levels had waned enough to make boosters necessary. That would be a very objective way to make that decision. I have a serious concern about myocarditis in, 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 in young people. Uh, if it's related to the immune response and the booster shots induce a very strong response, does, is that going to amplify the risk for myocarditis in those, in those individuals. And like uh, Dr. Meisner, I also wonder whether or not boosters would be best if they matched the variants that are causing so many challenges now. And the mRNA technology should make that reasonably easy to do. So those are my, my three considerations uh, in all of this. Uh, thank you, Dr. Monto. Thank you. Dr. Levy. Dr. Levy, you're unmuted and you can turn your camera on. Oh, no, sorry, that was an error. <laughs> All right. 
Okay, Dr. Gans, is your hand raised again? <laughs> Yeah, thank you for um, this ability to have um, this conversation. I am struck by um, FDA asking us to look at the totality of evidence when um, there's several key points I think that um, we're lacking right now. One of them is the very strong safety data that we could have actually with all the third doses that have been given. Um, we are given some support and from the, the Israeli data, but I, I think that that's a really missed opportunity and something that should be considered when the FDA considers these 300 people is not um, a large enough study, but we have other data that could be looked at. The other thing along with Dr. Hildreth that I think is very important is another missed opportunity that I think the FDA could have asked for is actually looking at those pre-third dose um, both humoral and T cell immunity and really trying to parse out what happens in that, plus the fact that we have a lot of breakthrough. So we really could have the answers and to be asked that they're complicated assays or to be told that it's up and coming um, is um, feels that we're making decisions when there's data out there that I think that it's very important what the Israeli study showed, if it truly does show that secondary um, infections have been um, reduced by the ability to, um, because I think that is one of the you know, since encouraged by that. Um, those are my considerations. As, but I just wanted to put that plug in. The other um, piece that I would like to put in um, a plug for is that Pfizer should be looking at alternatives schedules as well. It is true that we sometimes do prime prime boost, um, but we really haven't seen other vaccines that use three. So there should be some consideration not only to looking at different variants, but looking at different schedules. Thank you. Dr. Alfred. Thank you. So, so here's how I put this together. I think the stated goal of this vaccine by people like Rochelle Walensky and others has been to protect against serious illness. And the, the, the data that were presented by Sarah Oliver and by Kathleen Dolan previously at the ACIP meetings shows that these vaccines do exactly that. And, and it's, it's exactly what you'd expect. I mean, these, these studies are consistent with the fact that protection against serious illness is mediated by memory B cells which, as has been shown by researchers like John Reary here at Penn, as well as Shane Crotty at La Jolla, are, are, in, are long-lived, induced by two doses of mRNA-containing vaccines, and have plenty of time to activate and differentiate to protect against serious illness, which takes a longer period of time. It's hard for me to understand at some level the, the Israeli data, which are at variance with these studies. But it's, it, but it's especially hard for me to buy the fact that because they started, say, doing their, their immunization schemes three months before us, that that's why they're seeing what they're seeing. Because well, all the data are that the, 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 the longevity of memory T cells is far longer than that. Unless what we're arguing is that those who are greater than 60 or 65 have a lower frequency, much lower frequency of memory B and T cells, and therefore are more fragile and more quickly seen as, as being uh, susceptible to severe disease. It's also clear, however, that the third dose of mRNA vaccines increases the titer of virus-specific neutralizing antibodies and will likely decrease the incidence of asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic infection, which is associated with contagiousness. So then the question becomes, what will be the impact of that on the arc of the pandemic, which may not be all that much. I mean, certainly we all agree that if we really want to impact this pandemic, we need to, to vaccinate the unvaccinated. And then my last point, and then I'll stop, is just to sort of underline uh, Dr. Hildreth's comments that, you know, we're being asked to approve this as a three-dose vaccine for people uh, 16 years of age and, and older without any clear evidence of the third dose for a younger person when compared, compared to an elderly person is of value. If it's not of value, then the risks may outweigh the benefits. And we know that the 16 to 29-year-old is at higher risk for, uh, you know, for myocarditis. And now we have an even greater booster response in that scene after the second dose. So I guess in, 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 in summary, I would say that 
while I would probably support a, a, a three-dose recommendation for those over 60 or 65, I really have trouble supporting this as written for anyone uh, greater than or equal to 16. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Carrilla. Thank, thank you, Arnold. Uh, yeah, so I, I have, a, I have, I have, so I need some clarification from FDA regarding their question. So is, is, the, is the question really getting at changing the primary vaccination to a three-dose regimen, or is it just for the third booster this time, or is it for a, a booster every six months at, at this time? Uh, go, going forward. That's one. And, and then, uh, so I'd like the FDA to comment on that. I, I agree with a lot of what Dr. Offit said with the, with the caveat that I was a little surprised at the response by the Pfizer team that they find they have very good B and T cell immunity, and yet they're saying that they have, they don't see good durability, so they need to have a boost. Uh, it's a little bit conflicting <laughs> to me in that, in that regard. I can understand where certain populations, as Dr. Offit mentioned, the, the, the elderly, I think also the immunocompromised, there are some very clear populations that have impaired or re diminished good cellular responses and a boost may be very appropriate for them. It's not clear to me that the data we're seeing right now is applicable and necessary general population. Dr. Marion Gruber, to answer. Yeah, I just wanted to clarify for Mike, uh, you know, going back to his initial question. The reason why we posed the question the way we did is because Pfizer did ask for an indication for an additional, not an additional dose, for a booster dose, a single booster to be administered six months following the primary series. And I know there are different perspectives whether the third dose can be seen as part of the primary series or not. I think uh, the perspectives are, are do differ here, but that's really beside the point right now. What Pfizer has asked is for a single additional dose, which is a booster dose administered six months after the primary series. And that is because that was the request from Pfizer that's why we phrased the question whether the, the, the safety and effectiveness data would support approval about a, 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 of a booster dose administered six months after the primary series. But, but would the expectation for people who are unvaccinated at this point were a third booster dose to be approved, the expectation is that they would be told the primary vaccination scheme would include three doses, and how does that impact the pediatric indications? That, that may be the case for the unvaccinated. Of course, they would need to get their primary series, and, and they, we, but we would not at this point go ahead and say a primary series requires a booster dose. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Dr. Meisner. Thank you, uh, Dr. Monto. And I'd, I'd like to just give a couple of thoughts uh, as I listen. First of all, I, I agree with Dr. Gans that we still don't know the proper interval between doses. And I would add to that, we, we don't know the proper dose. And there are is some preliminary data regarding uh, another messenger RNA suggesting that a lower dose uh, might be effective and it might be less likely to be associated with, with complications. Um, secondly, I think one of the arguments in favor of giving a booster dose is the data on sterilizing immunity. That is, if uh, a third dose does, in fact, reduce the risk of transmission, um, then that's a significant uh, observation. But I'm not, uh, it's, it still sounded as though it's premature uh, to come to that conclusion. In terms of what um, Dr. Mark said, I 
I think it's very reasonable that for most killed vaccines, indeed, we do need to have an interval of time and a booster dose uh, uh, months after the primary series. But my concern, and perhaps the FDA could come in on it, Israel, uh, we just heard, define, is experiencing myocarditis in the high-risk young male, adult male group at about one out of 6,000. In the United States, um, going by the recent ACIP data, describing 50 to 60 cases per million second, million second doses comes down to about uh, one per 20,000. And we really don't know what's going to happen after a third dose. Myocarditis may be less common. It may have similar rates of occurrence, or it could be more common. We understand so little about the pathogenesis that it seems to me we need to know that data before um, going forward with a booster dose for the general population. And one of the thoughts that has come up is, why can't um, Pfizer check conin levels, for example? I, I, might there be subclinical myocarditis that occurs after third dose? Could they look at troponin levels or another parameter before and after administering that third dose to give us some reassurance that, um, that we're, not, we're not causing a problem? So, Dr. Fink, I, I see you. You've come on. Do you have the answer? I don't know if I have the answer, but I, I can offer some comments uh, from the FDA perspective. So, first of all, in terms of the the risk of, of myocarditis, pericarditis that we're seeing here in the U.S., yes, the the most uh, recent VAERS data are showing reports uh, of myocarditis, pericarditis in the range of, of 60 to 70 uh, cases per million doses in uh, the 16 to 17-year-old uh, age group, which is the, the highest reporting rate uh, among the various age groups uh, examined. Uh, and that is uh, numerically uh, lower uh, than the 1 in 6,000 uh, rate that you just heard about from Israel. Uh, on the other hand, we do know that VAERS is a passive uh, reporting system, and when we query healthcare claims databases uh, such as Optum, as has been summarized in our clinical review and summary basis for regulatory action, or the uh, uh, original BLA from Pfizer, what we find is uh, actually an estimate uh, with some fairly wide confidence intervals, but an estimate um, of around 200 cases per million doses in the 16 to 17 uh, year old age group, which uh, if you do the math is about one in 5,000. So that actually is fairly similar uh, to what the Israelis are, are finding. Uh, as, you, as you stated, we, we really don't have enough data yet to know what the risk of myocarditis or pericarditis uh, would be in, in any specific age group uh, following a booster dose. It is an important question. Uh, it is likely one that can only be answered uh, in the context of post-licensure uh, or post-authorization uh, use. Uh, but also we agree with you completely that it is important to study whether initially subclinical cases of myocarditis uh, may be occurring, and if so, what the outcomes of those cases are. And we have discussed the need for such uh, investigations with uh, vaccine manufacturers, and uh, perhaps Pfizer uh, would like to explain uh, what their plan is for uh, investigating uh, that possibility. And, and to continue uh, the discussion, is it, it possible to say at what age uh, myocarditis seems to not become a problem? If I, to put you on the spot. <laughs> right, so if, if, if you look at the, the healthcare claims data, you, you see that the, there, there is uh, you know, evidence of, of some attributable risk um, at, uh, at all age groups, although 
the older you get, the, the higher the risk for complications from COVID uh, that then offset the risk of myocarditis. So when you, when you look at the, at the balances uh, of, of risk versus benefits, where you really start to see uh, a risk of, of myocarditis uh, 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 being higher is, is in uh, males under the age of 40. And that's uh, what is uh, written in Thank the you. morning. Let's move on, and then we can ask uh, Pfizer for comment uh, uh, later on after the list of those with their hands raised has uh, uh, been handled. Uh, Dr. Rubin is next. Hi, thanks. Uh, thanks, Dr. Monto. Um, I I'm, I'm going to echo something that everyone, that most people have said, but I want to um, just make it say it in a slightly different way. Um, we're, we're, we're gauging risk and benefit here. And um, so we, we, we really have to think about both. We don't know that much about risks. The truth is a very small number of people under 60 have received the vaccine. Uh, but if, there is a lot of Israeli data that suggests it's probably okay in people over 60 uh, but we don't know very little about people under 60 because it's been such a short time since they started vaccinating. So that's where the risk calculation stands. There is a big difference between the U.S. and Israel. Um, the, the use case in Israel is where most people are vaccinated. If it really does limit transmission, then it will be important to take those vaccinated people and further limit transmission in them. But remember, in the U.S., Transmission is going to continue to be driven by the very large number of unvaccinated people and the marginal benefit of, that, of a third dose of vaccine for people who are already vaccinated is likely to be very small for reducing the overall uh, burden. So that really means that the primary benefit is going to be in reducing disease, um, and, and, and that's largely been defined in various ways as severe disease. And we know the people who benefit from that. They're the people at heart, who are at highest risk of severe disease, which means older people and people with other um, comorbid conditions. And, and those are the kinds of people that, that the FDA has already approved a third dose for, um, uh, although it's, so far it's a relatively contained per, uh, group. So, so I suspect that many of us are heading toward the suggestion that we can find um, vaccination at this point to that group. I will add, strongly suspect that when we see data that it will prove, and this is going to be confusing, but it will prove that, the data, that there is very low risk for the vaccine. But we don't have that right now, and I don't think that we're, I'd be comfortable um, giving it to a 16-year-old for all the reasons that everyone has ra already raised. Dr. Fuller, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Monto. I think what I wanted to say has essentially been um, addressed by Dr. Rubin um, in that uh, we don't have the same um, data or we have the same context that is in Israel here in the USA. And then I asked myself, what happens if we approve, if we say yes to this? How does it roll out? Um, will the people who have been vaccinated longest be the first to get the booster? Um, I don't know who discusses that or who decides that. Um, I'm not comfortable with only 12 people as an end for the third booster in the clinical phase three that we're being asked to evaluate. So I, I, I would like us to feel much more comfortable with what we're looking at from this clinical study in the USA with the differences we have in our population. What happens for people who did not get the Pfizer vaccine but have been vaccinated? There are too many questions for me to feel comfortable saying yes to this when I think with some more detailed study we could get some more answers. So what's happening with the clinical trials with others is my question. Thank you, Dr. Paul. But the ones Dr. that were enrolled in the clinical trial initially in the Pfizer clinical trial. All right, Dr. Chatterjee. 
Is there going to be an answer to that? Uh, what I happened? Think, uh, I think what we are going to do, Dr. Fuller, is to try to move early to a vote on the question that is in front of us and then see where we go from there in terms right, of the session you. today. Okay? Dr. Chatterjee. Thank, yes, thank you, Dr. Montu. Um, I, I have several thoughts, um, but I will uh, keep my comments to a couple of things that uh, I don't think have been quite fleshed out by my colleagues. I agree with a lot of what's already been said. Um, it seems to me, and I'm taking Dr. Marx's exhortation to take all of the data into consideration, that we do really have uh, a very different situation in Israel than what we are facing here uh, in the U.S. at this point in time. Um, the, the data in Israel, particularly for those who are over 60, appear to me to be quite compelling for a booster dose in that population specifically. But if within the, the context of the U.S., you know, I think that uh, we're a large country, it's true, but there are also differences in, in different parts of the country that we're seeing. And there are parts of the country that are highly vaccinated, and they are not seeing breakthrough cases among those people who are highly vaccinated necessarily in those numbers. So I think that that's an important point to take into consideration. And then finally, I want to go back to something that Haley started off talking about, several other people commented on, which is, um, it is true that uh, giving a larger gap between the prime and the boost, whenever the boost might be, uh, does seem to be beneficial, and that's true for many vaccines. Uh, so would it then be um, beneficial to put that gap between the first and the second dose rather than to then give a, a third dose booster after six months? In other words, to summarize, there are a lot of questions to be answered after we take care of the issue in front of us, which is uh, the booster vaccinations and those already vaccinated, correct? Yes, thank you. Okay, Dr. Pergam. Dr. Monto, um, uh, certainly a lot of comments have been made. I'm, I'm um, happy to hear a lot of uh, similar thoughts by my colleagues. I do want to talk about the issue that, that Dr. Offit brought up, is the issue of transmission. I, I do think it's important that um, with a large population in the United States vaccinated, that if we can decrease transmission, um, this could have some benefits um, for the pandemic in general, and particularly in certain populations. Um, there's a lot of concern um, uh, with healthcare workers of continued breakthrough um, uh, for uh, folks who are fully vaccinated, um, to that group that's been vaccinated very early. And um, because of strains on healthcare systems, this seems like an important issue that um, could be important. The challenge in front of us is that we're given this massive group to consider as the booster. And I think in many ways, we'd like to be asking, a, or we'd like to be answering a separate question, which is um, you know, specifically high-risk groups that we'd like to give the booster to, but that's not on our, on our plate. So I, I think it is important to consider transmission and how it has enough, uh, how this could have an effect. I, I agree that most of the transmission is happening amongst the unvaccinated, but I think this can be cor become more problematic if this trend does continue. And I would say, in echoing something that Dr. Gann said, it, it felt like there were a number of comments um, during this discussion where people said, there is a paper that is out, we'll be able to present this data to you soon, or it's coming next week feels like there's a lot of data that is circulating that could be helpful around this discussion um, that is not available at this moment, which makes it more difficult to make some of these decisions today. Thank you. Dr. Wharton. Uh, thank you. I, um, I really appreciate the comments from the other committee members, and I agree with, uh, with a lot of what's already been said. You know, it's a frustrating place to be in where we have in the United States uh, more than adequate supplies of vaccine and yet have been unable to achieve the level of coverage that would um, 
result in much better control of this pandemic than we currently have. So we're we're sort of in this position where we're having to think about about administering third doses of the Pfizer vaccine, uh, which is is probably not the action that is going to have the most health, health impact uh, in the United States. Uh, thinking about everything that's been presented, it does feel to me like benefits are likely for uh, some part of the population, um, for um, people with underlying conditions, the immuno immunocompromised people, um, the, the, the older population, um, but I'm I share the concern that's already been expressed by others about what we don't know about myocarditis in younger people. And given that the risk of breakthrough infection in that younger population uh, is, is, is much lower than it is in other parts of the population, um, that's just that recommending a third dose for younger people is just not something I'd be comfortable with at this point. Thank you, Dr. Wharton. Dr. Lee. So I, I would just like to make a little bit, a few comments. Um, I think when we uh, approved the vaccines to begin with, we had a lot of clarity on what we were supposed to be looking at, a reduction of symptomatic um, COVID infection, as well as the incidence of severe infection. Um, it's not clear to me that the, um, that the guidance is as clear cut here. Um, it seems that the um, sponsor was giving some um, guidance with respect to the immunobridging studies um, that they appear to have met. Um, but then there also seems to be a lot of, uh, we don't have a lot of data on the endpoints we had before, as in the symptomatic infection uh, after the uh, COVID, uh, after the booster shot uh, and its improvement, or, um, or any on the um, uh, severe, it's much more limited. And then a lot of discussion about transmission, which I, I agree is important, but we're sort of um, working without data and making those decisions. Um, I'm also a little bit concerned that the study that we're looking at and what the highest risk group we've talked about, the 65 and older, as um, Dr. Fuller pointed out, only has um, 12 patients. I would agree that the um, Israeli data is really quite compelling, but I'm, I'm um, my enthusiasm is somewhat limited by the fact that the follow-up period is less than a month, so the sustainability um, is not yet clear. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Dr. McDennis. He has a point. Paul, don't you think it's plausible that um, that some people, despite being fully immunized, might not have a robust enough or a more efficient enough immune memory to rapidly mount a response when they see a variant that is um, like Delta, which has demonstrated not only really high transmissibility, but very high viral replication. So I could imagine how if you didn't have um, sufficient circulating antibody and, and, and antibody present in the nares and maybe in the nasopharynx, um, you could get overwhelmed with a virus like that. So I get that they could be primed, but maybe you really need in certain people high levels of antibody present because you may not have time to mount that response that you need despite being considered primed. Dr. Offit, do you want to reply to that? Going a little out of order? So it's a good question. So, so at the heart of that question is, What's the incubation period, essentially, of serious disease? Uh, and so you're definitely right that if you have high titers of, of circulating neutralizing antibodies, that's going to give you your best chance of decreasing the initial viral replication and, and even mild or moderate infection. Usually, as a general rule, people believe that it takes a longer time to develop the kind of serious infection that, that gets you to the hospital. I mean, a couple of weeks, which then means that you are, you know, where you have, where you, if you have adequate frequencies of memory B and T cells, the, activate, the activation differentiation time for that is usually about three to five days. I mean, that's why the long incubation period diseases like measles, rubella, um, you know, you can get essentially 
sterilizing immunity, and you can eliminate those diseases from, from your country, as we did actually with those diseases though, earlier on. Um, so I, I think I take heart in the fact that um, the, the incubation period is fairly long for, for serious infection, and therefore, if you have adequate frequencies of memory B and T cells, you're less likely to be overwhelmed. I'm sure you're right that there, there would be some cases where that incubation period is much shorter, but I think on balance, it's, it's generally long enough to allow activation and differentiation of memory B cells and T cells to protect. Thanks for the question. Thank you. Dr. Sawyer. Thanks. Opinion that we need this in our armamentarium, a booster dose now, particularly for the elderly and other high risk conditions. But I share my colleagues' angst about the sparsity of safety data, and I am also anxious about the extrapolations both to older populations and younger populations. But we're not going to get a read on myocarditis until the vaccine booster is used extensively, and we have to rely on the BSD and other systems to capture that signal, and I'm sure they will be looking for it. So I'm hopeful that CDC rolls this out in a gradual fashion, but I think that it, uh, I'm, I would be in favor of approving this because we are going to likely need it for at least some of the population. Dr. Pergam. Apologies, my hand is still raised. I apologize okay. about that, Andrew. Uh, that's okay, I was wondering. <laughs> Dr. Portnoy. Great, thank you. Um, you know, it would be great to wait until we have all of the data about safety, but I work at a children's hospital. Uh, my hospital is filling up with kids who have COVID. Um, we didn't want to rush in to approve the vaccine for them, and now look where we are. I mean, it's very frustrating because we're just inundated with kids who supposedly weren't going to get COVID. The concern I have, the concern that we have that people are going to get myocarditis from COVID vaccine is real. The question we really need to be asking, though, is whether um, it or any other severe adverse reaction from the vaccine is greater than the risk of getting it from breakthrough infection. Uh, myocarditis is generally a short-term condition. Uh, most people who get it recover from it. I worry more about long-term systemic complications of COVID, which are real and can be prevented with the vaccine. Uh, look, antibody titers will help with systemic disease but not infected, uh, uh, systemic disease, but not infections, uh, uh, that, that just getting regular infections because that requires mucosal immunity. That's a different kind of immunity than what we're getting from a systemic vaccine. We really have two diseases, a mucosal disease and a systemic disease. Uh, mucosal is how it spreads. That's why people who've been vaccinated can still get the disease. They get it in their nose, they spread it, they don't have secretory IgA because it was injected into their muscle, so and that doesn't induce an IgA response. Systemic results in systemic uh, uh, COVID results in hospitalization and long-term morbidity. So that's what I think we should really be concerned with. Immunity clearly seems to decrease over time. We saw that with the data from the United States, also from the Israeli data. Uh, do we want to wait until more previously vaccinated people get sick? before we prevent them from getting sick. Uh, as one of those people who are at risk, I've had two vaccines. I'd rather not get the COVID uh, disease. I'd rather get the third vaccine. My wife already got her third dose. I plan to do the same thing next week. Pharmacies are giving it out off label. I would really love to be able to get it and prescribe it on label rather than have to do it off label because we refuse to uh, recommend approval. So I'm strongly in favor of approving this vaccine. Dr. Levy. Hi, uh, Dr. Monto. Thank you for all that. And we saw the, the question as carefully phrased by FDA to us, and I'm sure the decision will be to have us vote on the question as phrased. My question is, uh, given the number of uh, advisory committee members who are expressing similar concerns, uh, if the motion doesn't pass as written, will there be opportunities to propose a modification? Dr. Marks. The, the answer to that is yes. Why you are on, 
should we, where should we be explaining our votes? Should we explain the votes after we have the vote to be of help in, you, term, in, in determining per, the next question? Uh, yeah, Dr. Monto, I think perhaps for efficiency, it may be worthwhile going around the committee to just get a sense of the committee of where people are, and then perhaps we can take a moment and ensure that uh, what we then come back to you with for a vote makes uh, some sense if you're willing to do so. I'm perfectly willing to do so. So in other words, we don't have to have a vote on that question. I, I, I would say that for right now, maybe we could go through and get a sense of where the committee stands. And rather than going to a vote on that question, if uh, the uh, committee decides that they uh, uh, that They'd like to. We can. We can then see where we stand about putting that that question forward. Dr. Gruber, Dr. Marion Gruber. Yeah, I just wanted to make the point that uh, Pfizer has submitted a supplemental BLA asking to get an additional indication for a booster dose uh, when administered six months after the primary series for individuals 16 years of age and older. And I believe that we do need a vote on this question. And I think we can do that efficiently, which may be quicker, as a matter of fact, than going around the table. So what I would propose is that we do have the vote, and then we can go around the table and discuss where we think uh, a modification would be necessary or, or, or approvable. How about that? Hearing no, uh, Dr. Mark. Please feel make sure you're unmuted, Doctor. Yes, thanks. Please, please feel free to go, move ahead to a, a vote. I think we'll we'll go with what Dr. Gruber has suggested. When we can have your explanations, and then we can move uh, appropriately thereafter. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Uh, are do any Dr. Mongo, of the yes? I'm interrupt. Is it possible for Pfizer to make any final statements since we kind of had many technical issues and actually weren't able to address many of the questions? We will be brief. Okay. Uh, I'll give Pfizer, Pfizer five minutes to make final statements as long as we can hear you. Otherwise, <laughs> we'll, I'll do we'll my best. Stop. All right. Dr. Gruber, Bill Gruber, please comment. Go ahead. Floor is yours. Dr. Who is supposed to be speaking here? Pfizer, Bill Gruber. Uh, Bill Gruber. Oh, there, there he he's is. coming. Okay. All right. He's coming. Can you hear me? Okay. Let me run next door. Yes, we can. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He's here. <laughs> All right. All right. Sorry, I had to run from another room. My apologies for holding up the committee. We um, can hear you. <laughs> okay, that's good. That, that we solved at least that problem. So, again, I think we're all centered around the same goal here, and that is to make a safe and effective tool available to ma the maximum population that stands to benefit. So we're obviously eager for uh, the committee to vote on the existing question, and we hope they will keep that in mind. I think there have been a lot of issues that surround the, the rare risk of myocarditis that is already in the existing label. As you heard from Dr. Sawyer, and I think this is an important piece, it's unlikely that we'd be able to identify myocarditis in clinical trials. Uh, we weren't able to identify that, obviously, in the circumstance of the original licensure. It was only with the intense pharmacovigilance that occurred after the fact. And I think it's encouraging to me, and I hope to the committee members, that uh, the Israeli 
data, although it's not a full month out, it spans the time when myocarditis is most likely to occur based on their own data and based on what's seen by the CDC. Uh, so the expectation, I think, is, is that this is going to be a rare event, um, at just as it was after the first two doses, and will only be determined by pharmacovigilance. So in thinking about this, and I don't know whether there are CDC members that would want to comment on this, but the published data has made very clear that the risk-benefit profile all the way through the age ranges, whether we're talking about young uh, adolescents 16 to 17 years of age or we're talking about uh, individuals older, the risk-benefit is, uh, is clear. In fact, there seem to be more cases of myocarditis in some of those age groups with COVID-19 than there are with the vaccine. And then if you add to that the hospitalizations, the illnesses, the need to essentially stop the pandemic before we continue to generate variants. So I think the bottom line is the balance of evidence supports a broad recommendation, but we welcome the committees voting on the current question, but then certainly not depriving the ACIP or other recommending bodies the opportunity to make a decision about how the vaccine can be best used. The first goal is give the tool to those recommending bodies so they can best apply how the vaccine might be used. Dr. Cohen, would you like to respond on the behalf of the CDC? Sure. Uh, and then we're, gonna vote, then we're going to vote. Sure, thanks. I just want to clarify Pfizer's comment that the risk-benefit analyses that have been done have compared the risk of an adolescent not being vaccinated at all to having two doses, and that risk-benefit is in favor of vaccination. But the incremental benefit of a third dose over a second dose has not been presented or completed yet. And um, so I just don't want the committee members to, uh, to get confused with the incremental benefit of a third dose um, and the comparative risk of double exposure to both a second and potentially an additional risk with that third dose. Thank you. Uh, Prabha and Kathleen, are we ready to have a vote? Yes, we are. And we are voting with the, the uh, uh, proviso that we are going to have further dis an explanation of vote and further potentially further voting thereafter. Understood. Can you hear me fine? Yes. Okay, great. So, um, Mike, can you pull up the We've uh, got it. Roth? You've got the okay. question, please. Okay, thank you. So just for a note, only our members and temporary voting members, excluding the industry representatives, are going to be voting. Um, Dr. Monto can read the question for the record, and then afterwards, all members and temporary voting members will cast their vote by selecting yes, no, or abstain in the voting pod. Uh, you'll have two minutes to cast your vote once the question is read, and then after all the votes have been placed, we will broadcast the results and read the individual votes aloud for the record. Uh, please just note that once you cast your vote, you may change your vote within the two-minute time frame. However, once the poll has closed, all the votes are considered final. Um, unless anyone has any questions, Dr. Monto, if you could please read the voting question. Right, and the voting pod is not there yet. But let me read the question first. Do the safety and effectiveness data from the clinical trial uh, support approval of the Comirnaty booster dose administered at least six months after completion of the primary series for use in individuals 16 years of age and older. Thank you. And Mike, can we pull up the voting pod? Okay, we have the voting pod up, so go ahead and cast your votes this time, please.
gap to be announced when the voting is to be done. Yes, we're still getting votes in, so um, we've got about a minute remaining for individuals to cast their votes. Okay, it looks like we've received all of the votes. Um, let me read them aloud for the record. There should be 18 total votes today. Dr. Cohn has a no vote. We have 19 here in the closet. Right, we will figure out where the additional vote came in. So if we can um, close the poll I'm going to read the votes aloud. Uh, Dr. Cohn voted no. Dr. Portnoy voted yes. Dr. Lee voted no. Um, we did have an accidental vote from a speaker, so that will be disregarded. Uh, Dr. Chatterjee voted no. Dr. Perlman voted no. Dr. Gans voted no. Dr. Meisner voted no. Dr. Levy voted no, Dr. Hildreth voted no, Dr. Wharton voted no, Dr. Fuller voted no, Dr. Carilla voted no, Dr. Monto voted no, Dr. McKinnis voted no, Dr. Rubin voted no, Dr. Pergam voted no, Dr. Sawyer voted yes, Dr. Offit voted no, so um, this vote did not pass since the majority voted no. Thank you. Dr. Monto, I will hand it back to you if you wanted to go around the table. Right. Now uh, let's clear the raised hands. And what we will now do is for those who wish to explain their vote and to uh, propose uh, something that they might be in favor of, let's uh, take this up as the next question. So, Dr. Lee, is that your hand? called my name. Um, I did. I, I, I wasn't sure if it was an old man. <laughs> Your microphone yeah. has been turned okay. on. Thank you. Thank you for allowing us to um, have this opportunity just to think through what maybe next steps are. And I think, you know, a lot of the concerns were articulated very well previously. Um, I think that um, a lot of individuals do feel that there is a role for a um, another dose in populations, and we would like to see that come forward. We would also like to see some of the, um, we don't need it from the very small data set that was done in this third dose from Pfizer, but we really do need um, the broader safety data that's already available to bring this question again further to other populations that would um, are in question still. So we, I think um, I would support having a third dose available for other high-risk groups that weren't already given a third dose, um, such as um, individuals um, over the age of choose something, 50, 60, there's different studies out there. Um, and then looking more closely at the safety data for those other individuals. And I would also like I'm, to know um, about I'm going to make it difficult. I'm going to make it difficult for the speakers and ask them to come up with an age that they would feel comfortable with. I would no, feel comfortable. You can change with... your mind afterwards, but we need to start okay. somewhere. All right. I would love to see something greater than 50. Um, and I would also like to see 
um, data on the decrease in ability to spread the virus to those who are not able to get vaccinated. Thank you. Dr. Chatterjee. Yes, thank you, Dr. Monto. Um, I'd echo what, what Haley said, but I do want to explain my vote. Um, I have major concerns uh, with regard to the extrapolation of data from much older populations to 16 and 17 year olds. We have no data on the safety in this population at all uh, that have been presented so far. And, and that concerns me significantly. I also think that the safety database that has been presented is too small. Um, in terms of the benefits to uh, clearly an older population, as I mentioned earlier, I think the uh, Israeli data are very compelling for those over 60. Um, I also noted that in most of the presentations, there was a big gap between, in, in people who are between 55 and 65. They were missing in the analyses. So I would say um, I'd like to see more data before I would recommend it for a younger age group, but over 60 is probably okay from my standpoint. Thank you. Dr. Carrillo. Uh, thank you, Arnold. Uh, yeah, agreeing, agreeing with the, 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 uh, my colleagues, I think the safety, safety database is inadequate, particularly in the populations that uh, I really would like to see a, a boost that might be more, much more appropriate. The effectiveness data is pretty much limited to boosting antibody levels, and without a very good correlative protection, we can't really evaluate how effective that's going to be. I also agree with the CDC that the incremental benefit to the younger population is really has not been demonstrated at all. And as I questioned the CDC earlier this morning, as the background rate of natural infections continues to increase in the population, the ability to actually discern uh, the vaccine efficacy is going to declare, it's going to look less effective over time just because of the high rate of prior natural infections that are occurring. So I think this needs to be teased out very carefully. Uh, I think we need to target the boosters right now specifically to the people who are likely to be at high risk, and it's an older population, it's immunocompromised. I think if I wanted to include obesity, it'd probably be at a BMI of at least over 35 or something, something like that. People with diabetes, clearly all of the high-risk factors that have been identified for serious COVID disease, because I think ultimately that's what we're trying to do is to prevent the serious disease. I agree with my colleagues that um, uh, reducing transmission is a very laudable goal. Ideally, we'd love to have a sterilizing, we'd love to have sterilizing immunity, but I haven't seen any data to really address that one way or the other, so I don't know how we would approve boosters on an expectation that transmission would be, uh, would, would be reduced at this point. So I think we need to target where we're going to do boosters and continue to examine the potential efficacy of boosters uh, in, a, in a broader population. Thank you, Dr. Carrillo. Dr. Offit. But you know what, um, if I had to pick an age, by the way, I would pick 65. But um, the what, one thing I would love to have, and I, and I guess I challenge uh, Amanda Cohn and Linda Wharton with this, I, I would love to see the CDC provide data to answer the following question. Is it possible to get control of this virus, meaning to provide a significant enough level of herd immunity that there is dramatic decrease in transmission and hospitalization and death um, with two doses? I mean, so if, so if you look at those countries or regions or states that have very, very high immunization rates in certain regions, do we dramatically reduce the incidence of hospitalization. In other words, because we're not going to be great at preventing asymptomatic infection, we're not going to be great at preventing mildly symptomatic infection. I really wish we didn't use the term breakthroughs there, because if, because if that's true, then pretty much every vaccine that we have has at some level breakthroughs. I mean, the rotavirus vaccine that we worked on was not very good at preventing asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic infection. It's very good at preventing moderate to severe disease, and so now residents don't see rotavirus disease anymore. I'm glad they never called asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic rotavirus infection breakthroughs. So so that's my question to the CDC. Can you get control of this, this, uh, this infection with two, with two doses? What is the evidence for Because if you can't, then that makes a compelling case for the third dose. 
Uh, Dr. Cohen, do you want to answer that question? And what do you think the Israeli data with the high vaccination <laughs> rates there contribute? <laughs> so um, thanks, Dr. Offit. I am uh, not, I don't have the data um, or the ability to answer that question completely right now. What I can say is at this moment, it is clear that the unvaccinated are driving transmission in the United States. Um, and when we look at modeling, uh, for example, um, in, in, in congregate settings, it's frequently outside community transmission and unvaccinated individuals that contribute to increased cases in the United States at this time, which I will caveat that with. Um, I also think that other interventions such as uh, social distancing and masking will have to be part of the solution. Um, it's, I don't, you know, vaccination will never be, never be perfect. Um, but I do believe that a third dose at some point in time, maybe not right now, maybe for groups of people who were vaccinated early right now, will contribute to additional reduced transmission, um, especially in states and communities that do have high coverage and are still seeing uh, uh, cases. So it does make sense from a from a from the perspective of you need high protection and given the differences in time in which we've vaccinated since last December until people really just getting vaccinated now, that people who were vaccinated a long time ago and who maybe um, have lower antibodies now, that a boost will uh, presumably prevent some additional transmission. Um, but uh, we really can't answer that with data right now. And what do you think... Uh, what do, you, what do you think the Israeli data and the province town data tell you, Amanda? <laughs> so um, I think that the Israeli data is very compelling. I think that we need a little bit more time. We, I totally believe that a booster dose will provide protection against um, disease and potentially even infection in individuals for a period of time. But um, I think. Uh, we would prefer to see six weeks out or, you know, these things settle out over a longer period of time to have real evidence that the booster dose is contributing to um, reduced transmission in their, in their overall population. One quick well, follow-up, if you don't mind. Yeah, the, the, um, it, it's certainly true that for a vaccine like this, it is not surprising that neutralizing antibodies will, will decline over time. And so we give a booster dose. It is also, therefore, very likely that over time the booster dose and the increase in antibodies will also decline over time. So, so are we talking about then annual, biannual, triannual um, booster doses? Because I know that, that we've heard th two things. We, we've heard one, booster dosing, you know, more frequently, and two, that this is a three-dose vaccine and then we're done. I mean, wh how do you see it, Amanda? Yeah, I believe, uh, uh, Dr. I'm Wood not going to oh, oh. <laughs> not even speculate about that. <laughs> I have my own opinion, and probably Amanda has her own opinion, but that's not the question we're being asked today. So let's focus on where we are today, and let's hear from Dr. Perlman. Yes, so I just wanted to make a, a couple of extra points. So first, I think if when we talk about transmission, there's many studies that show, in fact, that we really want to deal with transmission. We probably need to do something like deliver a vaccine intranasally to actually induce, trans, uh, prevent uh, infection at that site. And that's mostly pretty clinical, but that certainly makes sense and has been said by other speakers. The second thing is that when we talk about age, I also agree that this should be around 60. Others have said different ages around there. But the, the group that I worry about that's not included in over 60 and doesn't have comorbidities are healthcare workers because the systems are so overstretched now that we can't even have healthcare workers get um, mild infections or be positive because by staying home, that puts even more of a risk on the uh, failure of the whole system. So I don't know how we put that into our equation, but I think that that's a group that we have to consider as being possibly a candidate for a third uh, vaccine. Thank you, Dr. Perlman. That's very helpful. Uh, Dr. Pergam. Dr. Perlman uh, stole my thunder with that comment, but I, I think he's absolutely on target. I'm very concerned about healthcare systems that are already overstretched 
and many of which are um, unable to find additional people to fill in gaps that if we continue to have um, even um, mildly symptomatic infections, it will actually put many healthcare systems in trouble. Um, I think healthcare workers have to be considered as a potential population to be offering third doses because um, we don't have a lot of capacity and we can't be losing people in hospitals to illness, which will take them out for, you know, minimum of 10 days in most of those situations. And a large outbreak in a hospital system can be quite uh, problematic. So I, I think we have to um, strongly consider that group. And I'd be comfortable with people 60 and older being another additional group that could get um, uh, boosters beyond that. So I actually think the way that the ACIP had laid out how they might approve this um, looked um, feasible to me. Um, and, and the groups that were the highest risk were um, nursing home residents, people that were um, 60 to 65 and older, and then healthcare workers would be the group that I'd be most comfortable with approving for a booster. Thank you. Dr. Levy. Hi, thank you for that. Um, I agree with uh, some of the other uh, committee members who've mentioned that a third dose is likely beneficial. Uh, that's already true for the immunocompromised. It's likely beneficial, in my opinion, for the elderly and, and may eventually uh, be indicated for the general population. I just don't think we're there yet uh, in terms of the data. Uh, as other committee members have pointed out, uh, more needs to be known about the correlates of protection, both antibody and cell mediated immunity. Uh, we are in an era of precision vaccinology. That's the basis of our precision vaccines program. We need age-specific data. Uh, the risks for various adverse events vary with age, and therefore the data presented to our committee uh, should mirror that uh, of that age group if we're asked to uh, vote in favor of use in that age group. Um, and uh, we also would like to see some data on impact on transmission. Finally, in terms of uh, a revised question, uh, I would advocate uh, for one that's phrased for ages 65 and up. Uh, that's uh, an age group where uh, more severe COVID is seen, and that could be one way to, um, to phrase the question, although 60 and up uh, also matches uh, the compelling data from Israel. So those are my opinions. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Rubin. Well, I'm, I'm 63, so I'd like the 60 age instead of the 65 age. But I, um, I and, and, and I think for just exactly the, the, the reasons that Oprah just uh, mentioned, that, uh, and that uh, we, the safety data we have reflects 60-year-olds. Uh, I think it would be great if we could give a sort of uh, less restrictive language uh, and uh, to the rest of it, though, and, and offer it to people who are at higher risk of disease. That could be higher risk of developing severe disease because of the risk factors or higher risk because of exposure, uh, such as healthcare workers. Um, and, and the reason is we don't, it, that, that's quite a bit different from saying people should get a third dose because that uh, gets closer to it being written in as a mandate that everyone should get it. And we don't, and, and I think none of us are ready for that, or few of us are ready for that right now. Um, it would be much easier to give uh, practitioners the ability to give doses to people they think really need them based on the data that are out there, and they're rapidly changing right now. By next week, as people have pointed out, some of these things that are in preprints are actually likely to be out. Thank you, Dr. Rubin. Dr. Monto? Dr. Monto? Yes. Dr. Monto? Yes. Do you mind, uh, we have a lot. We're getting a lot of questions coming in. So, Kathleen, can you please uh, go over the vote total? People are wondering why there was an extra vote, and we want to make sure everybody online also understands why. So, Kathleen, are you there? Uh, yes, I, I'm here. Um, sure, I can help clarify. We just had um, one speaker accidentally vote. But the um, final vote was two yeses and 16 no votes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Meisner, who surprisingly is the last one to have his hand raised and uh, would the uh, 
FDA staff be ready for me to ask what they would propose as the next voting question after we hear from Dr. Meisner? We'll be ready, we'll be ready as soon as Dr. Meisner is done. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Meisner. Oops. Yep. You're up, Cody. <laughs> we, hear, we heard you. <laughs> Is this okay? Yeah, we hear you. Yep. We Thank you. you. Okay. Uh, I'd just like to express a, a, a few thoughts. First of all, I, as has been stated, I don't think a booster dose is going to significantly contribute to controlling the pandemic. And I think it's very important that the main message that we still transmit is that we've got to get everybody two doses. Everyone has to get the primary series. This booster dose is not going to make a big difference. Uh, it's not likely to make a big difference in, in the behavior of this, uh, of this pandemic. Secondly, again, I agree with um, uh, what Dr. Marx said earlier, that this is a killed vaccine, and our experience with killed vaccines is quite clear that um, we need to have doses uh, six months or longer apart. Uh, in order to uh, ensure uh, protective immunity. But one of the questions, I think, uh, it's going to be very hard to do the trial, but if we could separate the distance, uh, the length of time between the first dose and the second dose, it might not be necessary uh, to give a third dose. Uh, I don't know how we'll be able to go about addressing that 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 issue, but I, I think that's it deserves some consideration. And then, um, fourthly uh, or thirdly, in in terms of the risk, uh, people who have risk factors such as obesity, um, that that should apply. In my thinking is that that should apply to people under sixty five years of age. I mean, there are clear risk factor groups who, who fall into the risk of hospitalization and more severe disease who are under 60 or 65. Um, and it seems to me we should probably include them in uh, consideration of um, a booster dose. And I'll, I'll stop at that point. Thank you. Thank you, Cody and Dr. Marks. And I believe we've been getting ready a, a revised voting question, but I can, while we're getting that uh, together for you, I believe hearing what you've been saying, um, what we would probably suggest is something along the lines of, based on the totality of scientific evidence available, including the safety and effectiveness data from clinical trial C459-1001, uh, the potential benefits outweigh the potential risks of a Pfizer-BioNTech COVID-19 mRNA vaccine booster dose administered at least six months after completion of the primary series for use in individuals 65 years of age and older, and those judged to be at high risk uh, of complications due to occupational exposure or underlying disease. Thank you. Question of Kat, uh, Prabha and Kathleen, do we need that in writing before we vote? And if so, should we take a break? Dr. Trey, I think we can get the question ready in the voting pod. Are we okay to do that or? Dr. Trey, I think you're muted. We take a 10 minute break. Dr. Gruber, do you, Marion Gruber, do you have something, a comment? Yeah, I just wanted to make a suggestion. While we actually put the slide together as suggested by, by Dr. Marks, can we take a short yeah. break to, to 
get this right. And also because it is now an EOA that is on the table, uh, we could also remind the committee can, can, can briefly about EOA if that's what people think. We don't need these discussion questions any longer. Okay, so let's take let's take a break then for is five minutes enough? Would you think ten minutes better? Ten. No, maybe ten, but not more than ten minutes. Okay, ten minutes. We'll reconvene at five minutes after four Eastern. Thank you. Enjoy this call.
home stretch. All right, welcome back, and thank you for uh, allowing us to do that little break. Um, we are all set. So, Dr. Monto, you want to take it away? Yes, I'd like to call on Dr. Fink from FDA, who is going to tell us about uh, the next steps. Thank you. So, following the vote for our uh, first voting question, FDA uh, recognizes that the committee had several concerns. Uh, one concern related to uh, benefit-risk balance uh, in the general population of individuals 16 years of age and older. And a second question related to the uh, data and level of evidence uh, 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 to support uh, the safety and effectiveness of uh, a booster dose. And so in response to these concerns, FDA has formulated a second voting question. Uh, and I want to make clear uh, that the second voting question uh, involves emergency use authorization rather than approval uh, or licensure, uh, which uh, was the, the subject of the first voting question. So I'd like to spend uh, just a few moments reminding the committee um, of some principles around emergency use authorization. These slides were previously uh, presented in the October 2020 uh, VRPAC meeting. Uh, so here on this slide are the criteria, the statutory criteria for FDA issuance of an emergency use authorization. Uh, first, the agent referred to in the emergency use authorization declaration can cause a serious or life-threatening disease or condition. Um, we know this to be true for uh, SARS coronavirus 2. Uh, secondly, the medical product may be effective to prevent, diagnose, or treat the serious or life-threatening condition caused by the agent. Third, the known and potential benefits of the product outweigh the known and potential risks of the product. And these second or, and third uh, criteria are tied together in an overall uh, benefit-risk assessment. And finally, uh, that no adequate, approved, and available alternative to the product for diagnosing, preventing, or treating the disease or condition. Uh, and so in this case, we are talking about the potential for emergency use authorization uh, of a booster dose uh, of the Pfizer BioNTech uh, COVID vaccine that is not uh, currently available. Next slide, please. May I have the next slide, please? Thank you. So issuance of an EUA for a COVID-19 vaccine, or in this case, for a booster dose of a specific COVID-19 vaccine will specify uh, the conditions for use in which benefit risk has been determined to be favorable based on the review of the totality of available data. Uh, and these conditions include the population uh, to be included in the emergency use authorization, the conditions for vaccine distribution and administration, and requirements for safety monitoring and reporting of adverse events. Uh, for this specific uh, uh, proposed emergency use authorization, uh, we would expect that the conditions for distribution and administration and requirements for safety monitoring and reporting of adverse events uh, would remain the same as uh, in the current emergency use authorization uh, for the vaccine. Uh, secondly, uh, the emergency use authorization uh, will provide information to vaccine recipients and healthcare providers by way of prescribing information and fact sheets uh, that describe the investigational nature of the product, the known and potential benefits and risks, and available alternatives and the option to refuse uh, vaccination. So what we're talking about here is a revision of the current fact sheets for uh, vaccination providers and vaccine recipients and their caregivers. Next slide, please. I also want to remind the committee that issuance of an EUA uh, for any product, uh, including a COVID-19 vaccine or a booster dose of this specific COVID-19 vaccine, uh, may be revised or revoked if circumstances justifying the emergency use authorization no longer exist, if criteria for issuance are no longer met, i.e. those statutory criteria on the first slide, or if other circumstances arise that warrant changes necessary to protect public health or safety, such as those based on new information concerning vaccine safety, vaccine effectiveness, vaccine manufacturing or quality, 
or a new information about COVID-19 epidemiology or pathogenesis. Next slide, please. So this is the voting question uh, number two that we will ask the committee to consider. Based on the totality of scientific evidence available, including the safety and effectiveness data from clinical trial C4591001, do the known and potential benefits outweigh the known and potential risks of a Pfizer-BioNTech COVID-19 vaccine booster dose administered at least six months after completion of the primary series for use in individuals 65 years of age and older and individuals at high risk of severe COVID-19? That is the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fink. What I am proposing is that we move directly to this voting question. We've already had a lot of discussion. And then for anybody who wants to explain their vote, we will go on to explanations of votes before we adjourn. So. The voting question, should I be reading it for the record? Please, thank you. Based on the totality of scientific evidence available, Dr. Monto, I can't hear you. Did we lose your audio? I think we did lose Arnold. I don't know. Yeah, he dropped his, I think he hung up by accident. Yep, he noticed it. <laughs> Fine. Mike, also our chat box just disappeared. In just a moment. Arnold, Arnold we'll just have, yep, we saw that. <laughs> we'll just let you start again. You just start. Yeah, go ahead. Yep, have you got me? Yeah, we do, sir. Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> we were doing too well <laughs> in terms of the, of the technology. So do the known and potential risks uh, outweigh the known and potential uh, the known and potential risks of the Pfizer BioNTech vaccine booster dose administered at least six, six months after completion of the primary uh, series for use in individuals 65 years of age and older and individuals of high risk at an individual at high risk of severe COVID-19. Thank you, Dr. Hello. Yep, yeah, we have it. Okay. So, again, to all my members, um, please make sure you control your own muting. Please make sure you are muting yourself. All right. Uh, Kathleen Hayes, take it away. Yeah. Thank you, Mike and Dr. Monto. Um, so, same process as the first voting question. When you see the voting pod come up, um, please select yes, no, or abstain, and you will have two minutes. And just as a reminder, only voting members and temporary voting members can vote. Thank you. Go ahead. Okay, that was pretty quick. It looks like all of the votes are in. So we can close the poll, and we do have a unanimous 18 out of 18 who voted yes for this question. And I will read the votes aloud for the record. Dr. Cohn, yes. Dr. Portnoy, yes. Dr. Lee, yes. Dr. McKinnis, yes. Dr. Perlman, yes. Dr. Gans, yes. Dr. Meisner, yes. Dr. Chatterjee, yes. Dr. Hildreth, yes. Dr. Wharton, yes. Dr. Fuller, yes. Dr. Carilla, yes. Dr. Levy, yes. Dr. Ophit, yes. Dr. Rubin, yes. Dr. Pergam, yes. Dr. Sawyer, yes. And Dr. Monto, yes. So thank you for your votes, and I will hand it back to Dr. Monto. 
Okay, explanation of votes for those who have raised their hands. Cody Meisner. Dr. Monto, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Uh, I, I would just like to ask Dr. Fink one question. So this, um, the second bullet will apply to um, everyone who uh, is 16 years of age or older, that is, at, at high risk. Is that correct? Uh, the, yeah, this, uh, the second bullet would apply to individuals for whom the vaccine is authorized uh, who are at high risk of severe COVID-19. Thank you. Oh, well, maybe you understood. Thank you. Dr. Pergam. Thanks, Dr. Uh, thanks, Dr. Monto. I think the, my only, I, I voted yes on this, my only concern was the, the comment of high-risk severe COVID-19, um, because I do think this will potentially um, put um, healthcare workers in a different situation. They're not necessarily at risk for severe COVID, but for developing COVID. So um, I, I just want to reiterate that I think that healthcare workers are a particularly high-risk group um, for acquisition um, as um, the antibodies wane, and we have not addressed that in this particular statement. Thank you, Dr. Pergam. I just want to remind the committee that the ACIP will be meeting to fine tune some of our recommendations. Uh, Dr. Sawyer. I just wanted to explain both my votes since I uh, voted yes on the first question, one of the distinct minority. Are you hearing me okay? My camera is not working for some reason. Yes, we hear you. Okay. So I voted yes on the first question because I thought it was the quickest, most efficient way and most flexible way for providers to be able to target certain populations. But I'm certainly comfortable with this uh, as long as the ACIP provides enough additional guidance uh, about exactly who we think are most concerning. Dr. Portnoy. So you're inviting the two yes speakers from the previous question to address each other, one right after the other. Um, I'd, I'd no, like to explain both just, of them. It was just chance. <laughs> no? Okay. Well, b both of my answers are kind of like what um, we just heard. Um, I think that it's great that this uh, this becomes available because uh, this, this vaccine is something that I think believe really has an opportunity to stem the uh, COVID uh, epidemic. Um, healthcare workers uh, are at high risk of catching COVID. They're not at risk of severe COVID, but we're at risk of spreading it to our patients. So I think it's really important that we not get infected. But the most dangerous thing is the asymptomatic infection. If you get infected with COVID and you don't know you have it, you're more likely to spread it. And that's what the doubly vaccinated people are most at risk of having. So I think it's really important that we consider that when we decide about approval. Um, but uh, I'm really glad that we uh, uh, authorized uh, this vaccine for a third dose, and uh, I plan to go out and get my third vaccine this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Carilla. Thank you. Thank you, Arnold. Uh, I guess my camera isn't working again either. Um, yeah, just wanted to uh, just wanted to say that I really appreciate the rewording of the uh, uh, a question. I think it more targets what with the available data that we have uh, where where a a booster dose is going to be likely to be most effective. I think it does highlight though in a lot of the discussions we had some of the outstanding questions that still remain and the vaccine manufacturers and the academic community really need to be focused on addressing some of those 
transmissibility and the relationship between vaccination and the number of doses, I think is a very important question and really understanding the true correlates of protection and how that can inform durability uh, assessments going forward, I think still remain an open question. We just can't simply be in a position where we would just be vaccinating people every time we think there's a problem. Uh, so we really need to get a better handle on understanding exactly how these vaccines are mediating protection and the durability of that protection. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Perlman. Yeah, I just wanted to extend the question that uh, Dr. Pergam uh, raised. So at the ACIP meetings, can they consider uh, basically um, uh, the use of the vaccine in a group that wouldn't necessarily be under either of these two categories? So the, the, I, the, with the healthcare workers not being in either one, the, the, uh, I think you, I believe you said that the ACIP could still include them, but can they include them if it's not in these uh, categories that the FDA has, uh, may approve? Dr. Perlman, the next one who has raised her hand is Dr. Cohen, who may be, or Dr. Marks, who, would you like to jump in? Uh, I, this is Dr. Marks. I would, I'd very much, I'd very much like to jump in here. Um, I, we are not bound at FDA by your vote, just so you understand that. We can tweak right. this as need be. And I would ask formally, Dr. Monto, without further ado from anyone else from FDA uh, jumping in, for you to poll the members as to whether or not healthcare workers at, uh, be uh, included or not uh, in this, or whether there's any other risk group that they would like to. We do not have to take a vote on that question. We will take that back and then we can refine this question as we need to based on the members. So this is not a voting question, but I am requesting that you ask all 18 members to ask uh, and tell them of how they might further refine this in any way. We would really appreciate that because that is why we moved to uh, this kind of a pathway because we have more flexibility. Thanks very much. Okay, we need instructions as how to be polled rather than asked a um, question. Dr. Monto and Prabhanet, I can put up um, a, what we call a short answer with the question being, and clarify, I will clarify the question. How, how should we further refine, and then uh, well, Henry, Dr. Marks, what were you asking? That, instead of that, let's ask, the question, should healthcare workers be included in this EUA? But that, that's fine by me, Dr. Monto. That's fine. I'm always against open-ended questions. <laughs> okay. Before anybody vote, I'm just going to... Um, Peter? Hold on, sir. This is Amanda. Could I suggest even some language like people at high risk for occupational exposure as opposed to even... Okay. Yep. Okay. Let's do that. I, I, I totally agree. I, I totally agree with Amanda because I think we'd be leaving a lot of people out if we did. So oh, I, I just want to make sure that exactly. the committee understands when we're saying people at high risk for occupational exposure, what we will be taking that to mean at FDA is healthcare workers, frontline workers uh, such as teachers, um, and potentially essential infrastructure workers as well. Is that, yes. is that what we're taking there? Yes. Yes. Okay, yes. thank you. Okay, so can I uh, just, I want to make sure I captured uh, what uh, Dr. Cohn said. You said, should healthcare workers and somebody else be included in this EUA? What was the other one? It's, it's it can be Dr. Cohn, uh, Amanda, can you just, I think you had it very nicely formulated. If you could just say it slowly so that uh, it can be captured. Thank you. I think it's individuals at high risk for occupational exposure. Okay, should individuals at high risk for occupational exposure. Exposure be included in this. Okay. All right. 
I'm just going to check this real quick. Uh, Kathleen, let's just see. Should healthcare I, I workers I, open it? I, do, I, I got it. I see one, it. I do have one question, though. Why does it have to be occupational exposure? Can it just be any exposure? Does it have to just be in part of their job? I think that's a All can right. of worms, frankly. <laughs> All right, so uh, Dr. Marks and uh, Arnold, uh, Dr. Monto, if you would please check what I put well, on there. I, I, I think that that really makes, makes it very difficult to interpret because anybody could be at high risk uh, if you have a, uh, 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 if, if you have a, a child who's in school, you might consider yourself being at high risk. So I would prefer leaving it as occupational exposure. Okay. So right now, this is, again, this is not a voting question. This is just a question to the committee. Hold on a second. I just want to make sure we, we just get, um, there's a, there, it looks like to me there's maybe a, a parsing error. Um, um, it, it, because it should healthcare workers or others at high risk, of, right? Because I think that yes. was what was added there. It wasn't just healthcare workers, it was other individuals. Is that correct, Dr. Monto? Yes, that is correct. And there's an R missing from uh, workers, okay. thank you. Yep, sorry. Spelling is not my okay. strong suit, but actually that one I caught. <laughs> that one I caught too, there you go. Yep, got it, there we go. Should healthcare workers or others at high risk for occupational exposure be included in this EUA? Okay, again, this is not a voting question. I don't, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Atreya or could you Could or you Kathleen? stick the spelling on healthcare, please? Oh, hold on, H-E-A. I can't even read, I can't even see what I'm typing here. Here we go, H-E-A, -E there we go. looking for people who are doing gardening. Right. Thanks. Yep. There we go. No, no. There we go. Shut up here. Okay. I think we're good. Will ACIP further define uh, these groups? That's certainly within their purview that they could do that. Now, this is not a voting question. Again, this is just you are polling the committee. Am I correct? That's what they're. Dr. Monto, Kathleen? How would you like? It looks like, it looks like it's become a voting question. Well, it, it, it's just, this is just a poll. I'm just putting up, uh, not a voting question, but just a poll. Right. Just poll. a poll. You asked for it to be a poll. Perfect. Thank you very much. And I will clarify it even in the language up on top that we are just polling, polling uh, the committee. Okay. And Dr. Monto, it looks like everyone was in agreement for this question. Um, for all. Thank the you very much. As a poll, I will simply report for the record that everybody was in agreement with the poll based on this statement. Should healthcare workers or others at high risk for occupational exposure be included in this EUA? Okay. Now, a number of people still have their hands raised. Do all of them continue to wish to make, to give explanations of votes? Starting with Dr. Cohen. Sure, I think I had my hand raised uh, from previously, um, but I just wanna say that I think this is, um, a really uh, amazing vote for uh, people who are at severe risk uh, for COVID, older adults, and as well as people who are at risk um, in healthcare settings and other high-risk settings. And uh, they're just 
will protect them. And um, I and, and I just wanted to remind everyone that if you look at when people got vaccinated and how many months out they are, that these are the groups that got vaccinated last December and January and February. So these are the groups that are really beyond six months out and um, should be boosted um, in the present time. I'm hopeful that um, FDA and or VRPAC come back when there are more data available to um, to evaluate uh, use of this vaccine as a booster dose in younger age groups. Thank you. And I think that's the beauty of an EUA. I think uh, based on past experience, it can be changed based on changing uh, data. Uh, Dr. Chatterjee. Thanks, Dr. Monto. Um, I just wanted to um, echo what, what Amanda said, so I'm not going to do that, but I do want to take one moment to actually recognize our colleagues at the FDA and their willingness to work with us on these questions, on the voting questions. I think this should demonstrate to the public that the members of this committee are independent of the FDA and that, in fact, we do bring our voices to the table when we are asked to serve on this committee. Thank you very much, Dr. Chatterjee. A good note to close the meeting. Uh, let me just thank the committee members and especially Dr. Marion Gruber Can and Phil Krauss for their longtime service. And I'd like to turn uh, the, the meeting over to Dr. Atreya to formally close it. Thank you all. Thank you for the wonderful discussions and productive meeting today. And uh, this meeting is formally adjourned and have a good evening. Thank you all.